remember me from last night. I'm very, from last year, I'm very happy to spend the day with you again. So, there's a lot today that we are expecting. We have some high-profile speakers to discuss the future in artificial intelligence, computer science, and many more topics. So, we are happy to have you here on site. Some of you are joining us online from all over the globe, so it's super exciting. But let's dive right in and welcome our first guest on stage. He's the president of Constructor University and chairman of the investment committee InvestEU. As you all know, it's a big day today yeah, for SIT and JUB. Starting off today, two institutions will join forces and stand under the name Constructor. But more about this topic you're going to hear later. First, we welcome on stage to hear about the topic Constructor University, the way ahead. Please welcome Fabio Pamoli. Hi. Thank you. Good much. morning. Good morning. Ah, it's a pleasure, honor, and the responsibility. I will try to share with you some considerations, so think it about it more as uh, like an opportunity for us to, first of all, to find the right deck, and second, to start our discussion. Okay, a few considerations about uh, our journey. I'm moving, but it doesn't work. Hmm? doesn't work. Good stuff. <laughs> you see? Some suspense. So we would kindly ask you to have some patience as we At are figuring out the technique. <laughs> There are always unpredictable things, and sometimes... Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> okay but I will anticipate the start, which is uh, related to the contrast between uh, two representations of, uh, of, uh, of a system. And this is uh, related to constructor, because as you will see, one important feature of constructor is related to the analysis of a large variety of uh, complex functional systems across different domains. So, uh, as you will see in the intro to my talk, I will refer to <coughs> a representation which is a phase space, uh, which is uh, collecting and representing all the trajectories of a dynamic system. And on another side, they will uh, refer to Babel uh, Library, which is a novel by Borges, 1941, in which you represent a library, which in principle is equivalent to the phase space of a dynamic system, because it contains all the possible trajectories, all the possible pathways, all the possible histories that are embedded into that particular system, the library. But the library contains uh, all the information, all the possible words, all the possible combinations of words. And so the combinatorial space, which is included in the library, which is represented in the library, is so huge that people get mad if they don't have rules to explore the library. So it's a library of madness because of the lack of categories and rules that allow the explorer to understand the content of the library which in principle contains all the past and future information about the universe, because it represents all possible ways uh, that humanity came up to, to represent the universe. So this contrast between a very clean representation of a dynamic system and the bubble library is in, intends to express the tension. And you see, it was there. For a second it was there, but then we lost. <laughs> okay, good. Can we stay there? 
Yes. Oh, you will use this one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, good. At one point, at one point, everything will start to be fine. OK, this is what I was talking about, you see? And uh, it is about constructor for some reasons that I will come back to. But uh, this is the first important point. Constructor as a metaphor, as, a, as, a, as an indicator, as a pointer of a journey which intends to explore with a large variety of methods, uh, solutions, and, and skills, uh, a large variety of systems across different domains, ranging from physics to uh, humanities. OK, at least it's a nice picture. So, uh, first, I will not enter into a detailed representation of uh, concepts that we already explored during, during the, last, the past year, during the, the period that we spent together. But one important point is related to the unicity of the university that we have started to design and to uh, uh, like represent in its evolution uh, with respect to the original configuration, which is the fact that the, the constructor university is and will be embedded into the constructor ecosystem. It is not going to be a singleton. It is going to be, and it is already a porous organization, which uh, has systematic relationships with two platform technology companies, one which is related to Babel and to, and, to the, and to the algorithmic libraries and pathways that you need to explore complex configurations in biological, chemical, social, and physical systems, which is Rolos, which is uh, one of the uh, companies within the ecosystem. And another one which is Alemira developing unique platforms for learning and learning management solutions, and the fact that the university can co-evolve with these two general platform technologies is unique. Because you have a Lincoln lab at MIT, but the relative size is completely different, and the fact that you can co-design and co, and co I would say, uh, articulate those platforms with respect to the early stages of the pathways that we are uh, entering is quite, is quite important. Then, the scientific network, I don't want to quote the list of colleagues who are sitting under the coordination of Konstantin Novoselov into our scientific advisory board, but this is a source of inspiration, reputation, and also it's a huge network for our scouting and hiring of young, talented students and, and scholars. Then, other components, as, as I will show you, we already started the first uh, co-development, co-investment project with uh, one of the most uh, well-known uh, uh, software development companies, JetBrains, and this is key to unravel and to reveal our strategy, which is, as I was saying, based on porosity, meaning that co-design of educational programs, co-design of research activities, and attraction of talent are one key feature uh, of our organization. So the corporate network around us. And then the capital component, constructor capital, uh, a, a venture fund, which will yeah. enable our own ideas to be developed and scaled up but also to attract ideas from outside into the ecosystem of our campus so that we can contaminate uh, 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 our, own, uh, our own activities. Then the Institute of Advanced Studies, I will come to this concept in, in, in a second. Then the campus. The campus has been the uh, I would say the cornerstone of the interactions within a multidisciplinary university like, uh, like, uh, like Jacobs and now Constructor. And we want to strengthen this multidisciplinary uh, 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 attitude and, uh, and uh, to leverage uh, the complementarity across fields. Because this is 
a huge potential competitive advantage that we need to exploit. The fact that in a relatively small scale research and education organization, we can design the coevolution between different domains. And coming back to Babel and to the phase space representation of systems, we can have not only data intensive explorative strategies, but modeling and representational instruments that are applicable across domains. And this is basically a new way, I would say, mapping onto the, uh, 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 a new educational journey through which we want to explore and to exploit the multidisciplinarity of this university. Now, some initiatives. First, I label it uh, Greenfield in Brownfield. Part of our activities has been focusing, together with the faculty and together with the management team, in the reorganization, refinement, and modification and transformation, for example, of our educational programs. And this is happening. Uh, we introduced a new track which gives foundational skills, fundamental skills to our students, ranging from logics to uh, causality analysis to uh, uh, the exploration of the linear model and, and then we can go into a detailed representation of this. We introduced a new minor in data science. We reorganized the contents of programs in mathematics and physics. We introduced new programs in data science for, for business and society. So this is the reorganization of the existing activities. At the same time, the university will become multidivisional. It's already multidivisional. We are, we are entering online education which was uh, a segment of activity which was not existing in this university. We want to leverage our unicity in terms of the contents that we produce in order to be an actor in, in online education, high quality, also thanks to the collaboration with, uh, with Alemira. Another element of this transformation is to revise and to re-engineer processes and contracts contractual solutions, I will mention it. The range of contractual solutions that we are now ready to implement to attract talented scientists is much larger than it was a few months ago. Because we need to have an organizational plasticity that allows us to be opportunistic in when we want to hire uh, and to hunt for talent. And then optimization of processes, which is, which is quite important. Then the Institute of Advanced Studies, which is a combination between research and a higher education, so that we can combine our internal capacity with a constant flow of visiting scientists and with a constant flow of young, talented scientists who do not necessarily get a, a chair, but get an opportunity to do, to do research together with highly visible scientists. This is going to be another actor of our network-based Poros strategy, which is like to rely not only on ourselves, but to rely on our capacity to exploit the network configuration that science has assumed. Okay, then the JetBrain experience, uh, which is here. I wanted to quote it because I think it's a flagship for us. I'm proud and I welcome Andre Ivanov, who's uh, with us today, and I thank him and Alexander Omelchenko for the enormous amount of work that they did. Some concrete results. Why this is important? For several reasons. First of all, in these areas, which range from machine learning, software engineering, artificial intelligence, it is not true that the frontier of research moves ahead only or mainly through activities performed in universities. The interaction between problems and competencies which come from the industrial domain and problems and competencies that can be identified within, industri within university settings is key. So this is important for science. Second is the fact that we were able to relocate and to rescue about 130 students, very talented students. There are already results that they are achieving, and this is something that, uh, in the context of the current uh, geopolitical turmoil, makes up us, uh, I would say, proud and happy. And then 
we are currently developing a, a joint research center. Tentatively, we framed it uh, as artificial intelligence and software engineering between the two entities. So we will have researchers coming from the company and researchers hired and coming from our faculty working together, which is, I think, a very important element and feature for our students, but also for our researchers and for our... And then the co-development of two, two new educational programs. And then we are also thinking about uh, some executive education and some for-profit education in the School of Computing. So this is an example of a model that we are implementing. Ah, this is a second point. We spent a significant amount of time redesigning our education programs, introducing some fundamental backbones in modeling, representing, representation, like meaning computing, simulation. Uh, we redefined the contents of programs in mathematics and physics. You see some of these activities represented on, on the left-hand side of this, uh, of this slide. Now we are ready to leverage this reorganization to start focus hiring of talented scientists in areas which are not only relevant from the scientific point of view of the university, but are also relevant from the point of view of the sustainability of the education journey of this university. So that you have a deep connection, that the results are two. First of all, you do not start to hire at random, but you start to hire because of the needs of your education programs, but you redesign, we redesign our education programs so that then they can be relevant for both research and education. This is, I'm not saying the, I mean, a new implementation and instantiation of the old Humboldtian style with porosity, I would say, but this is what we did reorganization of education programs and now coherent uh, hiring strategy in areas that are data modeling and representation intensive. This is what I was uh, referring before. This is now the new set of contractual solutions that the university can implement in order to hire talented uh, scientists and teachers. I'm not going to enter into each category, but what I want to show to you is, uh, assuming that we can move, is this. is also the fact that we can now operate across different time scales. In some cases, and we saw during the last period, we need to act fast. And so, for example, we can offer now positions, temporary positions in the Institute for Advanced Studies to highly talented uh, 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 scientists, and this can be fast. At the same time, we need to re-engineer and to optimize and to make more visible at the international level our hiring strategy. One important component is the fact that we are going to have critical mass around modeling, computing, and data-intensive uh, domains across fields, and this is very important because scientists will apply to come to us, will understand immediately that they do not go in the middle of very rigid departments, but they will go into a multidisciplinary ecosystem in which modeling and data intensive and data science uh, are important. But this is a very important point because the university needs not only to be porous, but to act fast to get uh, talent when the talent is available. And, and this is an entire chapter that uh, then will map onto the strategies that we need to implement in order to get our calls visible at the international level. Now, very few words. That, that's basically talking to our colleagues and opening a debate. There is a lot of discussion and uh, controversies are good. There is a lot of discussion about the name. The point that I want to emphasize here is the fact that this name maps onto our own scientific journey, our own scientific world. And this is very important because the narratives that we will be able to develop around this name in the future will reflect our own explorations in this, in this domain. The, the ancestors are on the one side uh, the, the multiverse and the many words interpretation, not necessarily or not mainly in the metaphysical interpretation, but in the epistemological interpretation. So the exploration of uh, larger spaces of, 
of uh, possibilities and physical contingencies as emergent phenomena, which is starting from Everett and then uh, is developed by David Deutsch. David Deutsch, who refers also to the universal constructor of uh, von Neumann, which is basically um, the formalization of, uh, of the idea of mechanism and the representation of component systems, which are functional organizations, uh, the mechanisms of which produce uh, other functional organizations. I don't want to enter into this, but I wanted to mention this because it is not a fancy name which comes from nothing. It is deeply embedded into our own decision to explore the structure, the configuration, and the evolution of a large variety of systems, including uh, constructor. And this is uh, a science, or many sciences, of, uh, 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 of functional organizations, because you see, in the uh, land of the middle between the sides of, of an equation and the number of equations that you will need in order to represent a complex uh, system, there is uh, this land of the middle in which you need to explore causal pathways, you need to identify rules, you need to be able to build counterfactuals with respect to the pathways that you are able to identify. So there is a methodological implication of this reference to constructor, which is related to the exploration and the construction of complex systems, and this is going to come back. And this is our, uh, I would say, competitive advantage and our own mission now, to show how we can contribute to this, uh, to this scientific journey. And critical thinking comes with it, and I think this is a very important point, which is uh, like the best representation of the continuity in the transformation that we want to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fabio Famoli. In the second, I'm getting back the clicker as we're going to need it today. Um, our following guest is a person we all know and highly value. He founded the Schaffhausen Institute of Technology, and this is just one of his many very significant achievements. Serge Bell, he will present to you machine intelligence and science by a constructor approach, as well as he will present to you all the infos about the new name. He will join us online, so let's see if we can reach him. No? Maybe it might take a second or two um, until we get a signal, but he will be there with us very, very soon and talk to you about the future. In the meantime, I can tell you that we have a very, very wonderful program for you today. Later in the lunch break, we would invite you to um, participate in a podium discussion uh, First, you're going to have a meal, but later we would have, we would love to have you all on the podium. So for now, we're going to wait and see. Maybe there's something. I take a look at the guys from the technique section. Do we have anything? Can we talk to Serge? Doesn't look like him, does it? Hmm? So I would ask you to have some patience. And then we can go on. So I will try it once more to click. No. Uh, I think so. no. So guys, how does it look? Do we have a signal? Can we talk to Serge? Or maybe we can switch over to the next topic and maybe get him on later. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. We will wait a little bit more and I'm 
I will be here for you. Okay, we're going to move on to the next topic. Maybe we can switch to the next plenary session. This looks promising. Maybe we can start now. Is it possible? Should I sing a song? <laughs> I can if, if you want. <laughs> no, I won't. Yeah, okay. We are moving forward on the program. As you all know, uh, as you all know, if you're in a life situation, Things like this sometimes happen. I'm a radio host, so I'm well aware of some difficulties when you're having a live program. So, over the last few years, some of you might have heard of it, vaccines became very important. Yeah? They have been on high demand, and it was an extraordinary situation, and biotechnology was facing a pandemic and was forced to deliver um, a vaccine in an enormous speed of time, yeah, basically overnight saving the world. I would say this is a lot of pressure, yeah, but the result was exceptional. It's probably safe to say that exceptional is even an understatement. Yeah, the upcoming plenary session will take a closer look at the method, massive effort in biotech. And as you may see, now our speakers are getting prepared and ready for the next plenary session. And this session is chaired by Claudia Briggs from the Constructor University, who will join me on stage. Please welcome her with a big applause, Claudia. Happy to have you here. Oh no, this is not yours. And Rino Rapuoli, he will kick off this blog with his keynote speech by reflecting on the era of digital vaccines. Please welcome Rino Rapuoli. <laughs> so this one is yours. I hand it over to you. Sure. Now the stage is yours. Enjoy. Oh, we need one more microphone in order for Claudia to talk to you. Yeah, but Rino, you can start already if you want to kick off the session. Okay, good. Feel so, free. Thank you very much, Natalie, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to very, very briefly announce uh, Rino and uh, say a few words. Of course, many of you know that he's a very eminent scientist and that he has published over 800 papers, peer reviewed. Wow. So that's amazing. <laughs> and I think there is nobody else who can kick off the third chapter of this university better than Rino Rapoli. He's holding um, a, a professorship in, uh, in the Imperial College London, but he doesn't really, really go there, but he does teach, as he told me, in Siena. And in Siena, of course, he has been famous in setting up research institutions involved in vaccinology. I should mention only one point, namely reverse vaccinology, which I found quite interesting how you introduced it. So um, it's uh, probably the, the future. And I think what is really, I would say, characteristic for Reno, he is a very, very fantastic researcher. He will share with us his insights and he's moved from basic science to translational medicine. And now he's taking it a step further, goes into policy making and then tries also to share his responsibilities and the responsibilities of the population to really share vaccines with everybody. So, Reno, we are very, very much looking forward. We are, we are honored that you're here again and sharing your time with us. Please um, tell us more about the efforts in biotechnology and specifically the new era of vaccinology. Thank you for coming. In the other, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the USB, the microphone are working. Where's the thing here? Oh, I have to speak about it. 
So please Thank welcome you. on stage our technique guy, Patrick. Big applause. Thank you for helping us out. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And uh, I'm a vaccinologist. And vaccines are really an empirical uh, science. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you how the empirical science moved into what I call the digital era of, of science and vaccines. So that's my title. And in order to introduce the, th the, the topic of today, I wanted to go back a little bit, a little bit of history, going to 2009. Uh, 2009, many of you may remember there was a influenza pandemic. Fortunately, it was not that bad, but it was an early warning of what could happen. And I was doing vaccines, like many other people in the world. And so what happened was that we got, in March 2009, we got basically a day, day one, day zero. The virus was isolated in Mexico and then United States. For vaccinologists, immediately we had to make vaccines. So we rushed to make vaccines. Now, 2009, to make vaccine, what you do is basically you isolate the virus, you take the virus, you send it to center of disease control in Atlanta. Then they pick the virus, they adapt the virus to grow in eggs because the influenza vaccine is made in eggs. Then they send it to the manufacturers, and we started to make and produce the vaccine. Uh, fortunately, we already had the uh, manufacturing plants because we produce vaccines every, every, every year. And amazingly, we were so proud that by months four and five, we basically we had a vaccine ready to go, and we started producing large quantities by months eight and nine. Basically, when you get to this point, oh, sorry, the red, the, the red line, we had plenty of vaccine. But if you look at the uh, blue line, the virus, had been, the peak of the virus had been already, was already there. So basically, when we got the vaccine, it was too late. And we had been fast. So the message was very clear. We, de we need to be faster. And that was what we had in mind. All the vaccinology in 2010, 11, we started to think, how can we go fast? The way uh, we started thinking, in 2011, I published this uh, figure in Nature, basically, and was a review of how the field vaccine was moving. So I went back 1980, top of the things. In yellow, it shows the time needed for discovery. Really needed a lot, a lot of time. We didn't have in 1980 the technology, the science to do things. Development was much earlier because was, we didn't have the complexity of the regulation we have today, good clinical practices, good manufacturing practices. We could get a license with 600 people in phase three trials pretty, pretty fast. <coughs> then, 2010, 2010, we were in a position where now the science had kicked in. Recombinant DNA, genomics, uh, all the omics. Basically, we could do things in parallel. And now, the yellow part, the discovery, was very short. We could discover new vaccines very quickly. The problem was that in development, basically, now good clinical practice, good manufacturing practice, a lot of regulations, very expensive clinical trials, took much longer, much more expensive development. So in 2010, I made a prediction that the science that had been shortening the yellow part, the discovery, by 2020 was going to shorten also the development. Because we are going, thanks to the new science, we're going to do things in parallel, move much faster. So that's the way of thinking in 2011. And in fact, I was right by 2020 uh, that things were going to go faster but was actually wrong because I predicted going faster was going to go from 10, 15 years to seven, eight years. Instead, in 2020, we got a new pandemic. We made vaccine in 10 months. So how was that possible? Well, uh, it was possible thanks to two things. One, new technologies, and the other part, the really unprecedented investment of the public sector. I will go one by one, starting with technologies. 
This is a one slide tries to summarize in different circles, basically, all the technologies that are being used to make vaccines. You start from the bottom with a very empirical approach, then you go into recombinant DNA, uh, glycoconjugation, reverse vaccinology, and then you see today an explosion of technologies at the, in the last circle. Every technology allowed us to conquer new diseases. The ones that allow it to go faster in 2020 with the, uh, <clears throat> with the COVID pandemic were the ones I call one, two, three, and four. One is what I call internet-based vaccines. I'll get into that in a moment. Two is the structural vaccinology, the ability to, to use uh, basically the structure of the proteins and the antigens and the antibodies to basically uh, design vaccines. Three is uh, synthetic biology, basically RNA vaccines. Four is adjuvants and other things. Let me tell you a little bit about the, what I call internet-based vaccines. To, to understand that, I need to go back to what I was telling you, influenza. I told you what happened in 2009. By 2011, 12, 13, we were all waiting for another pandemic of avian influenza. So uh, while we were waiting for that on Sunday, March 31st of 2013, Easter Day, the Chinese Center for Disease Control put in the internet the sequence of a new avian influenza virus. That virus had killed three people in, in China, had all the properties to be pandemic, and like in 2009, the thing was, let's go and make a vaccine for it. Now, everybody in the world did exactly what had been done in 2009. Isolate the virus. Well, this time was not in, in Mexico and um, in the United States. This time was in China. Took two months for the virus to cross the borders, go from China to central disease control in the United States. And then people had to adapt the virus. They had to, to grow in eggs and all those kind of things. Uh, we decided to do things differently that time. Basically, at that time, I was collaborating with Craig Venter, the man who sequenced the human genome. And he had a synthetic a, a group in San Diego. And basically, he, <coughs> he, he, he and our, our group started the process that, to make a vaccine in one week. What did we do? Well, basically, on Monday, the Craig Venter downloaded the sequence in San Diego and started from, from the internet. On Monday, during Monday, it made the two synthetic genes for the two antigens of the influenza virus. Monday night, it put the two synthetic genes into the express mail to uh, our laboratories in Boston. Tuesday morning in Boston, we started to use the two genes to make two, two vaccines completely synthetic. One was a com a conventional vaccine made by a virus that would be grown in eggs. And the other one was an RNA vaccine. By Saturday, we had two vaccines ready to go. And the virus had not left China yet. So that was a moment where we realized that we don't need to ship viruses, biological samples. We can ship information. It's going to go at the speed of light. And you can rescue the information on another, another side of the world and work with that. So that's the transition that I call the transition from analog vaccines to, biological, to digital vaccines. Basically, uh, with, up to that moment, to make a vaccine, we need a virus. And we need a material we, or a bacterium. And we need to grow, to kill, to transfer, uh, go through uh, uh, <coughs> different borders to grow them. And, but from now on, you don't need that, the virus anymore. All you need is information. Uh, basically, the, when you look at RNA vaccines, uh, basically, it's only a transfer of information. You start from the left, from a chemical code, which is the genomic, genomic sequence. You put in, transform it to a digital code, which is zeros and ones. 
And then you transform digital code into another chemical code, which is the RNA. In fact, with RNA, we are now actually delivering vaccines. We are delivering the information that is used by our cells to make vaccines. So it's all digital. What are the consequences of this? Well, think in, in a few years, the way we're gonna make vaccines is basically someone is gonna sequence a pathogen somewhere in the world. The information, the sequence is gonna send to a, through the internet to a computer. Computer is gonna use artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever you wanna use. It's gonna design a vaccine because all vaccines that now on will be designed. And then it's gonna send information again through the internet to robotic stations placed in the most remote part of the world. And then you're gonna have local your vaccine. Now, uh, you can also do a little bit of science fiction. Think about Mars. 2050, you're gonna have a colony in Mars. And if you have a pandemic there or you have a problem there, there are two ways to send a vaccine or other medications. One is to send a space shuttle, it's gonna take nine months. Or you send the information through the internet, there is a robotic station there, and in 48 hours it's gonna be there. That's kind of vision of the future, it's a little bit of science fiction, but the only science fiction here is the colony on Mars. All the rest is actually pretty real. Uh, let's go back to reality. What happened in 2020? 2020, Chinese Center of Disease Control, January 10, put the sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus into the internet on <coughs> immediately. 350 labs worldwide this time were ready to download the sequence, get the, <coughs> uh, make a synthetic gene, and then the synthetic gene was made, used to make three different types of vaccines. One was completely synthetic, basically synthetic gene make, uh, to make an RNA vaccine, very fast, completely synthetic, 66 days Moderna was in clinical trials. Others used the synthetic gene to splice the gene into a viral vector, mostly adenovirus. Then you have to grow the virus, took a little bit longer, but in three months, uh, Oxford was in clinical trials. Others did a more conventional vaccine, you still start from the synthetic gene, you is, use the synthetic gene to engineer yeast cells, mammalian cells, plant cells to produce a spike protein of the virus, then you add an adjuvant and then you make a vaccine. But in six months you could go into the clinical trials. And then you know the rest of the story. Basically, immediately we found out that the viral vectors were immunogenic, the RNA vaccines were a little bit better, actually, quite a bit better than the viral vectors, and the spike proteins plus adjuvants are also very good. Um, things move very fast. In six months, basically, we knew uh, the vaccines were efficacious, very excited. That was the end of was September, October uh, 2020. Now, I told you about the miracle of the technology, but the technology was not the only reason why we went fast. The other reason it went fast was basically the unprecedented investment of the public sector. Uh, in order to understand that, let me tell you more or less how we do vaccine development usually in a company. Basically, you start with discovery in the past, in, in the left, and by the way, to make a vaccine, every vaccine takes at least a billion investment for, for a company. You start with discovery, cost 10% of that, when discovery is successful, then you move into early development, there's another 20% of that billion. It's only when you have a proof of concept in the clinic the vaccine is gonna work. Then you go into the late development where you spend 70% of the investment, and now you start to make a manufacturing plant, you do hundreds of millions in phase three clinical trials, do all these kind of things. Now, that's how we normally do things. Now, with this, it usually takes 10, 15 years to make a vaccine. Now, when we went back into 2020, basically what happened was that we had not the luxury to wait 10 years. So the public sector started to put together some money. 
the most important part was work speed from the United States, 12.5 billion. Then uh, UK, Europe, Japan added some more for a total of 15 billion. And then they came to us, manufacturers. And they said, hey guys, I know you do vaccine development sequentially. You do discovery, then phase one, then phase two, and then phase three. Um, and, and that takes 10, 20 years. We cannot wait for that. I know you do that sequentially because you had to, mod to basically to modulate uh, your financial risk. You cannot afford to spend a billion up front. You'll go bankrupt. This time, here's the money. They had the check. Company X, a billion. Company Y, two billion. Company uh, C, whatever, uh, half a billion, depending on the needs. But now you need to weigh, to change completely the way you make your vaccine develop. So let's start for this discovery. Discovery can take I mean, six months, a year or two, don't wait. As soon as you have the first thing that you believe is going to work, you move to early development, phase one. By the way, start immediately to make a manufacturing plant. I know it's not going to, uh, <coughs> it, it, it may not be useful if we don't have a vaccine, but we don't want to have a vaccine or have a manufacturing plant. So do the manufacturing plant at risk, go to phase one. And phase one could take 18 months, two, two years. Don't wait. As soon as you have the first results and you have safety and immunogenicity, you move to phase two. Once you are in phase two, that could take three years sometimes. As soon as you have information about the immunogenicity dose and safety, you move to phase three. That way, we got vaccine in, three, in 10 months, just by making things in parallel. Now, many people say, well, you got, went fast, you took a risk. Yes, we took a financial risk, which was taken by the public sector. We did not take risk on safety and efficacy. Every single step was that. Now, I was more or less saying the same things uh, a year and a half ago in a, in a panel, and there was a, an economist, a Nobel Prize in economy, Michael Kramer. And at the end of this discussion, he says, so what do you think it took to pay back the, those 12.5 billion? And I started to think. And he says, 12 hours. By anticipating the uh, availability of vaccines by 12 hours was enough to repay the investment done by worse speed. Because at that time, the world economy was burning uh, 900 billion per month. So that, actually, that was a quite uh, different way of thinking. I always thought the public sector was spending money, and now I realize the public sector was actually making huge investments and was getting the best return I ever you could think of out of that investment. So uh, following that, I started to work with a collaborator, uh, David Bloom, Harvard, University, also an economist, started to look at what we were spending before the, before the pandemic, what we spent during the pandemic, and then we'll look at what we are planning to spend now, and we calculate how much we should spend. And basically, the idea is that if you really want to prepare the world for the, uh, real, to be prepared for a future pandemic, we need to spend 10 times what we are spending now. Uh, almost a trillion will be necessary globally to be well prepared. Well, that's uh, the, the other reason why we went fast. Uh, let's go back to December 2020. Now, we had the vaccine, they were efficacious, ready to go. Immediately, we realized that in just March, April 2021, 20, that th those vaccines were waning. And so people started, oh my God, what's going on? The RNA vaccines don't work. They don't last long. Uh, and um, we don't know all the answers at this point. But there is one thing that we know is that for sure that people have forgotten completely the basic principles of immunology. And 
To do that, I went back. This is a curve that of immunology in a test book of immunology 1970s. And basically explains that on the left, when you have initial exposure or you immunize one or two doses, you get a primary response, pretty small, that goes up and comes down. Then if you give a second immunization six, eight months later or another exposure, you get the secondary immunization. Now you go back much higher and you, and then things decrease, but you never go back to the levels of the first time. So that's basic immunology, well known, 1970. How do we explain what's going on right now? Well, you have to explain that <coughs> by the fact that we got variants. So when we, we made the vaccine for the Wuhan initial virus, I mean, there was very little, basically, uh, antibodies were necessary to neutralize this virus. If the Wuhan had been and not changed, we would have a vaccine that was more or less lifelong. But we basically changed the threshold. The beta came, and that requires tenfold the neutralizing antibodies that you needed for Wuhan. And, and then we got Omicron, 44 times more antibodies to neutralize. So basically, we got to the point where with Omicron and with all the variants of Omicron, uh, we can get, when we give an immunization, we get protection from infection for a few months, but then we go below the threshold, we get infection again. And now we are in this situation where you need to vaccinate every six months because otherwise you get infection. Fortunately, we are talking about infection. All vaccines basically are protecting from severe disease. So basically, we are <coughs> the, the fact that we can go around that with our mask or things, is even if we get infected, unless we are in very fragile population, basically we, we are protected from infected disease, from severe disease. But vaccines will, the current vaccines will not be able to prevent us from <coughs> infection. And this is a study that just came out in New England Journal of Medicine, it shows that after vaccination, after the fourth dose, basically you get lower risk of infection uh, for first 35 days. Uh, first three months, lower risk of infection, but basically after, uh, after six months, four or five months, basically you are susceptible to be infected again. Well, that's a story I wanted to share with you. A few final considerations. Uh, we, are, we, all know, we are, all know we are vulnerable to emerging infections. They kill millions of people, massive economic loss. Vaccine monoclonal antibodies, the allow a fast response. Government invested, but not enough. Uh, I told you the story about the 12.5 billion. And now we are, the, globally, we are trying to work to make vaccines faster, and the aspiration now is uh, 100 days. Uh, this is just to show that the red and uh, green line, that the Vaccines and human monoclonal antibodies were the best and fastest uh, answers to a pandemic. Drugs came much later, so we need to focus on, on vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. And the last thing I wanted to share with you is that um, I've been working in the private sector for 40 years, making vaccines. Uh, at the end of October, I left the private sector, it was the GSK was the last one I've been working with, to uh, become a scientific director of the New Italian Initiative is basically to make a center for pandemic preparedness. Uh, and this is going to be a national center, uh, which for the moment is well funded by the Italian government for three years. Uh, obviously, the ambition is not to be only Italian, but to be a resource for Europe and the world, to collaborate with the best people worldwide that are doing similar things. We will focus on vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. And uh, our target will be emerging viruses and one thing that people don't talk about, which is a silent pandemic but very worrisome, which is basically antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and we're going to do discovery, uh, GMP manufacturing, clinical trials up to approval uh, for emergency approval. And with that, I really would like to thank you for your attention. Wonderful. So thank you very much, Vino. That was a wonderful lecture and really very insightful and 
just full of, um, I think, inspiration. So, um, as the, the, the topic of today is, of course, very hot, probably there are some burning questions. Unfortunately, Reno has to leave uh, in a couple of uh, moments, so therefore, this is your chance now to ask. Whoever has a question, please ask now. All questions are answered. So, Rindu, <laughs> then let me ask a question. So, um, obviously, you have come from biological science as an experimentalist, basic science, and now you reach this stage here, changing the world and changing also the policies and so on. So, what would be your sort of take-home lesson also for the students of today of what should they do? Should they study now computer science? Should they study economics or life sciences? What, what would it be that you... Tell them. Well, there is no one science going to solve the problem. So, uh, the and people should focus on what they like to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's clear that uh, even if you cannot be deep in every single part of the different sciences, you need to be able to talk to the other people who are doing are doing that kind of science. So you need. Uh, to be able to understand what's going on. I mean, I started looking at microbes in the microscope, and when I was looking at, the, at that, I was fine. Now, I, can, I don't, uh, if, by doing that, I don't get very much information. I need to process, uh, I mean, so much information. Everything comes from analysis and predictions, artificial intelligence, and I'm not an expert on that, but unless I know how to use it, it's a problem. So uh, that's, so you need to partner and have uh, I mean, be in kind of a system where you're able to talk to the different disciplines and being able to integrate them. Mm -hmm. And obviously you need to be deep in one or two of them. Wonderful, thank you. So uh, I think that is great advice for this university also, for the next generation of scientists whom we educate here. Um, I'm just looking in the audience. I don't see much, I must say, because these lights are pretty bright. So uh, any other question from the audience? Those of you who are driving to Mars or Moon, oh, there's Sebastian, please. Sebastian Springer. Yeah, just a tiny question. Um, what is, in, in all of this, what is the role of the universities? <laughs> well, the, I mean, we are all, uh, the question is, what is the role of the universities in, in this system? And I'll tell you, I mean, I've been working for 40 years in, in a company uh, making vaccines. I never made vaccines alone in a company. I always collaborated with many universities at the same time, reaching different, uh, different disciplines, different technology, different scientists. Uh, nobody gets makes things alone. I mean, it's so important to be part of the network. And by the way, I think what's happening today is, what I was saying is that, I mean, you need so much information you need to be i mean i think the big innovation is coming is going to come between computer science artificial intelligence and by life sciences mm -hmm. that's where things are going to happen i mean if you can, can bet which are the, going to be the discoveries in the future that's where it's going, it's going to be Thank you, Renu. We couldn't agree more, I would say. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. And I thank you very much for sharing your insights. A brilliant talk. Thank you. I think it is now clear that we are in very safe hands and we are prepared for the next pandemic uh, with Reno uh, taking care of us. So, wonderful. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce one of my colleagues. And this is Professor Sebastian Springer. He is actually one of the initial faculty members of this university. Then it was still IUB, International University Bremen. Then it was Jakobs, and now it's Constructor University. So Sebastian is pretty much at the crossroads as well, because um, he was trained as a biochemist, and uh, however he works, more as a cellular immunologist, I would say. He has also um, founded a company, namely um, Tetramere Shop, and uh, this was sold quite successfully, and now he is a co-founder of yet another company, and that is involved in vaccination. And uh, this is called Vaccimate Oral GmbH. Um, so, Sebastian is a great inspirational speaker, and he is a great mentor for students as well, so I know that the students are also watching. Um, Sebastian also sometimes goes over time, that's why we agreed that I will take the time and then dance you off the stage, if you go over time. Sebastian, welcome to the stage. And we are looking forward to your yeah. presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Claudia, for raising these uh, impossible expectations. And um, 
Äh, ja, ähm, dir esteemed guests, dear Serge, Philipp, Fabio, Maya, after the very inspirational and beautiful talk by uh, Reno, I would like to take you a little bit more uh, or deeply into some local aspects. And um, in order to do this, I would like to have my slides. Yes, thank you. Maybe we'll start with the first one. No, this is still Reno's. Ah, wonderful, excellent. So um, while I, while I um, uh, have the privilege to stand here in front of you and talk to you today, of course, there are many other laboratories here on uh, campus that do life sciences and experimental sciences and who have very exciting approaches. My own passion is for the fight of the immune system against viruses and tumors. So for, here's a good example. You have here in that uh, Petri dish, you have a virus infected cell and to that same Petri dish you admit a, uh, a T cell of the immune system. And when you put them together, you can see what happens. The T cell latches on to the virus infected cell and it forces it to undergo a kind of suicide called apoptosis. This is something that happens in all of our bodies any moment in the fight of our immune systems against viruses. Now, one of the things that's kept my laboratory very interested over the last 20 years is the question of how does the T cell know that the, that cell is infected by a virus. The virus is outside the cell, but the T, but the, uh, sorry, the T cell is outside the cell, of course, but the virus is in the cell. So how does the T cell know? Well, this turns out to be because of a process called antigen presentation. So this yellow circle here, this is the cell, and inside that cell there are proteins, the main components of the cell, and they get broken down into little fragments called peptides. And those peptides, they bind to this red pitchfork-like object. It's a protein called an MHC class 1 molecule. So I warned you it would get slightly scientific today. That MHC class 1 molecule takes those fragments to the surface of the cell and presents them to the outside. That's why it's called presentation. Now, what has that got to do with viruses? Well, it's easy. Once a virus infects a cell, you make virus proteins. Those get broken down into viral peptide fragments. Those get presented on the cell surface, and there are killer T cells that catch those uh, complexes, and this is how they recognize that the cell is infected by a virus. And that's exactly what we've been watching in the movie. Now, for the last few years, it's been known also that that same system also operates in tumors. So when, you have a, when uh, there's a patient with cancer, you have mutations. Mutations mean new proteins. New proteins mean different peptide fragments. That means different peptide fragments presented at the cell surface and different T cells killing those tumor cells. So now you've learned in one minute how the immune system fights uh, viruses and tumors. The slight problem, of course, you will see, is that this doesn't always work like that. There are still people, of course, who get sick with viruses, and unfortunately, there are still people who die from cancer every year. So we, as life scientists, we would like to hack this process a little bit. We would like to tell the immune system much better about viruses. That's what's called vaccination. And we would like to provide specific cytotoxic T cells to patients so that those T cells can go and kill the tumors more efficiently. Turns out that the big problem with this is something that Reno has already talked about just a minute ago, and that's, oh, okay, here we have a 90 degree rotation. Um, <laughs> that is exactly this process by which the um, Uh, drugs are designed. So you have to rotate your head now by 90 degrees, and you can see that this, uh, this entire process of going projects, and as Reno has just told you, this will cost $1 billion or euros. Now, um, 
here at Jacobs, we realized, in fact, just now mentioned also uh, the sum of one trillion that's required as an investment. Now here at, uh, the, uh, at this university, we calculate maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, we don't calculate trillions. So then what is the role of the university? So I just want to very briefly remind you of the good old division of labor between academia and business. And um, this is very similar to a slide that Fabio showed earlier. The, um, in academia, what we try to do is we try to understand the world by asking all sorts of questions, um, crazy questions. We, may, we build models of the world inside our head, and then we try to verify or falsify these, uh, these things. And um, this is very frustrating. Often it goes wrong. Most experiments don't work. And um, sometimes uh, things will uh, uh, be good enough to be taken up into a business prospect. And from there, you can, it is quite clear how to build a business case if you have a good convincing product, especially if it's tested already in the market. And that is how you go to application. I'm showing this slide because of today, because in, a, in an institution like this, where research and business are close together, many big, exciting things are possible. So out of this, I would like to, uh, to tell you in the last few minutes that remain, uh, two examples of how this can be made to work. One of them from the past and one of them from the future, hopefully. And the one that is from the past, this has to do, in fact, with tumor immunology. My research group for many years has been interested in how this process of antigen presentation works in a mechanistic fashion. And when you zoom into the cell and you look at this process in greater detail, you see this bewildering array of arrows and processes and proteins and things, all of which we've been studying to detail. But one of the things that we found especially interesting, which will to you appear like a tiny little detail, is the difference in the structure between this MHC class 1 protein without the peptide fragment and with the peptide fragment over here. I'm sorry. Oops, I have to go back. If I could, yeah, okay, very good. So, in order to be able to do this, then you ask yourself, how can you manipulate this? How can you even deal with this? And I must remind you, of course, that the scale at which we're operating for proteins is in the nanometer range. These are very, very small things. And uh, they are actually quite similar to, uh, the, to, uh, the, to the nanostructures of modern physics. And so it's not surprising that many of the techniques, technologies that we use for investigation and analysis are actually quite similar to the techniques that are used in the physics of nanostructures in the same way. So in order to be able to investigate this question of the difference that I have just uh, told you about, we first looked at the detailed molecular structure of the protein, which you can see here. It's very beautiful. I could go on for a very long time. I think Claudia would get upset about this, so I will not. But you can see here this uh, peptide fragment, and then you can... And then we decided to perform a computer simulation called a molecular dynamics simulation. And uh, this, is, uh, what, this is what you... Um, okay, let's see. Okay, this has, oh, okay. These movies, I can, okay, good. These movies are not working here now, but I can, uh, I can, I can tell you maybe what you would see. On the left-hand side, these computer simulations, they explore the mobility of the protein. And the, um, uh, uh, and uh, if, the, if the, uh, the, the peptide fragment is here, then this, uh, the, the structure is very calm, it fluctuates just a tiny little bit, and it's a very calm uh, structure generally. When you, once you remove the peptide in the middle, these, uh, uh, the, the movements become very unruly, and especially here in the top section of the protein, these uh, helices, they move very far apart. It's a bit of a pity that you can't see this here right now. But then what happened, well, we decided in order to figure out whether this was relevant and real, we decided to bridge these two helices with a solid clamp called a disulfide bond. And if you do that, you repeat that the simulation, um, then you find that now the molecule behaves completely differently. It's very ordered and very structured and nice. 
So from this, we, then we, we took this protein, we expressed it in cells, and we realized that really now it was behaving as if it had uh, the peptide fragment bound. So we had proven our basic science point, but maybe what was more interesting about this is that it allowed us to um, produce in, the, um, in, in our laboratory uh, an, a novel reagent called an MHC tetramer, which is made of four of these MHC molecules. And because the, uh, we now had a stable, empty uh, a protein, we could add those tumor peptides and we could use those MHC tetramers for the recognition, for the staining, for the labeling of tumor-specific T cells. And there you see an example. This is a so-called flow cytometry experiment here. You see all the T cells of the patient and the green ones are the ones that we have identified that are specific against the tumor. What is this good for? You can use this in a process called adoptive transfer tumor immunotherapy. You have a patient, you take out the tumor, from the tumor you isolate the T-cells, you test the T-cells for the recognition of the tumor using our uh, tetramers, and then you purify those and hopefully put them back into the patient. That's exactly what I mentioned in the very beginning of my presentation. So, of course, when you have a paper, it doesn't mean that you have a company. There is this uh, famous validation gap in between, and this is something that we can be here as a university particularly proud of um, uh, for mastering this validation gap all the way together. Um, the second uh, invention that I wanted to talk to you about, maybe just very super briefly, is by these two gentlemen, one in Argentina and one in France, and they have discovered just recently a very wonderful new vaccine technology that we're very interested in. And this involves so-called VLPs or virus-like particles. They're small lipid bubbles, you can see this on the left, uh, a little bit like the Moderna vaccine or the BioNTech vaccine, but they don't contain any RNA. But instead, on their surface, they contain something called a, a variant surface protein. This is from a parasite, and that leads to an, an extremely strong immune stimulation of the membranes of the nose, the throat, the lungs, and the intestine. So that's exactly where a virus would attack. And uh, the inventors had this very good idea of attaching the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 to these virus-like particles. They produce them in, an, uh, uh, in, in cell culture, and they use them as a uh, test vaccine in mice, and they found that the mice make a very nice immune response in exactly those places where you want it. But the best thing about this was that you got the best immune response. Here I'm showing some real data. The best thing that I'm, uh, was that the, um, the mice showed the best immune response if the vaccine was eaten instead of injected which makes sense because those are the areas that you want to stimulate. So then, um, this tells us, you know, there's a lot of excitement ahead. We, have, uh, we are going to take this on and we're going to try to bring this to realization and transfer. But for now, it's left for me, to me to say thank you and I'll take questions if there's time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Yeah, yeah, of course you would need more time, but I think this was wonderful. So, um, I heard that there also uh, probably somebody who can read questions from the online audience. So, the in-presence audience or the online audience, who has questions for Sebastian? Oops. Very silent, this audience. The, yeah, it's kind of dark in the back. It's, it's, it's sort of very dark in the back, yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah. We can hardly see anything. Here's a yeah. question. I can only hear. There's yeah. a question. Is that Teresa or Mariana or who no. is it? There's yeah. one in the back. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, you don't have a microphone. Yeah, sorry. Sam, so a microphone is coming. It's coming to you. <laughs> the microphone is coming to you. You know, this happens when experimentalists talk. Okay. <laughs> this was working. We always have experiments I, here. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could you please tell us how fast it takes for a T cell to actually recognize a tumor cell? Just the dynamic, how fast that process is. 
how how long it would take half, yeah, or half us. for the recognition. Yeah. Um, so the the recognition process we're talking about maybe something that like I've showed here a few hours perhaps. But of course it has to you know of course it has to get there it has to get to the place. Yeah. All right, Sebastian. Then. Good. Uh, the good thing about your last experiment that you mentioned is that uh, we can eat the vaccine. Yeah. Do you think this is going to be the answer for many, many remote areas yeah. and people who yeah. are afraid of needles? Well, it's got, it's got two main advantages. The first one is that you can eat it. So the idea is that you might actually be getting sterilizing immunity. Yeah? So far, you know, people have wondered a lot, you know, if there's a vaccine against coronavirus, why do I still get infected? Yeah? Because the current vaccines don't prevent infection, they just prevent serious disease, right? So the idea is would, to be, would be to do, try to develop a vaccine that actually prevents infection altogether. And the second thing is, you know, that, you know, if it's an edible vaccine, it also means it's heat stable, yeah, you can carry it in your backpack into the jungle and serve the people who live there, for example, or in uh, developing countries or wherever you want. Yeah. So in principle, it's actually very exciting. It's a exci really exciting platform. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. So Thank you very, very much, Sebastian. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we now have a little change in program. And the change in program is that now we hopefully can connect to Serge Bell. And so this means that I hand over the stage again to Natalie Strauss. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. So for now, as uh, Claudia already announced, we will try to connect with Serge Bell. Um, let's see if we get him on the screen. So I, will I think click. I'm here. Hi. Serge Hi. Bell, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Wonderful. I can hear and see you. So That's great. I will leave the stage to you to talk about okay. machine intelligence in science by constructor approach. Enjoy. Right. So uh, this is a, a very uh, general purpose speech, which we have prepared uh, very hard over some last uh, months um, just to carry a very simple message. So the fact of the message that we are surrounded by problems this is well known. Uh, we are very much aware of aging and disease, where aging is one of the uh, versions of disease. Uh, we are surrounded by poverty and social injustice. Uh, apparently, this is uh, related to aging and disease and related to everything else. Uh, we do have uh, generally huge problem with nature, environment, and sustainability. There's many ways to fight it and not necessarily always um, very straightforward. Definitely, it is not about uh, stopping progress. Uh, we are apparently experiencing a very difficult time with war and violence. And for sure, we understand that due to uh, many of the problems before, uh, we need to explore um, universe and space. We cannot stay as a humanity on Earth, uh, this is very clear. At some point, it will not be enough, one way or another. Now, we know that the way to solve problems, which has worked for humans very well, is science. And um, there is huge uh, advances in science over the past 100 years, uh, 150 years specifically, but we still have many unresolved problems in science. Very basic problems they are uh, in physics, such as um, you know, why do we have so much dark matter and what is the physics of it? Uh, finally, unified theory between, uh, uh, gra between gravitation and quantum mechanics, uh, which is potentially related to interpretations of quantum mechanics. Uh, which is related to a huge question about what is time. Uh, we don't know in physics what is time and what is scale. Scale is related to time. Things are only separated because it takes time for light to reach one thing to another. We are not uh, completely clear of the reach of machine intelligence. 
whether it can be subhuman, human or superhuman, and what can it do. We definitely do not know what is the potential uh, reach of life, uh, where can life go, what is life and what is aging and how can we age uh, you know, much longer. You know, we know maybe how to age two times longer, but how to age 10 times longer for sure, it's not uh, clear at all. We don't know how human brain works. It's a basic thing. It's in the head of everybody of ours, but we even have Nobel Prize winners such as Roger Penrose, who won Nobel Prize last year, uh, who is um, thinking about the fact that there is non-classical interactions in the brain. And, and there are some research recently, which is saying that a uh, brain is not just a classical computer. And also recently we started to realize that we need a theory of knowledge, that knowledge is a significant physical um, um, matter. It, it's part of the universe. It's not just some emerging uh, phenomenon and we don't really have a theory of knowledge while well, knowledge does affect matter. And <clears throat> you know, if you think about humans and you think about knowledge, uh, there is a uh, you know, very clear evolution of knowledge, uh, which has happened over the past uh, several billion years, it started from uh, basic organisms such as bacteria, which invented the knowledge um, copying, knowledge preservation, and knowledge generation mechanism, DNA, uh, which then resulted in more complicated behaviors and basic nervous systems of um, things like reptiles and other invertebrates, uh, which then led to um, even more sophisticated social behaviors um, with some version of maybe cultural behaviors transferred from generation to generation in higher animals, uh, for example, such as wolves. And then we came to learning and mems, which are present and primates and aping and copying each other and, and there are some signs of language, uh, but then we get into humans. And today we can think of humans as a universal explainers. Uh, humans are able to create, uh, record, uh, preserve, transfer explanatory knowledge. And, and so, you know, it is a big question, which we don't know the answer is whether humans are universal explainers and can explain the universe at all or not. Now, if we look at human brain, which is much younger than uh, the human, than the life species, it went through significant evolution over the past millions of years. But even with human brain, we have many many things which we don't understand. So the basic thing is compute memory and communication. We definitely know that there is a different speed, different memory capacity and different learning and communication capacity of different people's brains, but we don't necessarily know how to manage it, how to improve it, what causes uh, one brain to work much better than another brain. It sounds very basic, but it's a fact. We have many people in this room who have more memories and other memory than other people, but we don't know exactly why it is. The brain looks very similar if you sort of take it out and cut it out. Then you have these four interesting phenomena, uh, which are almost philosophical at our current level of understanding consciousness. What is it? You know, it's clearly that uh, it's present, but it sort of disappears in our sleep and it sort of uh, completely disappears with us dying. And it can be somehow restored if we are quickly enough uh, brought to life or part of it gets lost. Free will, which is almost a physics uh, problem. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost a physics problem because it relates to the fact whether the world is deterministic. Do we have free will or not? Then we have something which is sort of intermediate uh, between free will and creativity, which is intuition, which is ability to sort of feel certain things. And then apparently the things are correct. Um, and you know, on a very large uh, data set, humans can somehow come up with intuitive predictions, which in many cases end up being true, even though we don't always, um, we are not always able to explain how. We have some ideas about intuition, but it's definitely difficult to have 
uh, any kind of analogy of intuition in modern computers. And finally, we have creativity, which is, of course, related to consciousness, free will, and intuition, but we also don't know how it works. You know, clearly, most of creativity, most of knowledge creation happens in our brain. And clearly, creativity is needed for almost every brain activity because without creativity, we cannot even communicate. Uh, all of us recreate the meaning of communication in our brain, but we don't know what it is. Now, <clears throat> on, on top of that, and, and recently we realized that there is significant advantage which machines can bring us, especially with advance of machine intelligence, but even before with computational methods. And with machine intelligence, it is very clear that there are some um, you know, very specific advantages where machine intelligence can do uh, differently better from human brains. Not necessarily better in everything because we don't know many things on the previous slide, but definitely it is much faster. So it's, it's one billion times uh, faster in a digital computer. If we think about photonic computers of the future, we can be one billion times faster per operation. So much faster. Uh, it, it is a much larger memory capacity. So the, the brain apparently accumulates in some very imperfect way, 2.5 petabytes of information, a lot of information. Today, to have the same amount of information in similarly accessible form, you need a, you know, a rack, uh, uh, you know, a sort of a cabinet of computers. Uh, but, uh, you know, definitely today, global accessible internet information is about 100 zettabytes, uh, 50 million times more than, than you have in a human brain. And, and that amount will uh, grow more than 10x uh, over the next uh, 10 years and will continue to grow um, uh, perhaps even faster in the future. It's also much faster communication. So you can definitely communicate uh, with a computer today. Uh, we are looking at the startups which can make a single optical fiber communicating 30 terabytes per second. So uh, that will take just 100 uh, seconds to communicate the full capacity of a human brain. Then you can have many more elements in a human, in a computer. A single Cerebras chip, which is the largest chip available today, has about 30 trillion transistors and only 86 billion neurons. Uh, on the average in the brain. Of course, uh, the single neuron is not a single transistor, uh, but uh, we already have neural networks with more neurons than a human brain. So these are objectively uh, things which, which enhance human uh, capacity. In addition to that, we're coming into the situation where we are getting a very new um, computing paradigms such as quantum computers. And so, uh, we personally, as, as a group, predict that we will have uh, 1 million logical qubits uh, quantum computers in the less than 10 years or around that time. And, and that allows to do to, to operations which are impossible on a classical computer. So that may mean that for sure there are things which we can explore with machine intelligence, just like we can explore with uh, microscopes and telescopes and uh, planes and ships uh, much broader and wider than we can do with uh, human brain. Um, now, <clears throat> we can see that there is a lot of confirmations to these statements. So just over the last um, three years, and specifically over the last one year, we see uh, basically uh, machine intelligence winning in every game uh, possible. So winning in, um, in Go, in uh, chess, in learning faster, being more creative, uh, creating more sophisticated combinations um, in any game uh, with rules. Uh, we also see um, good research for code. Uh, there is a lot of progress in generating code with computers. And there is a lot of code which can be generated faster than humans. One of the major problems today in overall technology, as you will hear from a speech of my partner, uh, Stanislav Pratasov, is creation of new software. Uh, and also machine intelligence can generate art. And art looks great. And in fact, um, in many cases, it's, it's very difficult to see that 
the art generated by AI is, is uh, you know, less sophisticated than the art generated by people. Uh, AI wins, of course, um, different STEM competitions and solving problems in a very, very sophisticated fashion. It was solving problems. Um, the computers were solving problems in many cases better uh, even before AI with computational engines um, and computational theorem proofs. And we have also sophisticated use of AI in protein folding. Um, perhaps not all of the proteins can be folded well with AI, but it, it is much better than human intuition about which um, molecules to use for which drugs or which treatments. And, and so <clears throat> with that, we, we, we have one uh, sort of major opportunity uh, and, and in the same way, we, we do have a, a major challenge. And, and that's a challenge which we want to present to the audience and overall. So first, we definitely see that there are still many advances needed in hardware to reasonably emulate what we know today of things like human brain to be creative. But these advances are happening, GPUs, TPUs, um, NPUs, neuromorphic processors, and, and but, but there is much more opportunity for better hardware. Hardware is definitely needed. You will see that today machine intelligence um, uh, researchers can easily occupy a billion dollar of hardware. We recently had a proposal to create Institute of Advanced Studies for Machine Intelligence for Constructor University. And in this proposal, we small university need to buy almost $50 million worth of hardware and just to make sort of basic uh, machine intelligence research. Uh, there is a lot of progress in software. There is many, many middleware um, which is created for running on that hardware. Much of it is open source. Some of that is closed source. Um, middleware is becoming more powerful, more sophisticated. There is many things which can be created in computers. There is much more user experience improvements uh, as well. So you have <clears throat> uh, you have uh, a barrier, you have many different technologies to make it easier to program, to make it easier to express machine intelligence problems, such as Julia, which is specifically targeting um, scientific audience and uh, MATLAB as a programming language. And there are many islands where machine intelligence is already used in science, uh, such as uh, you know, breast research, such as cardiovascular research, lung, brain. These are just islands in medical imaging, but there are islands in every piece of science where machine intelligence is already generating significant advances. These are just islands. But there is a need, uh, we believe, for making machine intelligence to be able to be uh, doing science, to be able to be coming up with explanatory knowledge, which is a version of knowledge, and knowledge is a version of information, which is much more valuable, which is able to replicate itself much better, much faster, and modify itself faster. And we believe for that, um, there is a need for universal machine formalism. It's a way in which we can explain all of the science to machines. Machines are not humans. They don't think the same way, and they don't uh, communicate in the same way and don't memorize things in the same way and don't copy things in the same way. And, and so talking to them in English is not necessarily great. Uh, writing pictures is not necessarily great. Using some simple mathematics language is not great. And even programming in Python is not an ideal way to talk to them about science. And so that is sort of a call. We believe there is a need for a way to explain uh, science of many domains to machines. And at that point, I will pass uh, this to my uh, colleague and partner, Andrei Ustuzhanin, who will talk about uh, some scientific ideas in, in that regard. Andrei. Uh, okay, I hope now now it does. Uh, yeah, so 
Good, good day, good morning, everyone. Uh, Sergey, thank you for uh, passing this to me. And so, in in my part, I would like to. Do you think it works? I think it, I think it won't because uh, control is on his side. So I just uh, use so it's natural language recognition in in in, in uh, process. Uh, in a so human in part, brain, yeah, I, I will be able to recognize what you say. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, so, in my part, I would like to cover two big islands or two, two big uh, theories that, that are out there for quite a long period of time. Due to the short um, time frame, it's, it's not going to be really explanatory. So, but, but I hope that you will get a glimpse of the iceberg, like what kind of problems you can try to solve with this. And, um, so, of course, machine intelligence is taking over the science, it, and many examples have been shown by Serge already. However, uh, there are still no uh, coherent and um, common uh, understanding how, how machine intelligence actually does this. So, there is um, no theory of deep learning that has been uh, accepted by community. Uh, several approaches uh, already there. And uh, yeah, you, can, you can switch to the next slide, if possible. So the several approaches uh, are based on the statistical physics, informational theory, representation group flow, category theory, or topos. And what I highlighted here, or that, that are put in bold font, is something that uh, relies on so-called category theory. And so I, I, in the next following few slides, I'm going to give you a very uh, short flavor or very brief flavor how it actually works and why, why it might be relevant to the task of building machine intelligence models that can understand something deeper that we can now. So, starting from the very basic uh, understanding, category theory is a study of the compositional structures. So, you have a very simple example here, like we start from the very basic stuff and there are objects that somehow connected with each other within the category. So you see the category contains people, uh, contains um, other people and contains uh, some kind of food that they like and there are relations. So unlike the set theory that studies properties, this, uh, these relations actually impose a structure on the objects that we study. And, and this is very important from many perspectives that they will see. So, uh, the, the uh, important thing that we can consider theory on many, uh, category theory on many levels, and categories uh, has already been uh, applied to many domains. So, we'll show uh, examples where they already uh, be, been, been, been successfully used so, on the next slide, uh, we'll, I'll show you even uh, simpler building blocks, like what, what category is and how you can represent it. Uh, first, of, first of all is objects, right? So, that describes uh, what kind of stuff is there. And it, it's not necessarily a set, it can be uh, something, something bigger. Uh, then morphisms, and, and those morphisms actually should be, it's not some, anything, it, it's something that allows composition. So, if you draw a line connecting two dots and there is a third dot then uh, connected with the second, then it means that you can get the first and the, sec and the third uh, using the composition of the first steps, like on the last slide. Uh, and then you can display it in the two different ways. The first one, the point is an object and the arrow is a, a morphism, or uh, you can display it a little differently. So we'll see both, and those are basically uh, interchangeable. In some examples, the second is more, uh, is more appropriate because it allows you to do so-called graphical calculus. So next slide, or next part of the slide. Um, so, and, and this example of the so-called partial order category. So it has integers, and there is a relation uh, less of that, 
uh, or more of that between any two integers. You, so you see some structure between those objects. So next slide, um, a few more examples. So a category of sets uh, that contains sets as objects, all possible sets, and functions between sets as a morphisms. So, it's, so you can describe it. Or computational category. So it contains as objects all data types, and um, the transmorphism between data types is, is just some functions that, that do some execution, and you can compose those functions into steps that, that or give you a program. So it, it, and, and you can go on. So you can uh, describe in a similar way almost any domain that you can think of, right? So let's go to the next slide. Uh, but there is more, uh, because when you think of a category as an object, right, so you kind of go to the next level, so you can describe morphism between categories, and this is a special kind of relations, it's kind of a metastructure that is described by functors. So the functors map you uh, one category to another, and there is one more thing. If you build two functors that map from one category to another category, like on this, on this plot C and D are two different categories. And those functors do something differently, like, but, but they're preserving some basic rules. So <clears throat> there is a, a natural relation between the uh, images of objects that you put from one category to another. Like, like here you see FA and GA uh, to, to different images of A. And there is a relation between those. Right? So, and, and there is a relation between relations. So, like f of f and g of f, g, uh, f, f small, a g of small are different relations that come from this new domain. And, and uh, so, this relation is called natural transformation. So, between uh, images of the same thing in the target category. And this is what the, the whole idea why category theory has been started. So, to make able to do this meta transformation, meta uh, step, and and of course you can repeat it as many times as you want, like it's a very very flexible framework. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, one one special case of the categories that you can uh, encounter in many 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 domains is called monoid. So what is it? Monoid is essentially a special kind of category that takes, uh, takes two objects and produces something uh, in the same domain, with it, producing the same kind of objects, like two colors. If you combine two colors, you get the third color, right? So like on the first part of this picture, and, and you, you just imply that the, the composition is associative and there is identity. So associative is, 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 is demonstrated here in the center, and identity is like, white color doesn't change color at all. So uh, combination of two objects is called a tensor product, like this uh, circle with cross in the middle. So it's, we'll, we'll see it on the next slide with more examples. So, and, and with this monoid category uh, that <coughs> actually allows you to combine uh, two, different step, two different objects into, into some kind of procedure, allows you to describe processes, allows you to describe topological uh, structures, allows you to describe chemical processes, and there is so-called part of the category theory that is called resource theory, that allows you to describe chemical reactions, biological processes, uh, and, and, and many, many, many different stuff that, that, for example, transforms one stuff to another stuff using some uh, catalysis, for example. And uh, even, even some evolutionary biology can be uh, described with the help of this framework as well. Uh, so trying to answer a question why um, tigers have stripes and lions do not have stripes, uh, you might wonder, well, maybe, maybe it's something in the structure of a lion that you need to take into account. Like you take a knife, you dissect lion and tiger and look, but you don't see any, any, any properties that correspond to the, to the stripes. And then you take a better knife and you go repeat this procedure until you come up with a DNA. 
and you say, aha, maybe this is the reason why uh, something is different for one cat and uh, for, for another cat is different, but probably it's not the best answer. It doesn't uh, answer why it is so. So, uh, next slide. Uh, shows you the, the uh, no, 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 the, the one, one, one back end. Uh, so the, the, the composition on the bottom of the slide show you actually how the uh, neo-Darwinian um, theory actually explains this, uh, this reason. So because the, the lions and tigers have to hunt in different environments and during the adaptation process and taking into account properties of environment, you actually develop some features that uh, give you a better advantage in the uh, survival process. So, and you can describe it in, as a simple factor, functor or simple morphism um, that takes a product of different components. So, on the next slide, sh uh, the, there is a like a Rosetta Stone table that shows the relation between different fields uh, that already has been described using category theory formalism. It's not like the full full description of physics, full description of topology, logic, and computation, but at least some part of those. You can, you can describe with a category theory. Um, so the next slide um, shows very important uh, theorem that is modestly called lemma in, in, in category theory. You need a lemma. So it's fundamental uh, understanding that if you have <clears throat> an, two objects, so those could be quite complicated in, in the nature, but you can uh, somehow embed those into uh, a, a category of sets, right? And uh, or whatever, whatever, uh, whatever you mean. So you, you, you can compare those objects not by uh, comparing all the details of those objects, but you're comparing relations uh, of those objects with everybody around, with all other objects potentially. So, and, and if those list of relations is the same for two objects, you can conclude that those objects are the same as well. And we see many examples how this actually works. So, many theorems have been proven using this lemma in the field of mathematics, uh, in topology, in homotopy, uh, cohomology, etc. But in, in, in even real life, like in physics, uh, you can describe the properties of material or compare, ma compare materials using spectrums, right? right? So if spectrums are matching with each other, the uh, complex structure of a material is actually the same. And psychology, when you don't know how the mind of people works and what, what's, what's inside, but behaviorism says, okay, we look at, let's, let's look at the behavior of people and uh, if, if they're behaving similarly, they're thinking uh, in a similar way. Or in linguistics, uh, the quote by uh, John uh, Thorth is, you shall know a word by a company it keeps. So on the next slide, uh, I, I, I provided a few examples uh, that, that uses already the formalism of category theory, like uh, game theory. Uh, it uses category of so-called lens. So it shows uh, connection or uh, morphisms uh, de depicted by boxes that run in one direction and answers going to in other directions. So on the next slide, that very similar formalism has been applied to describe the gradient uh, descent or backpropagation that is used in the many supervised learning neural network nowadays. <clears throat> so uh, those are on the left uh, backpropagation lens structure. Uh, that is used for training a neural network, and the same formalism is, is, uh, actually shows how you can adapt the architecture of a neural network to perform a better, uh, with better accuracy. So it's meta-learning structure. Uh, on the next slide, <coughs> it shows how, can, uh, how can category theory um, uh, used in completely different domains, so it is like the whole field of physics, like it's called topological uh, quantum field theory uh, that describes the property of matter uh, that uh, remain within a very low energy uh, boundary, very low energy. Uh, energy. And uh, you transform properties, transform, change the property of matter, um, changing re relative positions between uh, objects, between particles. 
like those uh, uh, modeled uh, uh, vortices of anions, and, and you change configuration by rotating those particles around each other that you can describe in, the, in a similar way. You, you, you can see this on the right part of the slide, uh, moving one particle around another. So, and um, it was quite, excited, quite exciting a field of research, the whole physics was, was built on this, and the next slide shows um, just how you can design, so it's a conceptual, pro conceptual uh, idea, how you can design computing process using this property. And the f uh, interesting fact that you can describe this uh, compu computational process using categories of those, uh, like, braids, uh, braids uh, you, that they twist around each other. So computational process effectively is de described in the category of uh, using category of topological transformations. And uh, recently there was a proof uh, given by um, the, the team in publishing science, if you're interested you can follow the link, uh, that shows that this actually uh, approach can actually work. So um, next slide shows a little bit different. Uh, uh, and here is the references that, that you might uh, find interesting uh, to, to, and, and give you some breadth of the fields that are covered by uh, category theory. Next uh, part of this slide shows uh, a books, uh, books uh, by uh, Bob uh, Koke, Alex Kissinger, about thinking in pictures and describing quantum physics in, pic in pictures and categories. And the course uh, that recently published by DeepMind that binds together category theory and deep learning. So this, this was pretty much about category theory. Um, what I wanted to cover. Next slide goes into a little bit uh, different domain, but it's somehow related, uh, we'll see a little bit uh, down the stream, how uh, the, the this theory, it's a different theory, uh, that actually uh, tries to approach studying physics from a little bit different perspective instead of uh, trying to figure what are dynamic laws are given under the, for the system under consideration, uh, it tries to ask a question, uh, what are the possible laws actually that, that can happen uh, under the uh, object that we study, for the object that we study? So, for example, if we study a motion of a solar, a solar, pla solar system, planets in the solar system, uh, it, it can account for Newton laws, or it can account for uh, general relativity laws, for example. Uh, but the uh, uh, reasoning that happens in this theory starts with the constraints that are uh, called principles, right? So, and, and, and those principles actually guide uh, selection of laws or kinds of laws that can happen in given world, and given system. Um, and and uh, another thing that they take into account, what is impossible, uh, they call it counterfactual. And there are several uh, like foundations for different uh, theories uh, that, that, for example, bridge quantum classical worlds uh, of information, probability, thermodynamics, life, etc. So, and even they uh, suggested experiment that, that can prove if the quantum theory can express, sorry, gravity theory can express quantum properties, uh, just uh, coming from the ideas of constructors. Um, so, and uh, one, one property that this, or one uh, feature this theory gives is how you can prove irreversibility for, of certain kinds, of certain kind of systems. Uh, so they take into account not the uh, controversy between the uh, or asymmetry between macroscopic and microscopic things, but they say, okay, maybe there is a constructor, some kind of device or machine that can perform certain tasks with great accuracy over and over again. And if it can indeed be constructed, then the, the process can go in one direction. But if it's not, can go in another direction. So the same constructor cannot go into the opposite direction, then maybe uh, this process is irreversible. So, and they uh, managed to show how this approach can show irreversibility of extraction of work for thermodynamic system and quantum irreversibility uh, of uh, uh, certain processes. 
so th this was like a very uh, basic foundation, and what, here is what I uh, wanted to, to show. The, the important, most important thing in this roller coaster <laughs> of theories uh, that uh, definitely, if we want to make foundation for something that would be applicable to uh, different domains and uh, bridge the gap between the machine intelligence uh, algorithms uh, and, and what humans actually can expect from those algorithms, it should be based on math uh, because it, math is a universal language, universal tools that matches similarities between different, different uh, branches of science and tries to extract those patterns into something useful. And, and there are brilliant developments in, in based on math in category theory, constructor theory, that I guess will be uh, helpful uh, and, and I encourage you to take further look into what, how it can be applied to your domain. And if you have questions, I'd be more than happy to answer during those. Yeah. Uh, I guess, so, it, so it's not the end, I, I, I now pass the word back to Sergey. Uh, Sergey. Yeah, okay, I'm, I will be very quick. Uh, so, so first of all, I just want to summarize a little bit uh, what we are trying to say with Andre. We're trying to say that we believe that machines cannot, uh, uh, can play not just the role of calculators, of sophisticated calculators, but they can uh, come up with new explanatory theories. I would not be surprised if uh, unified um, field theory, which is a holy grail of physics for the past 100 years, uh, unifying gravity and quantum mechanics will be uh, either uh, made with the help of machine intelligence or will be made by machine intelligence. Uh, second, I want to switch gears and very quickly go through our change, which uh, might be not unnoticed. Uh, we have renamed this particular institution to Constructor University. We have renamed our overall effort to Constructor Group. And um, I want to point out that this is not directly related to Constructor Theory. Constructor uh, word usage is very broad. Of course, uh, most famous is Universal Constructor by von Neumann, self-replicating machine, extension of um, what um, is Turing machine which is a computer which can emulate any digital computation, universal Turing machine, any physical computation, uh, but cannot replicate itself. There is constructivism in, math in philosophy. There is, of course, constructor theory, which is a, a concept, um, very interesting concept. It's just a concept, but it's interesting, and I, uh, it's very easy to understand, and it allows to understand some things, such as quantum mechanics, easier. There is construction in programming, constructivism in education. There is more example where you can think about con constructors in chemistry. Catalyst is effectively a constructor, uh, something which uh, is causing transformations. The ultimate constructor is DNA. You can uh, reconstruct, uh, you know, Andrei Ustujanin, despite the complexity of his speech uh, with uh, uh, the usage of his DNA. Uh, he is, uh, you know, simplified to a DNA, but his speech will not be contained in it. There is constructors which construct most sophisticated uh, uh, things which humans have done to date uh, in terms of machines, which is airspace programs. We are not yet on Mars as humans, but uh, will soon be, as it's promised by SpaceX, for example. There is constructors in Formula One. It's good to be constructive. Uh, for example, we approached the problem with Zoom constructively, and we were able to speak a little bit later today. Uh, there is many constructivism, constructor words applied to education, business, psychology. It's applied to social science. And in fact, the ultimate criticism which we received when we chose this brand, uh, construction worker, is not a bad word. It's not a curse. Um, when you build a university or you build a scientific institution, you do need to uh, make uh, and construct buildings, which is uh, one of the main assets of the universities and, and um, research centers, and you need to build large machinery. And perhaps the first um, example of human society is uh, large constructions like pyramids of Egypt Egyptians. Uh, you know, one of the things we want to do in Constructor University, 
and constructor group is to make new constructors, people who are ready to design, engineer, research, develop future. And there is uh, these examples of famous constructors making a huge change uh, to our world or making a huge brands to themselves. Leonardo da Vinci called themselves called himself a constructor. The space programs, the helicopters, which all of us use, uh, the most famous constructor uh, in Red Bull, a person who repetitively uh, were able to win in three different teams, Williams, McLaren, and Red Bull, very different conditions. Uh, and, you know, of course, uh, there is many constructors in science. Uh, so um, uh, it's not working. So, um, you know, one of them is the ultimate uh, construction of uh, uh, living organisms, uh, basically evolution of selfish genes, which ended up bringing humans alive and then there are the scientists, uh, Seymour Papert, constructivism and theory of learning, Jack Welch, effectively creating a repeatable process of building businesses, um, you know, constructive approach to chemistry. Uh, first, uh, way before quantum mechanics and nuclear physics by uh, Dmitry Mendeleev and Mendeleev table, uh, which is sort of a, a knowledge to construct uh, your ideas about the ke chemistry uh, constructivism in social sciences. Apparently, you can think about humans as uh, automatas and you can predict their behaviors using kibernetics. And, and uh, of course, uh, there is much uh, of the same in psychology. Um, you can um, think about psychology, not just sociology in constructive way. And so we, we basically, decided in that respect to change our brand and you know it's not directly related to the concept of our speech but it's related to what we're planning to do first of all we had to change it, it and it had to be a single name constructor group constructor university uh, any university can be called by a person we don't have that person yet at least uh, none of us uh, is dead yet and even when that not necessarily a good place to be called by a human human it's sort of like a calling yourself by a, a certain dna sequence um, uh, it's not that important part uh, calling yourself by city is also strange we're living in the universe uh, most of institutions today are global and so it's better to use a concept um, you know for constructor there is this dictionary definitions a person or thing that builds a person or company engaged in construction business and person or company which builds things, cars and aircrafts, but effectively a person and thing that builds. And our definition uh, of constructor is an object that can perform a task, transforming the system from state A to state B many times and changes insignificantly in the process. You know, apparently there is very few things which don't change at all in the process but insignificantly is good enough definition it's um, uh, you know it it allows to make another transformation of the same kind constructor could act on very complex systems such as people people groups devices uh, can be made of other constructors and can build other constructors that's our definition Again, there is an intersection between mathematical category theory, which is most one of the most fashionable fields of mathematics today. A lot of young mathematicians study it. It's a most abstract view of mathematics and other fields. And so it can be applied to university. And with that, um, just reminding everybody, we here believe that universe is a computer and that relates to every part of human activity that's for sure relates to chemistry, uh, and physics and mathematics, but it also relates to uh, biology and medicine, and it also relates to social science and psychology and political science. It actually also relates uh, to history, the way we study it, and anthropology. And so it can all be simulated on the computer. And today we have this wonderful 
uh, system, which is called cloud, where whatever we invent as a computer can be immediately connected to the cloud and we can access it. And today on the cloud, we already have um, GPU, uh, CPU, TPU, and probably we have somewhere memristor arrays, photonics, and we have some form of quantum computers. And if we make some more sophisticated computers, we can definitely connect it. And it, all of that is enhanced by many humans who make it better, uh, even though it's supposed to learn itself. In many cases, machine intelligence learn with humans. And uh, you know the improvement of computers is the future of improvement of humanity. It's as much important to improve computers, improve computational methods, improve machine intelligence, learn more about mathematics and physics as it is to go to Mars and go to stars. And for that, you need advanced materials, hardware, software. Uh, it means that there is a lot of opportunity for new businesses. And up until we figure out what is consciousness, intuition, free will, and creativity, it requires people. We still are much far away from exploring the potential of humanity. And for that, we're building what we're building, which is a, effectively this things, Constructor University focused on computer physics, life sciences, businesses, and social sciences in interdisciplinary way, and always applying uh, computational methods and machine intelligence to all these areas. And, um, uh, uh, Four businesses on the right, Constructor Rollers, which is machine intelligence platform for uh, uh, science and research. Uh, Alimira, uh, which is a uh, computing and application platform for uh, learning and education administration. And, and two investment vehicles, which we use to invest. And with that, uh, we want to invite um, any of the listeners to uh, participate help be sponsor partner invest use our services as education services join us we are constantly looking for people today we have about 750 people notably uh, one year ago we had uh, less than uh, 150 people and three years ago we had no people so we're growing very fast in terms of number of employees but we will probably grow more than 10x in the less than 10 years in terms of number of people we are also looking for students. There is a lot of things to do in science. You can do a lot of things in computing. Computing is a fundamental science and, and it's very early. There is much more to do, how to emulate the universe in computers using advanced computers. You can um, do a lot in physics. Physics is full of unknowns, more unknowns in the last 10 years and in the last 100. Uh, you can also, if you are fast enough, get a Fields Medal. You know, you can only get it if you are less than 40 years old. So you should rush and join us early. You know, in a private university, will be welcome young students. You will have more chances getting it if you are 16. Bring us your startup. Uh, we are very happy to help and help you to get to a 1 million, 10 million, 100 million in revenue, 1 million, 10 million, 100 million, billion in funding. And, and of course, um, uh, we invite you to use Rollers and Alimira. These are real products. We use them in Constructor University, but we definitely build them mostly 99.9% uh, .9 for external scientists, educators, and administrators. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Serge Bell. Um, please stay with us for, uh, for a second because we are very happy to announce we have just um, received some exciting news since we opened the conference. 1,000 guests from all over the world, they joined us via Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. That is absolutely amazing. So are we still on with, uh, with Serge Bell? Can you still hear us? Yes, yes, I'm Yeah, okay, perfect, here. perfect. And this audience is hungry for knowledge and many questions arrived and we have the capacity to um, ask one of those questions. So, Serge, this one is for you. Um, can you tell a bit more about your vision on knowledge and cross-disciplinary approach? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, one thing which 
indirectly alluded, um, could be alluded from um, the speech of Andre, is that we believe that this division to disciplines in science is very artificial. Um, so there, there is this borderline between, um, you know, politics and history and psychology and biology and medicine and chemistry and physics and mathematics and computer science is uh, very, um, uh, very artificial. All of these are related and all of these are um, explored in a similar fashion. And so, uh, you know, I'm not sure what to answer in terms of vision, but for sure the future is interdisciplinary and for sure we are at the very beginning of understanding and being able to construct uh, the, uh, you know, universe. Um, and, and that is, interestingly enough, not just universe for humans, but universe for living species, and not just universe for human and living species, but the overall universe. You know, there is no reason to believe that the reach of knowledge is uh, any less than the reach of uh, life, and that is any less than the reach of matter. And so the reach of knowledge, uh, you know, potentially is much uh, more broad. But again, I, I'm not sure how to answer this question. The vision is never give up, keep on it, keep researching, keep talking, keep exploring different ideas and, and stay open for uh, more. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Serge Bauer, do we have the capacity for more questions? Just, no, oh, unfortunately, no, because I see a raising hand, but maybe we can answer your question after the conference. Maybe that might be possible, because we are jumping back to our previous topic um, and to our chair lady, Claudia Briggs, and two further speakers, the errors of digital vaccines. Please welcome back, Claudia Briggs. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, everybody. And um, I think you're all longing for coffee, but you have to hang on because we have exciting speeches here. And we uh, actually welcome on stage now Vasily Kasai. Um, I hope it pronounces uh, uh, almost correct. And uh, he actually got a PhD in uh, neurology. So also biologist, but now he is at ChemDiff. And ChemDiff is a company that actually is a drug, devel a drug discovery a uh, project developing company, if I may say so, uh, rather, rather global. And we're looking forward to your presentation, which will be on the development of vaccines to treat cancer. Asil, and here's your pointer. Absolutely. Thank you for the introduction. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, thank you. So, uh, I represent a company called ChemDiv, which is a recent addition to uh, uh, university ecosystem. So we are opening a lab here, which will focus on chemical synthesis, on uh, brewing uh, state-of-the-art uh, kinase inhibitors, uh, ion channels modulators, uh, um, various compounds uh, which potentially will treat life-threatening uh, diseases. Uh, so we are currently um, preparing the lab and we plan to open it in Q1 and I hope we'll um, gain a lot from uh, the university and we are ready to uh, share our knowledge expertise uh, with the uni university as well. Um, so today I'm going uh, to present uh, a project we've been involved to. Uh, it's a development of the vaccine uh, which can potentially treat cancer. Uh, so we spoke about vaccines today and previous speakers, they covered uh, a lot, uh, but uh, this slide is just to remind you that the vaccine is a substance improving immunity to a particular disease and uh, uh, um, it usually contains a disease related uh, uh, antigen. Uh, so uh, by definition, uh, usually vaccines are used to uh, prevent uh, the, uh, the medical condition, the disease, so it's a prophylactic use. However, uh, in, uh, uh, some uh, in some cases, especially in cancer vaccines, they can be used after the disease is uh, diagnosed. So, uh, currently seven types of vaccines uh, are described. And uh, I'm not going to stop on uh, every type of the vaccine, but the whole idea of all these different types of the vaccine is to 
introduce an, uh, a disease-related antigen to uh, an organism and to uh, cause an immune response. Uh, so, sp speaking of anti-cancer vaccines, there are several uh, approved for the use. Uh, they can be divided into small, into two groups. Uh, uh, one group is uh, uh, basically uh, cancer prevention, prevention through uh, prevention of the um, infections which can cause cancer, namely uh, uh, human papilloma virus, which can uh, ultimately cause cervical and penile cancer, as well as uh, hepatitis B virus, which is uh, being untreated, can lead to uh, liver cancer. Uh, and um, also two um, uh, uh, cancer treatment vaccines um, are approved. This is uh, C plus cell, or called uh, Provinch. It's a personalized vaccine which is uh, prepared from uh, the tumor of uh, every specific uh, uh, patient and injected to him after, uh, after um, uh, some modifications. And uh, the other vaccine is BCG. Uh, it's a, a very well-known old vaccine which was always used to um, prevent tuberculosis, but over the last 30 years, it is also used in uh, treating bladder cancer. Um, so this is a very interesting approach, and I would say PCG was the first anti-cancer vaccine approved. So it works uh, um, through non-specific innate immune stimulation. And um, having BCG in mind, we started uh, developing our vaccine. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, we started developing our own vaccine. Uh, we called it Mobilan. Uh, we chose this name because uh, our uh, we plan that our vaccine will mobilize immune cells and it will attract the cells to the uh, point of the administration. So we. Um, designed an uh, adenovirus type 5. Uh, it's a very well-known platform uh, for the vaccines. Uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine and uh, uh, Russian Sputnik vaccines were designed also with the use of uh, adenovirus uh, type 5. So we uh, constructed an adenovirus which uh, carried a human toll-like receptor 5 and it's specifically again uh, a small protein uh, 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 part of, of the bacterial flagellin, uh, a part of the uh, a small uh, small flagella of uh, Salmonella. Salmonella uses for um, locomotion. Um, so we design uh, well, by design uh, we uh, um, constructed the, uh, the our virus so it should be used uh, directly into the tumor. Uh, so uh, it kind of limited the uh, potential application of the vaccine to uh, solid accessible tumors. Uh, uh, in most cases, uh, prostate and bladder cancer are uh, very good examples of such tumors. So the mechanism of our vaccine is basically a, a and stimulation of inflammation. So it works through NFKPB. Um, an FKPB mechanism, uh, which leads to uh, synthesis and secretion of various cytokines, including uh, GCSF, uh, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and others. Uh, so uh, uh, our idea was that uh, after such inflammation, immune cells will migrate in the tumor and uh, they will recognize tumor antigens, and then they will seek for these tumor antigens throughout the body, seeking for metastasis. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so we, uh, we constructed the virus, we manufactured it with the help of the company uh, Alonza, uh, based in, uh, in the United States, and uh, we uh, performed full-scale preclinical uh, trials which involved numerous experiments both in vitro and in vivo and in, uh, in the key experiments we confirmed that uh, uh, our uh, virus is uh, 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 gets into the cells and uh, human toll-like receptor is expressed and the ligand is expressed and the whole system is working and we've seen uh, the uh, uh, in uh, mice, we've seen the production of, uh, of cytokines as well. Um, 
So one of the experiments is presented here. So what we did basically is uh, we uh, injected the three uh, different groups of mice with uh, a syngenic prostate cancer tumor. And uh, we waited a bit until the tumor grows under the skin and starts metastasing. And then we injected uh, our vaccine into these tumors and uh, uh, removed the, uh, after seven days, we removed the tumor surgically. And then we just waited uh, 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 and observed the mice, and we found that uh, um, administration of our vaccine into the tumor, um, it uh, um, uh, increases the tumor-free mice in the course of uh, uh, four or five months. So this was uh, one of the uh, cornerstone experiments for us, which uh, allowed us to go into clinics. And of course, we did a full-scale uh, toxicology uh, studies involving several species of animals, several uh, modes of experiments. Uh, and uh, altogether, uh, the data we collected in the preclinical stage allowed us to go to the clinical stage. Um, oops, sorry. So we did. We did two uh, clinical trials in, uh, um, in patients with a localized uh, prostate cancer. Uh, so why do we choose this cancer population? Uh, uh, because uh, after injection of our vaccine into the prostate globe, we, we ha uh, could have an access to the surgical material after prostatectomy. So we could study uh, histological slides and see uh, what uh, um, uh, what effects our vaccine causes on the, on the, on the tissue level. Uh, so as a, as a key in points, of course, we used uh, safety and tolerability as well as uh, certain biomarkers and uh, pharmacokinetics. Um, so uh, speaking of, uh, our drug was very safe in, uh, um, quite safe in uh, the patients. So um, we collected um, uh, many many adverse events, but uh, luckily for us, uh, uh, most of the adverse events were related to the mechanism of action. So basically, both um, C-reactive protein increase and CPK increase uh, um, uh, is, uh, are the markers of inflammation. Uh, so in terms of safety, we had some uh, uh, evidence that uh, our drug causes inflammation, which is good. Um, we also did some, uh, some histology because we had access to the surgical material. And we studied, uh, namely, the amount of uh, immune cells in the tumor and localization of or aggressiveness of, of uh, immune cells throughout the tumor. So basically, uh, um, the amount and the localization. So uh, uh, our drug influenced both the amount of immune cells in the tumor and the localization. And, um, uh, taken that we had several dose cohorts in our studies, we even see some dose response, which is always a marvel for uh, clinical pharmacologists because dose response is very important uh, characteristics of any drugs, of any drug. And uh, uh, we also collected uh, uh, some biomarkers, uh, uh, namely cytokines uh, I mentioned uh, previously, GCSF, interleukin 6 and 8. And um, we've seen the, uh, the response in these cytokines as well. Uh, and the important uh, part is that the response was delayed by 12 to 24 hours, which means that uh, um, there was no direct answer of the organism to, to administration of a huge amount of virus, but rather there was some lag time needed uh, for the virus to get into the cells, to express uh, the receptor and the ligand, to start signaling. And uh, this uh, lag period uh, points to the fact that uh, a mechanism of action of our vaccine is uh, uh, um, works in, in, in patient. Um, so we had to stop the program on that uh, side due to the commercial reasons. The company which supported the, uh, uh, the project was acquired by another company and they reshuffled the pipeline. Uh, so uh, the most important study the, uh, with endpoints like tumor-free survival uh, is still uh, missing. Uh, but I hope in, uh, in the close future they will get back to this uh, uh, project and we'll see if the vaccine actually saves lives. Um, well, I think that's all for today and I managed to squeeze it into 
15 minutes. Thank you very much, Vasily. That is really exciting data, and I think we wish you all the best of luck for the mm -hmm. continuation because I think people are waiting for this to happen and mm -hmm. to see this actually uh, being realized. Is there any urgent question in the audience uh, from online? If this is not, oh, I see one urgent question. Teresa, please stand up, speak up. Teresa Röfer studies uh, biochemistry and cell biology at Jacobs University. Yes, thank you, Professor Briggs. Um, as far as I know, cancer is quite good at developing like resistance to, for example, immunotherapy and other um, like treatments. How is that uh, the case for your vaccine? Like, is there anything special about it that kind of like fights that, or um, like basically how is the cancer resistance development in terms of your? Oh yeah, that's uh, that's true, and it's uh, uh, kind of uh, it's always. Uh, 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 a, a micro evolution in the, in the test tube because you you develop something against cancer and cancer develops something against whatever you are developing. Uh, I would say uh, with the uh, immune treatments it's much easier because the response rates are, are usually higher compared to small molecules because with a small molecule you need just a single mutation or several mutations and and the cancer can dodge your kinase inhibitor or whatsoever. With the immune system, it's a bit more complicated for the cancer, but uh, um, still, uh, I believe uh, uh, it's very unlikely to develop, uh, to develop something which immediately clears out all cancer cells. So uh, for this particular project, we didn't, um, we didn't have a chance to start a clinical trial to see the real response rate uh, um, uh, in the patients and to see uh, um, to study what mechanisms cancer cells uh, develop to avoid uh, um, uh, to avoid our approach. Uh, so uh, honestly, I do do not have uh, an answer to your question. But uh, I, I do hope that um, uh, such approach uh, uh, is uh, could be much more uh, favorable compared to chemotherapies because, well, I mentioned BCG is a first line in, uh, in the bladder cancer and the response rate in BCG treatment of the bladder cancer is about 80%, which is very, very high compared to almost uh, various any, any cancer treatment. So I do hope that uh, non-specific immune stimulation is a, could be a good way to go uh, when you're approaching uh, an agent to treat cancer. So once again, thank you very much, Vasily. Thank you. thank you, and good luck for the continuation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Really looking forward to the uh, further prospects. So now it is my great pleasure to announce our second keynote speaker for this morning session. Please come on stage already. This is Professor Arben Makwachi, and I'm, again, not sure whether I'm pronouncing his name correct. Yeah, it's okay. Um, and he studied, actually, iron, a, a, a PhD, got a PhD in iron selective electrodes at the University of Tirana. So meaning you're Albanian. Yes. Good. But now... And Spanish. Then, and, and Spanish. <laughs> now, now he yeah. comes to us uh, from, from uh, Catalonia, so basically from Barcelona. And uh, I, I don't dare to really pronounce all the names, but I think it's the Catalan Research Institute of Advanced Studies. You got interested in nanosensors and lab on chip technologies. Yeah. You have published many, many hundreds of papers. So wonderful work. And uh, the title is interesting. So watch it. So uh, Arben will talk to us about sustainable and democratized democratized. So bringing in the social sciences here, yeah. nanotech based diagnostic devices. Arben. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here in this very interesting conference and uh, with uh, a very interesting talks I have heard so far. Uh, so, it's not moving, sorry, still. My... It's still the previous... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to speak about diagnostics, and and when I say diagnostic, I mean not only health-related diagnostics, but also uh, environmental monitoring. Uh, sorry, this is reverse. Uh, so very briefly about my center. Uh, so I work at Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. This is a joint research center in Barcelona. 
uh, with a, in a very nice area. So we have here a synchrotron in our center. We have several researches uh, related to materials, advanced materials. Uh, uh, this is our center, so ICN2. Uh, so it's a center working in the field of nanotechnology. As you know, this is a very broad area of research with a lot of uh, innovation, but also training of the new next generation of researchers uh, with the idea to go from basic science or from manipulation of atomic and molecular, at, uh, atomic and molecular scale to characterization of nanostructures, uh, fundamental uh, physics of phenomena, exploitation of functionalities of nanomaterials to device uh, uh, design that and fabrication for different areas being health related to application very important but also we work a lot in quantums uh, electronics and electronics uh, uh, and more so what we are doing in our group, we are trying to uh, get advantages of nanomaterials and see how we can explore the properties of nanomaterials to bring new uh, devices, uh, nanosensors uh, with interest for diagnostics, taking advantages of properties, uh, interesting properties, electrical, optical properties. We have been working with... Uh, uh, quantum dots, uh, nanochannels, uh, graphene, uh, 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 and, and other materials uh, for different applications, as I said, that go from health uh, to environmental monitoring, but also safety and security. In addition, we have interest in technology transfer, and from the technologies we have been developing, uh, we have two spin-off companies, uh, paper drop for diagnostics using the paper sensors and graphenica lab uh, for patterning of graphene for electronic uh, devices. Uh, so, uh, as I said, we have a lot of interest in our materials, uh, but we are working with simple materials like paper, uh, like, for example, lateral flow devices, uh, uh, using different printing technologies, uh, uh, and also we have a lot of interest in uh, uh, fully integrated devices uh, using even smartphone, wearables, uh, wireless readout, etc. Uh, so this is what we are doing more or less in our group. Uh, uh, just entering in the, in, the, in the topic about the health and point of care devices uh, uh, to remind those who are not familiar with these. So biosensors uh, uh, are very interesting, very simple devices. This is an example of glucose biosensor. But imagine if you change the receptor, if you change the transducing scheme, you can have different kind of uh, devices for different kind of applications. So what we are doing is uh, trying to integrate nanomaterials in these devices and working together these nanomaterials with different kinds of receptors uh, like DNA, uh, protein, uh, uh, glucose, etc. So biosensors nowadays are everywhere. Uh, so not only as medical devices, but you can see nanobiosensors as wearables in environmental monitoring, uh, food safety and security, uh, plant controls, uh, but also in the smart cities. So smart cities in the future are going to integrate nanosensors because you cannot do any kind of... Uh, uh, take any decision, but also do any kind of therapies or, for example, uh, use the vaccines without a previous diagnostic. So this is very, very important. And nowadays, uh, everyone has a smartphone. Why not uh, to connect the, the biosensors with a smartphone? And this is why we have been working in this area. So we have, you can see here different examples. Uh, I just want to mention this one. This guy is measuring with a Google Glass. Uh, so he's measuring this lateral flow, which is simple. Is like, for example, a, a, a COVID test. Uh, and of course, he's getting the images and transmitting these to the end user. So it's really very simple. So this is a very interesting area, so just to see this U.S. Uh, biosensor market with a lot of interest. Uh, but to have these biosensors uh, useful as point of care, we want this, we call this reassured. So this should be real-time connectivity, easy of specimen collection, affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, rapid and robust, equipment-free, and delivered. Otherwise, you cannot use these devices. Uh, so this is why we are very much interested in simple platforms, sustainable platforms, we work with uh, nitrocellulose. You know, uh, this is a very interesting material, low cost, easy to manufacture, recyclable, microfluidic properties are there. So you have a kind of zero energy device just by capillary forces, the liquid can run. I'll show you some examples. Uh, uh, so putting together nanomaterials and also uh, the proper readers, we can have very simple uh, devices that are really cost efficient. So uh, there are different challenges in this area, but just to mention again that uh, 
having cost-efficient devices for such kind of application is quite important. Just think about the COVID situation. So we couldn't afford uh, this situation without these simple less than one euro devices that are everywhere uh, the, delivered. So we cannot go with sophisticated devices to, to do this kind of applications. So uh, this is why we are trying to put together our knowledge always with the policy to have these simple devices, simple materials, cost-efficient materials that can solve problems in emergency situation, but also in different other areas, uh, uh, as I said before. Uh, so, and this is why we wrote this uh, important review in ACS Nano about what happened during the COVID, why we are not able to, 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 to show, to have these devices ready. Because the problem is that, uh, as other colleagues explained, this gap between the science and, 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 and business or the, 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 the products. And this is what we are trying to explain here, that uh, uh, to, go, to, to, to go from the, 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 business, from the TRL, so technology readiness levels, uh, very low to the high one, highest one, uh, for, uh, for, for the devices to be ready, you need to go through several validation steps and working together science and, and business is very, very important. Otherwise, uh, your technology is going to stay in the lab uh, and we are not going to offer something that really is going to solve problems. So uh, uh, what about uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, distributing the devices, as in the case of vaccine, instead of distributing the devices, why not to distribute the fabrication technology? So, and we have seen that how fast the, the virus was spread, uh, and we need to, to, to distribute these devices that take a lot of time, and probably they are not able to, to do the proper work because the virus has changed, you need to change the receptor, you need to change the, the, the device. So instead of distributing the, the devices, to distribute the, 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 the fabrication tools. But you, it means that uh, we, we should go from centralized production of nanobiosensors to ubiquitous fabrication of nanobiosensors using very simple technologies like fast, uh, stamping or uh, printing using office printers, for example. So this is what we are trying to do, and I'll show you very briefly some examples from optical to electrical sensors. So these are very interesting technologies. I'm not going to enter in details, uh, just to show a couple of these. For example, lateral flow device. This is a device that you have been using and you are still use, we are still using for COVID. And we show here in this uh, nature protocol how people can uh, design these devices, how can uh, design all the components of this device, uh, even how you can use the proper readers uh, uh, and different kinds of nanomaterials uh, to build your own uh, lateral flow for, for uh, cases like, for example, pandemics. Uh, and also recently wrote these chemical reviews showing that what is next? So what we should do with this technology uh, to, to, to address better the challenges, like, for example, having better sensitivity, because we still need to go to PCR instead of using this uh, uh, simple test. Uh, but how, what we can put uh, further to achieve, for example, multi-parametric uh, ca uh, capability, because uh, even the COVID is very complex, so you don't know when you get infected, and during this uh, time you are ill, you are, you are, you are, the person is ill, you have different uh, uh, parameters going up and down, so you need to do a, a multi-detection. Uh, so uh, this is what uh, this lateral flow is offering. Uh, I'm not going to skip this because just showing what is the operation principle using gold nanoparticles is like an analysis system where everything is occurring in a piece of paper. So it's really very fast and you get the response in a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, we applied this, for example, to detect bacteria. And here is an example. We call it a, a digital light response where uh, bacteria are detected through some connection, interaction with some quantum dots modified with antibodies. And we are able, through the change of the color, uh, to detect very fast uh, the bacteria. Here are shown some more uh, details. I'm not going, there is also a video showing the process of uh, uh, fabrication to show you how simple it is because uh, I cannot uh, play this. Uh, sorry. No, it's not working. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, 
So uh, this is a very simple process. So we put everything, all the components in a piece of paper, and we are able to show this uh, in a very fast mode. The video was explaining this better than I do. Uh, so, but now we are moving toward uh, better uh, devices, so trying to combine uh, lateral flow electrophoresis, so putting more electronics inside in this piece of paper and trying to get uh, better response, better separation. Also here there is a video showing how simple it is even to work with uh, full blood samples, so you separate uh, the analyte you want to detect for the mat from the matrix and to get a better response. Uh, uh, so this is working. So it's showing how the, the blood sample is separating, moving, and how we are able to detect this even in a very complex sample, regenerating these uh, nice uh, lines that correspond to gold nanoparticles, uh, uh, showing the, the whatever concentration of the biomarker we want to detect. Uh, and also we are trying to integrate the things, offering even very simple devices. You know, for example, the LISA system. We are now building our own LISA that is connected to the smartphone. So everything is there. So putting, again, some electronics, uh, different controllers uh, for different physical parameters, uh, offering this uh, simple device uh, uh, for different applications from COVID uh, to some bioluminescent me measurement and even some measurements with interest for antibiotic resistance. So here there was also a video showing that uh, the system was operating through a smartphone, so everything was occurring in an automatic mode and we are able to offer this device uh, for very simple applications uh, uh, that uh, correspond to a license that is really very, very broad. Uh, and this is uh, now we have these spin-off companies working in paper-based sensors, so paper drop, uh, uh, trying to develop uh, its uh, different adaptive platforms uh, with pr proprietary technologies, but also image support and connectivity. Uh, finally, just a few examples with electrical sensors that are really very, very interesting. So we are working on different kinds of uh, electrical sensors, we are, which are very simple, very compatible with simple platforms, with paper, for example, this is the first example we reported on uh, cancer diagnostics. This is very, very uh, complex scenario, but uh, there are two very, very important, the detection of fixed cancer cells or circulating tumor cells. So we simulated these uh, uh, fixed cancer cells uh, uh, growing uh, cancer cells on top of some electrodes and using some gold nanoparticles and hydrogen evolution reaction, we are able to quantify uh, these uh, uh, cancer cells on top of this electrode. But this was not sufficient. This is why we moved toward the CTC's detection. And here you see a cancer cell, see the, the brown uh, uh, color with these uh, purple uh, particles, magnetic uh, beads that are capturing through some antibodies. And also the golden particles, again, are used as the labels uh, in a way that uh, we collect these with a magnetoelectrode and we're able to detect the CTCs in, uh, of course, these uh, cancer cells that escape the bloodstream. But still, the, the, the detection limit was not uh, sufficient because we need to detect up to one cancer cell per five milliliter of sample uh, blood, for example. And this is really very challenging. So uh, this is why we are moving toward more sensitive methods. For example, this is how we detect uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein using some aptamers uh, due, due to some conformation, conformational changes and using some electroactive indicator, we are able to detect very fast uh, uh, this uh, 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 protein uh, in different kinds of samples. Uh, and we moved uh, recently also to uh, the use of DNA technology. This is, we call this a programmable electrochemical epsilon-shaped DNA, where designing the proper structure of DNA, we are able to detect in a very fast mode and a reversible mode, uh, again here, some antibodies with interest for different uh, diagnostics. Uh, so this is, uh, in, 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 uh, to generalize this uh, uh, concept, so uh, using these uh, uh, printers, office printers, for example, uh, we start with just drawing the, the biosensor in the computer, load the, the inks, uh, the cartridges with the different nanoparticle-based inks, uh, printing the nanobiosensors, modifying it with uptimers, and then get the result in the smartphone. So we call this a plug print and play inkjet printing, which is really very fast and can be done even in this room. So you don't need to, to, to wait for your biosensors to come from other parts of the world. Uh, so this is another example where we build a, a wearable device. Uh, this is for copper detection. You know it's probably that copper is one um, an important uh, uh, material, uh, uh, an important analyte, for example, with interest for some diagnostic, like for example, 
uh, cystic uh, fibrosis. Uh, and here are some details about these wearables that we built in very fast mode, uh, showing the, the response of the system even for uh, the detection of uh, not only uh, copper, but also some uh, other parameters, in, in including conductivity, etc. So this is all I wanted to show. We have this uh, spin-off company also uh, working on graphene, technology is uh, on our side uh, to capture what is by sampling around our imagination. Very so it we is can not sample any kind of by sensor directly to any kind not of interface and have this able to work with different kinds of applications. To achieve intelligent, so versatile, cost-efficient and robust uh, solutions. We can print on any kind Why of surface. print our future? Uh, this is the case of graphene, so stamping graphene this way, to different kinds of surfaces for different kinds, of, uh, uh, day day of, different kinds of applications. So I'm skipping this uh, movie, uh, but you can find also this in the internet. Uh, so if you want to learn more about these technologies, the concept we have about these simple devices, uh, cost-efficient devices that are really are going to democratize uh, our diagnostic system. Uh, so you can read more reviews we wrote recently for different topics. Uh, uh, including how to reach uh, uh, very low detection limits, uh, how to use innovative materials uh, uh, for this kind of devices with interest for different areas, including uh, cancer diagnostics uh, and more. Uh, so this is all. I wish that with this I gave you a flavor about uh, our technologies and the importance for different kinds of applications. Uh, moreover, uh, simple devices, cost-efficient devices uh, to solve uh, problems. Uh, uh, so I'd like to thank our partners, our sponsors, and overall uh, my uh, group uh, who is working hard uh, from different parts of the world. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to give a response. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Armin. I don't, I, don't I don't think that, yeah, now you hear me. Thank you so much. So future is here, and you have made a tremendous uh, a range of different devices that's fantastic okay. so I had one question namely if you now think about diagnosing cancer let's say we just distribute uh, the paper strips here in the room and then somebody finds out oops i have cancer of course you still need to uh, have like a connection to a clinical doctor you still need the connection to the hospital can yeah. you share a little bit of your insights there how you do this in spain in particular or yeah. like globally as i mentioned uh, cancer is very very complex and uh, there are a lot of issues still, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, for, as far as I know, nobody is able to detect with these simple devices uh, uh, cancer, for example, uh, let's say one uh, cell in five milliliters of blood. But uh, if uh, uh, there is an interest, for example, uh, to monitor uh, some parameters during a cancer therapy or for some uses in the laboratory, for example, we are working for drug developments where you need to do a lot of tests uh, and we are using these simple devices. So it's very important when you want a, a, a biosensor to clearly understand the, the, the context, the uh, clinical scenario, because uh, we, you cannot have, we cannot have a, a biosensor that does miracles, so uh, can, can solve any, any kind of problem. So uh, the biosensor should be designed according to the specific need. So this is very, very important. So it's not that easy. Thank you very much. Yeah. Really inspiring. Um, any question here from the audience? I see a hand, but I can hardly see who it is. Um, please, can somebody bring a microphone up there? Oh, it's Patrice. Patrice is actually working in physics with Raman spectroscopy. Sorry. Just shout, Patrice. Yeah. It's also about the COVID virus, right? Where you try to improve the detection. What did you do differently to improve the efficacy or, how do you say, the quality of the test? Yeah. 
yeah, uh, uh, the COVID test we have been using so far, uh, so is usually based on uh, simply gold nanoparticles modified with antibodies. And uh, uh, it is a, a test that is uh, uh, somehow efficient because you can uh, very fast uh, screen. Uh, but uh, if you want to reach uh, detection limits that are uh, similar with PCR test uh, that is more expensive and you need more time, this is what we are trying to do now, trying to, to apply some new materials, nanomaterials, uh, and even uh, going from optical to electrical-based lateral flow so as to reach lower detection limits and to achieve uh, uh, multi-detection, which is really very, very important. So this is where we are still working on this and we wish that uh, uh, we may offer in the future uh, more efficient devices uh, like uh, the COVID test we are working so far, but uh, with uh, better sensitivity, lower detection limit, and multi-parametric capability. So this is what we are doing. And I wish that uh, with the nanomaterials, nanotechnologies, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we are trying to work with, uh, we can reach uh, these, uh, these challenges, these goals. It's very, very, very important. Thank you once more. That was really, really lovely and inspiring. Thank, Thank you, you Professor Mikocci. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, very you. Much. and good luck. So um, now, uh, last but not least, Dr. John Painter. He comes from QDTI, and I was so much looking forward to announce your CV. And we have these 30 seconds, because he got, I need to bring my glasses on, he got a Bachelor in Economics from Duke University. And then five years later, only five years later, he got a PhD in immunology from the University of Chicago. Explain that. Um, so it's, I think it's almost impossible. But then uh, he also now, because that was obviously not enough, he also now finished with an MBA at the University of Chicago. Great. So all in all, he, he is uh, the CEO of this absolutely fascinating company. And uh, the title of your talk will be Biomedical Diagnostics Applications with quantum technologies. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry. Ah, <laughs> thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, this morning, uh, or I guess this afternoon, I'll be sharing um, our efforts to commercialize the quantum sensor technology towards a novel uh, biomolecule detection platform uh, for uh, biomolecules and diagnostics. Um, I need... Uh, got it. Um, <clears throat> uh, very quickly, um, the uh, quantum sensor is an atomic scale uh, defect located in the, embedded in the diamond lattice structure. What our scientific co-founders realized is that those quantum sensors are uh, very sensitive to uh, perturbations or disturbances in their microenvironment. A wide array of stimulus, for example, magnetic fields, electrical current, pressure, temperature. As we considered how best to commercialize that technology, uh, what application would uh, benefit from that capability, we looked at three uh, benefits provided by the quantum sensor. First, the ability for those quantum sensors to provide uh, measure very small magnetic fields generated by small molecules. Second, since we're working in the quantum regime, we wouldn't need a lot of material to actually make those measurements. And then finally, since these diamonds can actually be grown by a CVD process, with the quantum sensors uh, generated at will, we uh, felt that we could actually make a massively parallel detection platform, which allows us to measure a lot of different events very rapidly. We ultimately concluded that we could apply this sensor technology to uh, developing a novel um, uh, uh, platform for biomolecular detection and diagnostics, which could address two critical challenges, which I think are still prevalent in the diagnostics industry today. First, um, is that the uh, diagnostics uh, generally require a pretty uh, labor-intensive sample processing capability to be able to actually um, uh, measure the targets that they're interested in measuring. They have limited sensitivity, they take a long time, they have many steps, they can be costly. We thought the quantum sensor would be able to address that by making a very simple approach uh, to uh, diagnostics via magnetic-based detection. Secondly, the quantum sensors are able to actually measure magnetic fields generated by small molecules we could actually envision doing nanoscale NMR. Currently, diagnostics require tags to be able to target and bind to the, to the molecule of interest that you're trying to measure. For today, we'll focus <clears throat> on our efforts to develop the uh, simple uh, sample prep uh, capability at QDTI. The nanoscale NMR is still being developed at the Harvard uh, research groups of our scientific co-founders. 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time with diagnostics. There's always been a couple of introductions on that today. I'll highlight three things. It's a very large marketplace uh, for materials, uh, instrumentation, and consumables. There are three general market segments: biomedical research, clinical diagnostics, which is the largest market segment, and point-of-care testing, which is the most rapidly growing segment. COVID has taught us many things. It's very important to be able to detect as early as possible. It's not just COVID that could benefit from this: traumatic uh, brain injury. Uh, cardiovascular events, Alzheimer's for neurodegenerative diseases, um, as well as infectious diseases, all will be able to benefit from earlier detection, and that requires having an ultra-sensitive detection capability, being able to really see low abundance targets, proteins, nucleic acids as soon as possible. Unfortunately, and and the second thing that I think COVID really taught us is that it's important to have these tests in a clinical lab, of course, but now more than ever, being able to have these tests at a point of need, at a home. At a school, at an airport,、um, and 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 it's also really important to have these capabilities in a biomedical research environment as we're developing the tests for the future. Unfortunately, the current technologies、uh, rely on、uh, fluorescent-based detection,、uh, which require a lot of sample processing to remove a lot of the background noise of the excess reagents, the autofluorescence contributed by the sample.、Um, However, at QDTI, we've built a very simple process by which to be able to detect proteins, nucleic acids, and cells. We'll focus primarily on our、uh, protein detection.、Um, it's magnetic-based.、Um, in terms of、um, our market,、uh, I mentioned there's three market segments in terms of our market entry strategy.、Um, we are focusing on the biomedical research environment first. There are two reasons for that. First. Um, we wanted to build an instrument and started to get feedback from users as quickly as possible. We did not want to have to worry about a regulatory review process. Second, the clinical diagnostics folks and point of care folks always look to key opinion leaders in clinical research to validate a new technology. So, what you're going to hear about for today is our efforts to develop a system and data and collaborations within the biomedical research environment. What you see pictured on the upper right-hand side is our、uh, tabletop instrument.、Um, it's、um, About half empty. It's a very simple process. We'll be able to minimize that box by 50% in the next iteration. Each one of our instruments has logged in 10,000, thousands of hours of runtime、uh, per instrument with just a minimal amount of wear and tear. There's one quantum sensor embedded into the instrument. You actually see a picture of a, a measurement being made on the upper right-hand side. There is a well that has a sample that has been labeled with our magnetic tags. The quantum sensor is directly beneath that, and the, me the measure is being made. We also needed to develop a cartridge mechanism to be able to take our samples that have been treated with our tags into the instrument to get measured. It's very similar to the standard uh, detection uh, approach uh, to the、uh, consumables generated by other detection platforms, a 96 volt plate. The difference between ours and theirs is that instead of having a few millimeters of plastic at the bottom, we actually have a very thin membrane. It's important to have the sample that's being interrogated in close proximity to the quantum sensors. It also has to be strong enough to withstand squirting material on it,、uh, as well as、uh, flexible enough to be depressed against the sensor. Again, for the accuracy of measurement. Finally, I would just say that if you look carefully in the lower left-hand quadrant, you see a, a circle. That's our sample that has magnetic tags uh, in, uh, uh, within that sample and, and dried onto the surface, and it's ready to be measured. We've established three、uh, collaborations with key opinion leaders in neurology, immuno-oncology, and infectious disease. I will highlight one of those partnerships in a few minutes. I talk about the advantages、um, uh, and having a simple process versus a complex process. What does that look like? What are the benefits for the RUO for the research market? What you see in the top hand is the number of steps that it takes to perform our assay, from when you receive your sample to when you're actually getting your data. We are at five steps. We'll be down to four versus ten or more for other for other platforms. That re,、uh, results in two key benefits. One is economic. The amount of research time, researcher time, to be able to perform an assay for a 96-volt plate is 30 minutes. Even with the incubation, it's about an hour compared to hours with other high-performance players or traditional ELISA. You use less consumables. You also generate less biohazard waste. The second benefit is the amount of material that's actually required. We routinely use five microliters of material to be able to perform our measurements, versus tens or hundreds in other、uh, other other platforms. That's very important in biomedical research environment where you don't have a lot of sample. And it's going to be increasingly important as we think about point of care. And at the same time, you're not sacrificing on the performance. We're only、uh, only one competitor is actually more sensitive than we are at this point, and we'll be closing in on them、uh, within 12 months. 
Um, I'm just going to highlight here that there's two components to our technology platform in order to make these measurements. One is the imaging platform, which is driven by the quantum sensor. The other is the biology component, which are the tags that have been uh, designed to target, uh, to bind to the target of interest. Um, what, what you see here, basically, on the upper right-hand side is uh, a quantum diamond sensor with all those little sensors embedded about a micron underneath it. It serves as kind of an imaging platform and allows you to make a magnetic map. What you see in the middle there is a representation using a lot of quantum physics to be able to kind of represent where the beads reside in that surface. On the biology side, uh, we basically take um, magnetic beads, which each have different magnetic, magnetic properties associated with them. We code them with tags that bind to the target of interest, in this case, a protein. We incubate our sample with these beads. The beads bind to the protein. We pellet everything to the bottom. We throw out the supernatant. We resuspend an imaging buffer put it in the cartridge, which it's dry, when it, and then it dries, which you saw in a previous slide, and then we put that to be measured into the instrument. And it's able to determine when complexes have been formed, as well as when you just have single A beads or single B beads. It's the ability to differentiate those single beads that allows us to remove a lot of the processing steps. We can actually, um, we can actually remove that excess signal in our imaging process. Once you have your tags, um, you, you, you can actually start generating some data um, and to see if your assay works. The first step is to actually start testing your uh, reagents to a particular target of interest in buffer solution. Um, what you see here are three assays that we've developed at the company. Um, you spike buffer with increasing amounts of uh, standard. And what you should see is an increase uh, of your assay being able to um, measure that increasing amount of standard that's been spiked. With the three assays here represented, we're able to actually measure at under a picogram per ml, which is the ultra-sensitive detection regime. Um, the next step after you've been able to do that is then to move on to working in real sample, plasma, serum, cerebral spinal fluid, and whole blood, uh, which we're in the process of doing right now. I wanted to highlight the IL-6 molecule, which is the inflammation target, uh, caught the eye of a researcher at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, Dr. Michael Manzer. Um, he and his group were very involved in uh, trying to understand why a, sub a subsegment of uh, COVID uh, patients started having severe, uh, severe uh, cytokine, uh, uh, severe inflammation. Um, he was also very involved in trying to figure out a way to therapeutically intervene to block that cytokine release syndrome. In parallel, he had been developing a, or trying to develop a predictive uh, biomarker test to see if he can actually determine which patients would be uh, starting to go down a, down a path where they would be suffering from this syndrome. He had been looking at uh, IL-6 as a predictive marker. He saw the sensitivity that we were able to deliver, and he saw the potential for a much rapid time to result. He currently, he had been doing a retrospective study using his system, a Luminex system, which takes about six to seven hours. But the first step was to show or was to determine whether the QDTI platform, a new technology, could actually compare uh, to the system that he had been using. And what you see in the lower right hand corner, uh, yeah, lower right hand corner, um, is that statistically we're equivalent in terms of predictive value in terms of identifying patients uh, that were going to need, to, uh, need intubation or to be checked into the ICU. In the paper, they were also able to publish that it took about two hours to perform that assay. That's a 96 wall plate. More recently, we've been able to do that same assay at QDTI in under an hour. And as we think about point of care, uh, we'll be able to translate these benefits into a handheld device, which would probably take under 10 minutes to run that assay. Um, lastly, you know, the, the next step in our commercialization journey will be to start working with pharma and biotech partners. Um, you know, we uh, have a few partners here in, the, in Europe that we'll be working with. Um, we think it would be strategically important to be able to support some of those partners by having a testing capability uh, in, in, in the EU. Um, and as you can see, we shipped one of our instruments to uh, Jacobs University, Constructor University, and are excited to get that online uh, and getting the testing up and running here uh, in Bremen. Thank you. John, thank you very, very much. That was really inspiring. And um, I think we have time for one question. No question in the audience here. There is a question again, Patrice. Please get up, get the microphone and speak into the microphone. Patrice, Raman spectroscopy, uh -oh. expert. <laughs> An expert. Keep speaking. Hold the microphone. Just use it, just speak, Patrice.
In the diamond. In, inside the diamond. Yeah, yeah. No, you could act, um, in terms of how the, I, I don't really know Let if me, I follow your question. Okay, you have this individual um, quantum sensors, right? Like yeah. individual, I would say, pixel or whatever. Yeah. So what's the loading? To be able to detect like a one, to one ratio, like a one protein bind to one such ah, uh, nano sensor. But because I have ah, a question gotcha. about the I, microscopic resolution, I saw that you're having a microscope to actually do the imaging, and I was like, okay, was this the, the resolution? And that would also define what your sensitivity is. Like, yeah, like, absolutely, great question. I didn't have time to go through all that. <laughs> but um, basically, there's billions of quantum sensors embedded in the diamond. Yeah. Um, the, the mag whatever you put on the surface that's generating a magnetic field, for example, a bead, which is a micron in size, influences some of those NV centers. It doesn't matter how many NV centers you have. What does matter is that you're just, you, those NV centers are actually measuring the magnetic field, and those that are further away are not perturbed at all. We're able to actually use laser light, which gets absorbed by all the NV centers. And the ones that are close to magnetic field have a different spin state, and so they actually emit a different shade of red the other one, than the other ones do. We have an objective, we're able to kind of actually take a picture and then using imaging processing actually show where those beads reside on the surface. We're not really constrained by resolution for the micron sky beads that we're working oh, with Thank here. you very much. I would like to see that in practice. Yes, I think I would, uh, I would agree very much and it's great that the instrument has meanwhile arrived in Bremen and that yes. we can actually have a handle on it because I remember we talked about it like a year ago already <laughs> with Anatoly and so um, once again, thank you very much for the inspiration. Also, good luck for um, the continuation of this exciting technology. Thank you. Thank you. So this now ends my part here, and I hand over to Natalie. So thank you. it was a pleasure um, sharing this morning session, and I think we are all ready for coffee. Yes. Natalie will This is why I'm us. really going to keep it short. Um, so thank you again, uh, Claudia Briggs and John Pena. Thank you very much. Now it's time for a quick 10-minute coffee break. We would just kindly ask you to be mindful of the time. Please come back on time. Bring your coffee cup. But for now, drink a coffee, get some oxygen, maybe do some uh, networking, and then see you again in 10. Thank you very much.
business building. It is the Leibniz Institute for New Materials and Technical Physics. Employees from Leibniz Institute for New Materials work here. Furthermore, the chair for technical physics. On the occasion of the 2006 football or soccer World Cup, the research groups created a demonstration system that Okay, Boyana.
ladies and gentlemen, we would kindly ask you to get seated because we are starting any minute. So please bring your coffee or your tea, your water, take a seat and enjoy the show. I think we're ready to start. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your coffee break and, yeah, and you're ready to join us for the next session. So I have a question for the audience. Um, do you know the Bee Gees? Is here anyone? <laughs> yeah, okay. By your re reaction, I can tell probably everyone knows the Bee Gees. So... I'm also a huge music fan, and this is why I couldn't oversee the fact that the topic of the next plenary session is inspired by a famous song called How Deep Is Your Love? <laughs> so let's see if the next topic, How Deep Is AI, is equally romantic as the song. First... We're going to welcome the chair of this plenary session from Constructor University, Andreas Birk. Welcome. Please Thank give him a big much. applause. Thank you for being here. And also, let me invite our first keynote speaker, um, the man who plays one of the leading roles in AI research, Wolfgang Walzer. Walzer. Sorry. Thank you for being here, Wolfgang Walster and Andreas Berg. The stage is all yours. I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave you to the audience. So thank you for this nice introduction. Thank you to you all for being here. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Wolfgang Walster, who is a professor of AI and the founding director of the DFKI, the German Research Center uh, on AI which is the largest uh, research organization on artificial intelligence in uh, Europe. I would even call him founding father. Um, it's interesting that when I was a young student uh, in Saarbrücken, actually DFKI <laughs> took off in Saarbrücken, and it's amazing uh, how it has grown and what a great institution it is. He has many honors and uh, memberships, I'm just going to mention two past pro toto. He's a member of the uh, Nobel Prize Academy in Stockholm. He is also a member of the German uh, Science Academy, uh, Leopoldina. And uh, he is doing a lot of different uh, things in uh, terms of AI research. He's, among others, also known as, uh, so to say, the father of Industry 4.0. Um, but he also made lots of contribution to uh, natural language processing. And back to the time when I was a student, you know, the Verbo right. uh, project, which was a huge project on, on uh, natural language translation. So I think it's also a little bit back to the roots when we now hear his uh, talk on large neural language models, super parrots, or deep understanding and we all are very curious uh, to hear the answer. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And actually, I will talk about so-called large neural language models. Serge already has mentioned them. And uh, the question here is, are these super parrots or is this real deep understanding? That's the question we want to uh, look at in this talk. First of all, when we talk about understanding in AI, what do we mean? In most cases, we just look at so-called understanding tests, which you know from school. Uh, whether a system which gets some digital input data, like text, speech, image, video sequences, or sensor values, and gives you the right reaction. Understanding means, for instance, that there is a physical reaction of a robot when you tell him, please give me a beer or whatever. Yeah, and if this is done, you would say, okay, the robot has understood. Communicative reactions like chatbots, digital assistants, if you ask a question, uh, sorry, I want to have an answer, of course, and you test the system in this way. Another good test, you know, from school is summarization. The teacher gives you a task, read the chapter of uh, 
uh, Goethe or whatever, and, and next day you should summarize it. Or if you want to translate, of course, you have to understand. Question answering is the ultimate test. You give text, video, images, and please give me an um, answer to my question. And finally, there are now systems which automatically should generate captions for pictures or videos. So that's our way how we can test whether understanding happens or not. This is not a very deep scientific way. It's just a behavioristic approach, but we will go deeper in this problem in a minute. First of all, I should mention this year is really an anniversary of natural language understanding in AI. Exactly 50 years ago, the first PhD thesis was published at Terovinograd, by Terovinograd. He's now at Stanford, senior professor, and he was the first to construct a system which was fully fledged in understanding. Actually, he connected a simulated robot with a natural language system, and you could ask uh, questions, execute command with the system. You say, for instance, in this very small world, it was a kind of micro world of blocks, pyramids, and the robot arm. And you said, what is in the box? And the system answered, the green pyramid and the blue one. Then you say, pick up the green one. And you see the robot doing this. And again, this was 50 years ago already. Now, what is the reason why, why didn't we succeed with this uh, as a product? Of course, the problem was it was a micro world. Sometimes we said Disney World or Mickey Mouse World because it was a very restricted domains. Uh, there were about 20 objects in the world and there were only a small couple of actions. That's called in computer science terminology, the so-called Closed world, yeah? It's a closed world, and of course, in the closed world, it's very simple or much simpler to um, work than in the open world, which, uh, as Zach pointed out, in the morning, we have a lot of uncertainties. We have only partial knowledge of the world around us and so on. So the task was to go from such closed world domains to open domain. And actually, we have reached this. As I said, 50 years ago, now in 2006, the first systems were emerging which can ha handle open domain. So you can talk about everything with these systems and they are supposed to, to answer. And we will see some uh, good examples of this. Uh, of course, um, we have a lot of progress, not only in the open domain issue, but also we include much more difficult tasks like you know, most of human communication, and also with machines, is not just one human, one computer, but we have multi-party meetings. You know, when you go to have a coffee, you talk not only to one colleague, but there's a group of people, and this is much more complicated, um, because the turn-taking, who is allowed to speak when and where, and how do you get the intention of the others, and so on. The uh, second problem is multimodal. It's simply not true that we communicate just with speech. If you look here on me, I have gestures, I have facial expressions and so on. Um, I also uh, have a special sound pitch when I, this is called the prosody. When I speak, I can change the prosody and this gives, for instance, emotional signals and, and uh, if you want to be sarcastic or do a joke, you use all these uh, capabilities. And of course, this has also to be understood by the machines. And again, we have a lot of progress in this domain. Now, the, uh, what do we have to pay for this? We have to prepare corpora. Because if we do this with a modern technique of machine learning, you cannot do this without data. And many, think, many people think data, you just go around with a microphone or you look at the internet, you have enough text. This is simply not true. In most cases, we need um, a little bit of supervised uh, learning. Not everything has to be tagged, but without annotated, we call it corpora, uh, where we have, for instance, dialogue acts where we know this what the statement of the speaker was uh, just to try to persuade me, or it was a question, it was a command, it was a, uh, let's say, a negation, confirmation, and so on. And this we have to tell the system in order actually to learn how 
to uh, code communicative intent in natural language. So uh, there is some work to do. We have now bootstrapping algorithms where we start uh, with some uh, human text, text and then we uh, can use this to train automatic tagging algorithms and so on. So it's, uh, but still, it's a large effort. And only very big companies or government, for instance, I spent for the Verb Mobile uh, project uh, already, just for speech, more than 10 million euro just to get the copra. And this is nothing. This is just the plain material to start learning. So it's a lot of uh, money which goes into this. Now, let me uh, say uh, something about the success. Here you see uh, some success stories. One success story is that, especially in Germany, you know, we are strong in automotive, and we uh, have uh, worked. How can you have a conversational system in the car, which is not, as you have in your own car today, in most cases, closed world, but you can ask any question, you can refer to your environment, which is changing when you move around. And uh, this is really working now. It's a product which you can buy. It's still in Mercedes S-Class, uh, but it goes down to a little bit um, cheaper models also. And here, when you uh, move around, as hey, you see in the movie, you can ask right? questions and you can do so-called eye-pointing. There is an eye-gaze tracker. So if you look at a building and say, hey, what is this? Is there a parking garage and so on? The system will recognize. And this is already open world, as I said, because not all the buildings are already in the database. You can, can go everywhere. The system will give you some answers. Of course, many of these knowledge items are extracted from Wikipedia or uh, other descriptions, but all automatic. So that's the uh, first uh, very nice example. Uh, but it lasted... ...football or soccer World Cup. The research groups created a demonstration system that allows two human candidates to take part in a football quiz in a virtual studio. The virtual characters take two different roles, those of a moderator and of two football experts who help the candidates by giving so hints. So, six example, Just as an because we have the World Soccer Championship. And the virtual participants can discuss among themselves, ask for help, and answer questions. Kommen wir nun zu den Videos. Film up. You see three artificial characters and two uh, humans. And um, when we did this, this was the first system worldwide which did some turn taking. And you see the gestures, and you will see even emotions. For each character, dynamic goals are set up that fit that character's role. In this situation, the expert is red with anger. Strong emotions can even cause virtual tears. Artificial These changes in the tears. character's body language are rendered in real time by the three-dimensional player technology of Avalon. Yeah. Now, how is this done? Many people say, ah, oh, when you just learn from such la very large databases of uh, words, text, uh, videos, these are just stochastic uh, parrots, super parrots, because we all know talking birds, and the parrots are one of them. The uh, best birds can have up to 2,000 words only. When we talk about open domain, of course, we have to train this this parrot, the artificial parrot, in a very strong manner, and we have done this. Uh, especially the big companies, we work together with Google on this, but Baidu in China, Microsoft, all the hyperscaler have built such models. Bird was one of the first. And uh, we have ever larger models. Four years ago, the models were quite narrow, but now we have um, uh, billions and uh, in, in some cases, even trillions of parameters in such a model. I will show it in a minute. Uh, Lambda uh, is uh, one of the Google large models for dialogues, has 1.56 trillion words of training. Yeah? So you see the training size is enormous. Uh, the uh, parameter space is enormous. And therefore, these systems are very successful. But... Of course, there is also a lot of criticism. If you look more deeper into uh, these systems, we can say 
the language is not really grounded. Normally, a natural language is grounded in the physical world. Uh, but I will show this is an argument which is not completely correct, because if you hook it up with some of um, Andreas' uh, robots, then there is a grounding. So grounding can actually be simulated. But on the other hand, there is no interaction with people. And uh, you know, kids won't pick up a language from passive exposure, uh, such as TV or radio. You have to talk. The parents have to talk to, to the kid. Now, how is this working? I think many of you already know these are the so-called very successful transformer architectures where you have just encoders, a set of encoders, a set of decoders, and then you can translate, je suis étudiant, to I am a student. Uh, this works pretty uh, nicely, and we have, in, uh, uh, in addition to this, we also have embeddings in the neural networks so that we can inject some, let's say, symbolic knowledge, which is really needed, and then uh, everything gets much better already. Then you can have semantic search, for instance. When you ask the system, what is semantics? Then it will find a text which says semantics is a study of reference meaning and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, and this is fully automatically learned just from these very large corpora. Uh, the Lambda uh, project was one of the first which really covered natural language dialogues from uh, Google. And what they do is also very simple algorithms. First, they generate something uh, using the large language model, and then they score it. Uh, they classify, for instance, how specific is what you have generated. How interesting may it be for a certain uh, user who, who is hearing this? Uh, how sensible is it? And so on. So, so they have this parameter space, and then they select the best candidate from what they have generated, the network has generated. This works pretty well. Here is an example. For instance, solving math problems. This is another problem how to test a student. If you say, question, Tom's ship can travel at 10 miles per hour. He is sailing from 1 to 4 p.m. He then travels back at a rate of 6 p.m. How long does it take him to get back? Question. If you have a small language model, and this is really, uh, really fascinating, then you get a wrong response. So you have to be careful when you commercialize the system. They sometimes give you wrong answers. So this student with six, 62 billion units yeah, still doesn't have has a chance to answer. So Google had to scale, and we worked with them to, to really scale this up, and now we have 540 billion model parameters, and then you get the right answer, five. So one has to be careful when do we, can we stop the training and how, do, how long do we have to train to get the right answer. Uh, another very nice example is explaining a joke. So uh, let's say you give a prompt, explain this joke. Did you see that Google just hired an eloquent whale for their TPU team? It showed them how to communicate between two different pots. So the insider understand the, the joke because TPUs are a type of computer chip that Google uses for deep learning. That's true. A pot is a group of TPUs. A pot is also a group of whales. And this is not the joke. The joke is that the whale is able to communicate between two groups of whales, <laughs> but not between computers, of course. Uh, it's, it's a small joke automatically generated, but also explained. Now, one of the criticism, and again, Serge already mentioned this, uh, was very interesting, that he said, you know, maybe it's a little bit too much what we do here, because 137 billion model parameters, that's more than neurons of the human brain. We know today that 86.1 plus minus 8 billion neurons is a a normal human brain, a diet human brain. So we have more uh, parameters than neurons. Now, some people argument, yeah, we have synapses at every, uh, but we know from uh, brain theory that the computational power of a brain is determined by the number of neurons. That's pretty clear. And uh, on the other side, of course, the human brain has not only neurons, but it has hormones. There are chemical processes and so on, which are not well understood. On the other hand, we know um, that the human brain, where are the, 
you know, centers of speech and language processing on the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. So we can compare this with what's going on in our neural networks. And um, actually, this is done, for instance, um, for uh, trying to explain how the network recognizes something. Uh, here you have, for instance, an um, a animal, and you want to uh, know why can you, this cock, how can you uh, recognize as a neural network, which is trained on photos, this uh, cock, and actually, we have a, um, a, a, a decomposition uh, procedure which really points out that actually uh, the system looks only here. Yeah? It, it recognizes such a cock by looking at this place. And using such a heat map, you can at least explain a little bit how the system works internally. The same is done now in neuroscience because with fMRI, you also can, uh, on a coarse crane scale, also recognize what activity is generated when you have to uh, analyze such a picture. Now, finally, unfortunately, my talk has to be a little bit compressed because of time problems here, uh, knowledge-free AI methods, uh, this is what I just said about super parrots. They are good. They are really excellent results with them. But on the other hand, as we saw, there are still some glitches and open problems. For instance, ambiguity, uh, crosstalk, uh, also the self-reflection about what you are saying. So things are missing. This is better in knowledge-based AI systems. And therefore, we now we have the term neural symbolic. So we have to have a hybrid thing where we use knowledge and the large uh, language model together. And we work very hard. And how can we, you know, uh, uh, let's say, fuse uh, these two technologies? And a very nice idea, which we uh, tried in many projects, is that actually, for instance, when you translate or hear, hear a sentence, you can switch between different processing modes. So, for instance, if you hear, if you prefer another hotel, please let me know. Please let me know. You don't uh, think a lot about it because it's an idiomatic phrase. So, uh, this is parrot-like understanding because you have heard this so many times. Please let me know how you don't. If you prefer another hotel and you should uh, translate this to German, it's a little bit delicate because in German there are two words for for ziehen, which has uh, ambiguity. So you really have to think a little bit deeper about it. And uh, therefore the selection module says, I don't believe just the parrot. We have to go a little bit deeper in thinking about what is the real meaning. So you understand what I mean. Now, finally, why is this so important? Especially here in Bremen and especially all over Europe. We say, in Europe, varietate concordia. This is a Latin term for united in diversity. We have many different languages and multilinguality in Europe, not in the United States, not in China. This is a positive asset of our continent. And the European Commission last year has decided we want to have large language models for all the European languages. And here you see, with the green and yellow, how far we are. It's only English, actually, which has such models now. On the second place, we have German, French, and Spanish. All the other languages, if you look, for instance, Polish or Slovenian, even Swedish, you have only a little bit of language modeling, and it's not uh, digital natural language processing is far away from really be solved for all these languages. Not to speak about national language, like Icelandic, Lamburgish, or regional, like Basque, Catalan, or Welsh. In, and in the long run, we want to have, of course, digital processing and, uh, of all these languages. And therefore, there is a so-called European Language Equality Program, uh, which uh, tries to have open access language models for all European languages, create the data sets, this is costly, as I said, multilingual models, and also symbolic knowledge, which is embedded to have better speech understanding, machine translation. Because we figure, if you don't have a digital version of your language, of your mother language, it will die. 
because our people switch to English, and this is not the intention of the European Language Equality Manager. Now the sponsoring of this is by European Union. Uh, several billion uh, of euro uh, are now uh, distributed for doing this, so it's a very interesting research issue. Let me finish with an example which I selected for Bremen, because just two days ago, our new German language model, which has six billion language um, parameters in it, uh, you can already test. And I gave the uh, system a trigger phrase in red here. Uh, Bremen is bekannt für, yeah, this we type in, and then the system generates, yeah, using the parad uh, paradigm, deftige Küche und die Bremer Stadtmusikanten. Doch die Hansestadt hat noch viel mehr zu bieten. So in English, Bremen is known for, as a trigger, and then the model says a hearty cuisine and the Bremen town musicians, but the Hanse town has to offer much more. And you see already in such a context, yeah, such a model uh, delivers very nice results. I mean, it has re uh, not specifically learned this because it's not close domain. It has millions of cities and how it found that Bremen is bekannt for hearty cuisine, I don't know. Uh, I mean, we have to go to our <laughs> tracking algorithm to find this out. Anyway, I think this is a good uh, um, f uh, finishing remark. Uh, and, and let's say the, what we have seen is the scalability of language models for dialogue system based on deep learning is a clear advantage for open domain applications. They clearly outperform previous approaches. Uh, the validated results and insights from psycholinguistics have to be integrated in the near future. The high compute and memory requirements, I couldn't talk about this, the human, memory, the human brain is much more energy efficient on a scale of thousands or 10,000 times less energy. We waste a lot of energy on these big models, I must say. Successful end -to -end learning approaches are possible, uh, especially for task-oriented multimodal approaches. And as I said, hybrid approaches, this is the way to go, which combines statistical approaches with symbolic approaches. This is what we all should do in the next uh, PhD. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. We have time for one very fast, one quick question. Microphone? I think it's in front of you, here on the seat. One, two. So it works. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, it was really exciting. Um, do you think that um, uh, the argument uh, of statistical parrots about grounding is not uh, looks really solid? Because uh, in a case of huge data sets like common crawl, we already have some projection of the uh, social practice of the millions of people yes. uh, to some huge uh, data sets. And it's much more than any agent can obtain from direct uh, practice in real world. Because we already have the projection of the, all the real world inside. These yes, data yes. No, uh, very good that you mentioned. There was a slight misunderstanding, uh, as I said. This is a criticism, but the criticism, you are right, is not correct. Because, as I showed, we have already uh, databases with pictures, videos, we have the robots, so the grounding argument is no longer true as a tech. Thank you. But I said this, maybe it uh, was too, too fast. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you very much again. And we move on to our next presentation. So... So our next speaker is Dr. Raphael Wampfler. He is from the computer graphics uh, lab from the ETH Zürich. He's a postdoc there. He also got his PhD there. The lab is uh, very famous among others, also for its many corporations with industry, including uh, NVIDIA, but also Walt Disney. And slightly related to that, uh, he's going to uh, talk a little bit about things uh, he's working on in his research. 
namely among others making Einstein alive again. Mm -hmm. So yeah. thank you very much. Hello everyone and, and thank you. Yeah. Just go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Give him a hearty applause. Mm -hmm. You so, always have time for that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for your kind of um, uh, introduction and today I will talk about our projects on digital character AI and in particular um, about how to bring characters uh, to life. And uh, digital characters have a lot of different potential use cases. So currently the metaverse is pretty much hyped. So a lot of companies are working on the metaverse like Disney, Facebook and so on. And um, in the metaverse, digital characters can be very useful, for example, as friends for life or as personalized digital assistants. But digital characters can also be useful in other areas, such, that, such as mixed reality toys or for location-based experiences, for example, through augmented reality devices like smart glasses or uh, smartphone or iPads. Um, digital characters can also be used uh, in other areas, for example, as digital teachers in digital classrooms or as digital museum guides or in healthcare as digital doctors or digital psychotherapists. And in contrast to real humans, digital characters don't have to sleep, so they are available 24 hours. And um, also the barrier to talk to like a digital therapist or digital a doctor can be lower than to talk to a real therapist or real um, doctor. So this can be beneficial. And um, a last use case is that um, digital characters make it possible to converse with um, figures out of history books or even fairy tales, or to have conversations with uh, great minds from the past, like um, Albert Einstein, for example. And as a use case here, we brought uh, Albert Einstein to life um, using a physical setup you can see here. So the user or the, the people are sitting in the chair and can talk to um, a digital representation of Albert Einstein. And um, so we have not only a digital character, but we have a whole setting, a physical setting, which makes the um, interaction much more fun, much more engaging, much more immersive. So we have like an old looking a chair, a carpet, a table, a books, a lamp, a screen with an old frame um, and so on. And um, in addition, uh, the user is getting recorded by a webcam hidden at the top of the frame. It's not so visible here in the picture. And uh, we also have hidden a microphone in the book. So the environment is sensed by the webcam and by the microphone. In addition, we also have five speakers built in the chair below the table and behind the screen for the voice output of Einstein. Um, here you see the president of ETH Zurich interacting with uh, Albert Einstein. So he also tested the platform and such a conversation will look as follows. How lovely to see you. Likewise. How are you today? Uh, I'm great, thank you. Good, then let's start. What year is it now? Uh, it's 2021. Unbelievable. It is exactly 100 years after I received the Nobel Prize in Physics. <laughs> and so on. <laughs> um, so um, in our project, we used the uh, stylized, the cartoonish character in contrast to a realistic looking character to avoid uh, the uncanny valley effect. And the uncanny valley effect is described here. So when characters are getting more human-like, more realistic, then the acceptance of the character by people is increasing and also the emotional response towards the character is getting more positive, as you can see here, acceptance is increasing. But when then characters are getting almost perfectly realistic, but not completely perfect realistic, so when their characters have some minor artifacts, as you can see here, 
um, in this image, so it's almost perfectly human, but not completely perfectly human. When this is the case, then um, the acceptance of the, of the character is dropping, and also the emotional response is getting more negative, as you can see here. So we have a drop in the acceptance of the character. And that's one reason why we are using a stylized cartoonish character, so that we are more in this area here, and we don't face the uncanny valley effect, because it's also very difficult to create like a perfectly, completely perfectly looking um, character, uh, in, par in particular also when you have to animate the character. Um, for the story, um, we used the dialogue tree, you can see here on the right side. Um, it's only a snippet, um, it's, the dialogue tree is it's much bigger. Um, it's a scripted um, dialogue, but the dialogue still has some non-linearity. So we have different branches in the dialogue tree that can be taken randomly or depending on the user input. And um, the dialogue tree acts based on the intent um, of the user. So we, we are using intent detection. Um, and the dialogue is also not conversational, it's not a chatbot, so it's scripted, the number of responses are fixed, but this also has an advantage, so we have a story, the user is guided through the dialogue, which can be more engaging, more fun, in contrast to a completely open dialogue. And here um, you see the full pipeline we are using um, for our digital Einstein platform. So we have two sensor inputs um, here. So we have the um, microphone input and the webcam input. Um, from the webcam, we are sensing if a user is attentive or not. And we are also recognizing the age of the user. And this provides us context for the dialogue tree. So this is fed um, also, or also used in the dialogue tree. So if a user is not attentive, then a special node in the dialogue tree is triggered with a special response of um, Einstein. Um, and from the webcam, we also um, recognize if a user arrives and then the dialogue starts. And when a user leaves, then the dialogue ends. So for this, the webcam is used. And then from the audio, input, we are segmenting the input into speech segments here. Um, and then we transcribe the uh, speech into text using a speech to text uh, system. And then from this text, we are um, recognizing the user intent and the emotion of the user. And this is then fed um, into the dialogue tree, uh, which then produces the response um, of Einstein. And based on the response text, we are um, selecting a corresponding pre-recorded voice snippet, which is then played. In addition, um, we also select three different types of animation here um, from an um, animation database consisting of pre-recorded animation. So we have here the um, characteristic parameters that is like body movement parameters. Then we have the facial activation parameters and also lip synchronization parameters. So we need these three different parts to animate the character. And then we are blending this um, three different animation types together to form the final animation, which is then played using a rendering engine. And this produces the final animation. And here you see how the uh, capturing, animation capturing setup looked like using motion capturing. So here, this is the artist that was uh, acting or doing the Einstein acting. And during his acting, we were recording his body movement using positional trackers, hand gesture trackers, and also facial trackers. Um, and at the same time, he also recorded his voice um, using microphones. And from this, we got uh, the pre-recorded animations and pre-recorded speech. Um, so as you have seen, we, until now, we used um, a scripted dialogue, pre-recorded voice and pre-recorded animations. And now we would like to make it more uh, intelligent, like making, uh, making Einstein more intelligent or the conversation more intelligent, more engaging, more 
natural. And this we tackle using three different components. First, we are replacing the scripted dialogue tree with a chatbot. Second, we are uh, replacing the pre-recorded speech with a voice synthesis model. And third, we are replacing the uh, pre-recorded animation um, by um, data-driven animation synthesis. So we have these three components. For the chatbot, we are using a large language model, um, GPT-J. Um, yeah, so there, there should be a video, but it's not playing yeah, now it's playing so we are using a um, gpdj language model that is running locally on a computer in our office so it's an 8 billion parameter model as we have heard in the talk before it's big but there are much bigger models so um, yeah um, but it works well and we can run it locally on our computer and it's a generic language model um, so it's not tailored for a conversation that's why we had to fine-tune the model on large data sets consisting of conversations. Um, in addition, we also use prompt engineering to provide the model knowledge about Einstein and to pro uh, provide the model the personality of Einstein and to keep track of the history of the conversation. And currently, the model is um, web-based. It's running on the web page. It's not yet connected to a uh, character, but we are working on it. It's work in progress. Um, so um, for synthesizing the voice, um, we did this in collaboration with Aflorhythmic, um, a startup. Um, and our voice model uh, looks as follows. So we first converted the text into phonemes. And then the, um, from the phonemes, we extracted MEL spectrograms. And the MEL spectrogram basically visualizes the frequency spectrum of a, of, a spe uh, of a speech signal. And then from the MEL spectrograms, we extracted or we generated the waveform, which can then be played. And to uh, learn um, this uh, voice synthesis model, we collected the data set consisting of 2,100 sentences in a voice stu uh, studio with an actor. And one such voice recording looks as follows. Markus Groß is the head of the computer graphics lab of the ETH Zurich. In total, we recorded 2,100 different sentences to train our model. And when we now connect our voice model to the chatbot, then it sounds as follows. Lovely to see you. What is your name? And what is your job? So you are a scientist. Of course, I studied there. I was a presser there for two years. And so on. So the, um, there are still some artifacts in the voice model, but in general, it works uh, um, pretty well. Um, so now we have seen that we can generate like arbitrary responses from the chatbot and synthesize the voice uh, from arbitrary text or arbitrary chatbot responses. So when we have this, then we also need um, to generate animations on the fly because we can't um, like record uh, speech for all possible answers. So that's not possible. And we tackle this uh, by using um, deep learning models for generating uh, facial animation and body animations, in particular uh, gesture, hand gestures. And um, this is uh, speech-based. So we have the text output of the chatbot, we generate the speech, and then we generate animations based on the generated uh, speech. In addition to the speech, we also constrain our model on emotion, um, personality, and also intention or dialogue acts, as we have heard before in the, in the talk. And with this, we are generating or automatically generate animations. But this is also work in progress. So to conclude, um, we have seen that digital characters have many uh, different use cases. 
And um, you have seen the Digital Einstein platform where users can talk to um, Digital Einstein avatar. We have used for a platform a stylized, cartoonish character um, with a scripted dialogue tree and pre-recorded speech and animation, pre-recorded animations. And currently we are working on making the interaction more uh, free, more engaging by using a chatbot, um, voice synthesis model, and um, data-driven animation synthesis. Oh, yeah, there's also video, <laughs> the dancing Einstein. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to answer your question. So, yeah, thank you very much. So we have time for one fast question. If there's none, I have actually one. I mean, the, the uncanny valley uh, effect is well known. Does it actually also exist for speech? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, obviously the, the speech is also a little bit cartoonized. Mm -hmm. So is this mainly to make it fit the optical character? Is there anything related to uncanny valley mm -hmm. or it's simply hard to get the original voice of of Einstein, mm -hmm. just based on recordings. Mm -hmm. or yeah. So that's a very good question. So I don't know if the Uncanny Valley effect also exists for speech. I could imagine that it exists um, because when you have like almost perfect voice, but still some artifact, it could sound weird. But so this was not the reason uh, why we use this like cartoonish voice. Um, it's, as you said, because it fits better, like our use case with the stylized character. And our platform is also like an more entertainment. It should be fun. And for this, like um, the voice with a strong German accent, like more the funny voice fits better than like the more boring, real Einstein <laughs> voice. And that was the main reason why we used this, uh, this voice. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation. Mm -hmm. And we move on to the next presentation. So the next presenters, please, on stage. So hopefully there's also going to be the slide changing. So there's uh, Sergei Markov next to me, who is uh, at uh, Salud Devices and who has been uh, involved in the Rudali, um, Mal uh, Malevich and Kandinsky projects, which are up to my knowledge, uh, the largest computational projects in uh, Russia up to date. And he's gonna give us a, a presentation that is uh, related to it. I'm not sure is Maria Slabunova here today uh, uh, as well, or? Yeah, my, Maria will work with me um, at the networking session. Okay. So just for now, I am the only speaker on this scene. Um, so, um, so welcome, and here's the oh, present stick. And give a warm hand. We're looking forward to your presentation. Mm. Um, my speech is about uh, the emerging area of the uh, transformer models for now. It's a programming language processing. Uh, and uh, of course, um, uh, it's uh, interesting that um, um, due to some new revolution in the uh, deep learning, which is known as transformer revolution, uh, we now have a huge success in uh, different areas where we using huge neural networks to process text-like sequences. Um, you know that um, the progress in uh, natural language processing results in uh, uh, some uh, shifted by the time progress uh, in an area of uh, processing different uh, sequences like uh, music sequences or uh, some bioinformatic uh, data or some uh, uh, chemistry data, transactions data, and so on. Uh, 
so, of course, um, the processing of the programming languages uh, looks uh, really interesting because uh, we can use um, uh, this technology to automate a lot of processes uh, inside the software engineering. And uh, if you compare the area of uh, uh, natural language processing and the area of programming language processing, we can see that almost every task uh, in the area of uh, natural language processing has its twin uh, in the area of programming language processing. For example, machine translation corresponding to code translation and reverse engineering, and the task of uh, writing the text uh, is uh, almost the same that writes in the code, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, the most interesting application of the current uh, transformer generative models in the area of uh, programming language processing are, of course, code generation uh, and um, in a form of um, uh, automatic uh, uh, code completion when you're just uh, going to write your code inside your ID uh, and uh, some smart model based on the current context uh, give you some suggestions about how your code should be completed. Uh, and uh, such models uh, help you to save time because sometimes, and I think uh, it's a current uh, programming paradigm that uh, uh, a lot of time we are using to search relevant code snippets and copy them from uh, Stack Overflow, you know, and other uh, relevant sources to your code. Um, and uh, sometimes also you're doing a really obvious work and uh, some uh, good statistical model can predict uh, how your code should be completed. Um, of course, um, the second uh, major task inside of programming language processing is a uh, uh, defects detection because uh, uh, big, uh, big models are really good in classifying your sequences and you could use them to detect some vulnerabilities, some defects in the code. Uh, so it also provides a lot of uh, useful uh, solutions. Um, also, we have uh, much more tasks in this area, of course, but uh, uh, I will mostly speak about, uh, about the first two major problems. Uh, so we see that now the huge AI labs uh, are working on their own solutions in the area of programming language processing. And in the case of DeepMind, we have Alpha Code system. In the case of OpenAI and Microsoft collaboration, we have GitHub Copilot, which is based on Codex model by, by OpenAI. Uh, in the case of Amazon, we have Code Whisperer. Uh, and also we have a lot of uh, independent projects like Tab9. Uh, and uh, this is a really hot topic uh, in research for now. Um, the impact of this technology uh, is uh, already really impressive. For example, uh, about 30 projects, new projects at uh, GitHub is made <coughs> using a uh, copilot model. Uh, so, in the case of Tab9, one year ago we already had uh, more than 2 million uh, installations of this software and so more than 2 million active users of this technology. Uh, so, this technology, of course, uh, helps both uh, corporations and also individual developers because in the case of large uh, corporation, it reduces code development costs and also improving the quality of the code. Uh, makes possible to make some audit of the external software. And in the case of individual developers, it also uh, reduced the share of routine tasks. Uh, your work became uh, more, um, sense, uh, more senseful. So uh, it's uh, really interesting to make some uh, smart work instead of just copying some obvious obvious things into your code. Um, in the case of humans, of course, they are really far from perfection because um, uh, we sometimes lose our focus when writing code and uh, uh, 
make a lot of bugs uh, and so on. So uh, have such a, um, such a assistant when you write in code uh, is uh, help, helps a lot and also it uh, enables us to lower the barrier in the uh, software development and uh, help some beginners to uh, write more sophisticated code. So um, it looks that uh, this technology has uh, really uh, good perspectives from now. Uh, on average, developer creates about uh, 70 bucks per 1,000 lines of code. And uh, you see that uh, almost uh, three, um, uh, three of fourth uh, of the time is spent on debugging. So uh, because of some small defects in the code, we lost uh, more time. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we should uh, do something with it. Uh, in the case of software engineering, we already had um, uh, some huge paradigm shifts. Uh, at the beginning, there was machine code programming, and then uh, 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 the low-level programming languages spotted, like assembly language, then uh, high-level high programming languages, like Algol, and so on. Uh, then, um, for now, we also have a modern paradigm uh, with the modern collaborative development ecosystems when uh, we are not uh, having all the possible knowledge about coding inside our brains, but using some collaborative technologies, using some stack overflow and so on. You know that uh, modern programmer are usually just going to Google some snippets of code and put them into uh, into their own projects. Uh, so we are now um, going to make a new paradigm shift uh, in development because uh, all these um, uh, routine tasks uh, also could be optimized at a new level of the machine intelligence. Um, uh, this is some, some stats from real project. Uh, uh, this is a code completion model from our uh, Jarvis project. Uh, and um, we used uh, uh, Java uh, as a model language. And uh, uh, you see that uh, we have some, uh, some um, compare of uh, our autocomplete model with uh, uh, ID embedded uh, autocomplete system based on rules. Uh, so, um, we are going to save about 10% uh, of uh, coding time, of, of the time, of the working time of the programmer. So, it looks uh, not bad because um, the model uh, which uh, lays in the foundation of the Jarvis system is just uh, some small T5 uh, language model which is tuned uh, on the code with the uh, uh, some really simple tokenizer without using some abstract syntax trees and some deep understanding of the programming language. It's just a language model without uh, any specific knowledge embedded inside it. Anyway, it works much better than rule-based uh, system embedded in uh, popular IDEs. So what to expect and what not from PLP to the area of software engineering. Uh, of course, sometimes people say that uh, it will result in uh, the loss of uh, jobs uh, and also future unemployment and so. Uh, but uh, of course, it will result uh, probably in really different, um, uh, different uh, consequences. Uh, because uh, when the production of the software became uh, more productive. Uh, the wider area of, uh, it widers the area of software engineering application. Uh, so, you know, when, um, when we got some first digital computers, the result was not that uh, these digital computers just replaced all the, uh, you know, people who uh, worked on manual calculations. Uh, the result was that uh, 
the computation technology uh, became the most uh, uh, be became more efficient, uh, and it resulted in new areas uh, uh, to uh, application for this technology. You know, uh, in your smartphone, you have uh, much more computation power uh, than uh, all the NASA uh, computers when they launched a uh, human to the moon. Uh, but uh, anyway, you uh, find some applications for this uh, huge computational power. For example, you just launch uh, some birds into some pigs uh, and solve other uh, really interesting ballistic tasks uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so probably the higher productivity uh, will result in wider area of application of software technology. And of course, of course it... Uh, will um, change the barriers of complexity for systems we are creating. And also it will result in uh, higher code quality uh, and also, I hope, lower barriers to entry for the um, people to the area of IT. Uh, so some, some simple, uh, simple examples how it works. Uh, you see that... Um, uh, um, the language model could base on, uh, for example, your comments uh, um, written in natural language to produce some uh, code that uh, will implement uh, this, um, this functionality. Uh, so it works just because uh, in the uh, data set we already have uh, some natural language-based comments uh, and also code. Uh, so the huge language model just grasps uh, uh, the dependence between natural language and your code. So uh, in most cases, in the case of uh, small functions, uh, you don't need uh, to Google anything. Just write uh, what uh, functionality you want from your function using the comment in natural language. And voila. So, thank you. That's all. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Uh, maybe keep the microphone for a second because we have time for one fast question. So, maybe I have one. So, you mentioned it's, it's a big market which has its advantages and disadvantages. So where do you see, so to say, possibilities to be most competitive? So, I mean, in theory, for me, as a naive computer scientist, you know, academics, always very naive, it's just all the big names are putting lots of processing powers on it and try to solve the problem purely, so to say, by, by processing power. Where do you see the possibilities to, to, so to say, be distinct from, from just processing power? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think that um, we have a lot of uh, areas where uh, software engineering for now uh, cannot be applied because of uh, higher costs of uh, labor power in this area. And also a lot of, I think, uh, really important areas like uh, uh, like public health care or maybe uh, some uh, education and so on. Sometimes these uh, areas are underfinanced. Yes. So we sometimes uh, already have some useful technology to be used in those areas, but we could not apply because of high, you know, high costs of it. Uh, so I hope that uh, using our uh, technology will uh, lower the cost uh, of uh, creating software applications uh, and uh, sometimes it will um, make able to create uh, some simple application without programming at all, uh, only using some natural language descriptions of uh, the tasks. So it, uh, I hope it will result in wider usage of uh, software technologies some underfinanced, financed, but really important areas. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
And I welcome the next speaker on stage. It's Andrea Ustuzanin. So he is a professor at the National University of Singapore. He is also at Acronis, director of AI for R&D. And what really you know, caught me uh, as an interesting fact uh, when I looked at his CV, he not only has a, a PhD in system programming, but he has two MSCs and uh, one in applied math, physics, and uh, autonomous control, which I find, of course, very cool. But he also has a, a, a master in uh, innovative management, which I find a very nice combination, which likely also explains why you are successful at Acronis too, and also with the things that you are presenting now, namely Rolos. Give him a warm hand. You always have time for that. So I hope now, now it is on. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for a kind introduction. Thanks, everybody, for joining and, and still being with us. Um, frankly speaking, I, I changed the title, so it's not totally about Rollos, about the development that is somehow in the continuation of the project that uh, I, I was briefly outlining at the opening, at the previous session. So, uh, about how can we design a system that can understand physics uh, and, and will be able to extract some knowledge out of the interaction with, with some system in, in more or less autonomous way. Right, so uh, there are several modern scientific challenges that people are struggling with in various uh, domains, uh, and, and some of those challenges uh, potentially can be solved in computational, in computational way, like we have definition, we have the formulation of standard model, so we can run it and then compute all the possible outcomes that will be in a given physical system, but it will be uh, unreasonably expensive, so you need to spend uh, years of computation, so it never, never can be done. And um, experimental data is not always available. So uh, it, we always scarce uh, with the data, like even at LHC, which generates them petabytes per year, so, uh, tens of petabytes. Oops, sorry. So uh, for ex just illustration, like we have uh, some planetary motion that is uh, produced by, uh, I don't know, whatever forces, right? And people observing uh, what was going on from the Earth perspective, and what kind of model can we build? Like in Greece, it was something like, uh, and you can see above, uh, but uh, later, if you look more carefully, you understand things a little bit better, and the model becomes uh, much more accurate, and you find some interesting uh, constraints or some interesting um, invariants that are kept, no matter what, what kind of planet you are observing. Right, so uh, the idea of the project uh, can be formulated in the following way. So how can we design and develop an AI system that can assist in speeding up um, breakthroughs in science, right? Building models that can uh, somehow learn uh, and tell us about what, what we have in our hands. And uh, co consequently, we can move to some somewhat more engineering problem formulation about uh, system at hand, what, what can we do? Or how can we arrange system in such a way that we can achieve certain result uh, in a shortest, uh, at shortest period of time or at the smallest cost possible? Um, and as an example of the system that we want to explore, we can take, uh, for, for, for example, a Newtonian mechanics that starts to be pretty simple uh, at the scale of a uh, couple of or ten, tens of individual uh, bodies interacting with each other, although even uh, with three bodies we can get to chaotic regimes. Uh, but anyway, so how can we move from such a Newtonian interactions to something more complex like thermodynamics? Uh, when we start to increase a number of particles, 
uh, can we can we come up with uh, uh, invariants like uh, PV divided by T that always is the same? And can we switch uh, from maybe uh, ideal gas uh, model, or sorry, from from real gas to ideal gas uh, that would give us same statistical properties? Um, so, and the approach that we uh, suggest to follow, yeah, this is something that is not there yet. So I'm not going to describe how to do all this stuff. It's just a like, description of a uh, project that, that we're inviting people to join if you're interested in. Right, so the, the roadmap or some uh, building blocks in, that, that we find to be necessary, um, the first one is to be able to formulate the problem in a terminology similar to games, like uh, computers I really like playing games, and even multiplying tensors uh, was a successful attempt to optimize an algorithm if you formulated a, you know, like a game of tensors. Um, the second component of building blocks uh, is uh, somewhat related to the um, building embeddings or constructing such embeddings that uh, encompasses all the different uh, properties that we're interested in, including measurements, including types of models, including maybe language models as well. So it is similar to what people are doing for generating images when they have language or text and images embedded to some higher dimensionality space where uh, you know how to get from one domain and from another and get from the vector that represent a given picture. And another thing is the so-called curry howard lambic correspondence that uh, I'm going to talk about in the, in the following slides. So I'm just going to iterate on those uh, in a little more detail. So the modeling as a game is not a new idea, uh, and people are following this. And in particular, <clears throat> uh, David Heston is author of this, uh, of a few papers on this, and they, they formulated like. Uh, what we learn when, when we interact with the physics, and they apply this to learning, to, to teaching students physics or other, doma other domains in more efficient way. So the, the basic understanding is that you split the interaction with the system into mental model uh, that uh, is, is uh, collecting experience and allows to people to reason about what they saw, what they did, and conceptual models that actually extract the, some patterns, some knowledge that, that they can share with others. <clears throat> and this is a domain that we are uh, clearly more interested in. So the, the, on the right, you see the uh, Newton law. So it's kind of rules of the game uh, or, or some high level description of what is going on that we want the model to be able to discover. Right. So they're, they're not uh, as, as complex as chess or as Go. Uh, like very simple stuff. Uh, I understand that when you run into multiple interactions, it becomes more complicated, but nevertheless. Um, so, and then the, and the joint encoding is also known stuff. So, uh, people are writing about these papers for years. Uh, this may be one of the more detailed, but more, more recent one, but there are many others. Uh, how can you embed uh, space that uh, embed? complicated and complex uh, things into a joint representation. Uh, and the final thing that about this um, curry howard lambic correspondence is something that tells um, that, look, there is a correspondence between computation, which is lambda calculus or some, some programs, their logic, like proofs of theorems, and categories, and, 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 and physics even, or topology. Uh, and, and there is once you can formulate a problem in one of those term, uh, one of those frameworks, you can translate into category, and, and then instantly you can get to other frameworks, which I think is quite uh, important. So uh, you can you can you can tra traverse this cycle um, in 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 a way that would be helpful to formulate a problem uh, in both in machine learning perspective and, and human perspective. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I definitely find category theory uh, helpful here. I'm not going to, into details, but if you're interested, I would highly recommend 
uh, the, the, the book uh, written by Bob Koke, and uh, he, he actually is a good starting point. So the, this book is a good starting point both for physics and categories that, that allow you to see how those things actually work together. Uh, constructor theory is also something I mentioned before, so I'm not going to go into details. The main idea is that with uh, this approach, we can rule out what is not possible and rule out uh, such models that uh, do not give us good result. And it, would be, it can be helpful for extrapolating or uh, understanding generalization properties of such models. Um, yeah, so the, the general, like, playing Newtonian game can be organized in a way, like, when you, when you observe the system that is on the left, uh, you, you do it on several uh, levels of granularity. And, and you devise an, 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 uh, the uh, laws or models that work on the high level or models that work on lower level and, and interaction and, and uh, some meaningful exchange of information between those two models, those two levels, can allow you to close the loop in a such a way that it will probe additional regimes or additional configurations uh, through the simulation to enrich the knowledge and fill in the gaps of uh, generalization. Um, yeah, and the theory is basically uh, the, the roadmap which starts with the development of this Newtonian mechanics plus thermodynamics and then transfer learning, so that, that is about uh, understanding uh, different phenomena in one environment and transferring this knowledge to another. Uh, another component that we're interested here is um, making the human level communication uh, a possible, like uh, we can currently do with this Einstein bot, but about some physical domain, uh, about the, the system that we have never observed. Uh, then probably going into some fancy physics like non-locally interacting quantum subsystem, biotech, uh, high entropy alloys or whatever, and uh, solving engineering, prob uh, engineering problems as well, integration with ROLOS, uh, which actually would provide some integrated, some uh, joint experience for, for people interested in running simulation, running machine learning models, and, and doing some knowledge inference from uh, the simulation combined with experiments. Um, and, well, okay, this can be, of course, extended even further. Um, so, the, the expected outcomes and aspirations uh, can, can be the following. So, we can build a library of models suitable for specific domains, and we can interplay uh, with those models and play different uh, new, learn different laws from, from uh, new domains in a much faster way. Learn school and undergraduate physics, uh, that, that also could, could be a cool thing, and produce a formulation of a solid epistemic scientific knowledge um, for uh, autonomous physics discovery, which, uh, okay, in the limit uh, and, and uh, time, uh, can be uh, uh, achieved. I, I'm not uh, I'm quite confident about it. So, and then, of course, uh, assisting in discovering and explaining new scientific phenomena and devising and constructing of new stuff that we cannot imagine even now. So, this is pretty much um, like broad, overarching idea that, that we are currently working on. So. If um, you know people interested in such uh, project who would like to contribute, could join, uh, please feel free. So it is a pretty much open initiative, it covers many topics, um, there are many issues, uh, conceptual engineering, etc. Uh, so, and we have open positions in Singapore and Bremen, uh, basically all around the world. Thank you very much. Um, I'd be happy to get some questions. Over there, is yeah. There's a microphone coming. Just next. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, this question is on, uh, one that I really want to ask from the previous talk, and this one's also related to that. Um, 
this is the first time for me to hear about category. I never thought I would be having a, a conversation about that. I have a brother with a mathematician who does in this field. And I hope that maybe from this presentation, I'll be able to hold a conversation. This is my question. Um, you talk about uh, categories, basically a pure representation, right? Um, and then you have object, you, you design the relationship between this object, you call it a morphism. What I got a little bit confused is that um, it looks very similar to machine learning. I don't understand the clear cut. If you don't have to analytically define the morphism, so what is, what is the difference here? So how do you, what, can you, is it possible to make a cut or like something very specific? So, sorry, you're asking how can we define the uh, morphism that is not defined in an analytical way, but in some different way? Yeah, I don't know how you actually define it. That makes it different from the standard machine learning, like neural network. We don't necessarily need to define the relationship themselves. We learn it digitally. Uh, this I understand. I could be wrong, but I hope you can. No, no. There, so morphism is something that, that uh, we know is there. So sometimes we want to, to design our own categories, but some in some places, in some real world, uh, it, is, it is already there. So for example, relational schema, relational database, like when you have entities and, and there are some uh, structure in the database. So this is a kind of a category uh, that, that you can have as an example. So it is, it is already given. Or if there are mathematical uh, objects, so like pre-order uh, I, I mentioned before, so uh, relation between numbers or, or vectors. So, so it's arbitrary thing. There is another remark by Wolfgang Wagner, who most probably, yeah. Or question? Yep. If you, if you push the lock to Hello? Um, you pushed a lot category theory. Uh, category theory, I think, is a very good thing. We teach it even in the first year in computer science, and so it's very common. Uh, at least but also because <laughs> <it's> <laughs> you always have <laughs> to do the category theory course immediately. But on the other hand, uh, I must say, so I'm not against it. I think it's a good thing uh, to learn about it. But on the other hand, it's uh, around uh, more than 80 years, uh, it's already known. Yeah? And uh, real breakthroughs, I, I think we can use it. We use it from time to time. But uh, I think what is missing, and this is my criticism a little bit when you say math is the basis. Of course, math is the basis for informatics. But informatics goes further, because in mathematics, there is one big problem, uh, which is not uh, aligned with the real world. There is no real uh, temporal process approach. And in computer science, and what we discuss here, we need the notion uh, both of uh, resources for computation, uh, of course, you know, complexity theory. But this was not done in mathematics, but actually in computer science, and also uh, process models, for instance, petri nets, uh, dealing with probabilities and so on. So category theory can be used, as, I, as you s said, but I think it also has its limitations. I wouldn't say that category theory is the solution of all the problems we have in AI. I think this was a little bit uh, overemphasized in your talk, from my point of view. And mathematics yeah, was good, but now we are in the phase of informatization, and because we saw that mathematics, everything in mathematics is, you know, uh, no time constraints. People in logic, yeah, don't think about uh, everything is commutative. It doesn't depend whether you prove first, first, then second. You can commute, but this is not the case in the real world and not in computer science. That's a little bit the mathematicians are good, solid basis, but we have to go on. This is my. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I, I got your point, but actually uh, the recent results in, in category theory includes as well temporally time theory. So it's type theory is a, the basis for lambda calculus, right? Uh, and and there, there is a work on temporal, when, when type change over the time, so it allows you to model uh, time in a more intrinsic way. So it, I think it's not relevant, so the, 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 your, your uh, criticism is not relevant if you want to model some physical uh, properties, physical system, because 
we know the relations and the dynamical laws that we want to discover yes. is, is over there. So it's more relevant to modeling maybe some uh, business processes or some events that happen and depend on each other and there is a complicated dependence. Yeah. Parallelism uh, and deadlocks yeah, and so on. Uh, Petri yeah. nets, for instance. And Petri nets is also, there is a... You can model everything in category, but yeah, like, yeah. what is the value? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I would love to throw in uncertainty because yeah, yeah. That, that, but I think, you know, uh, it's, it's a great remark. Thank you very much. And I think it's a, also a perfect topic for the lunch discussion. <laughs> uh, so to make a you know, transition to the event that comes next, namely a break. And it was really a wonderful presentation. And I think there's lots of uh, also food for thought there and also for discussion. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much, Andrei Ustujanin and Andreas Burg, for the, wow, insights. And um, yeah, that was a lot of information. So in order to process and uh, reflect, have a discussion about it, um, we would love to invite you for a quick lunch break, 20 minutes, roundabout. So see you at 2.20. So... Feel free to get something to eat and please also for our on online audience, we'll be back at 2.20 Berlin time um, with some fascinating topics. So I suggest just be on time because I suppose you don't want to miss out on that. So see you at 2.20. Thank you. Hi.
Mikrofon. Dear audience, hello, hello, it's me again. I hope you had a wonderful lunch break. So we are about to start our next plenary session in around three minutes. So we would love to ask you to get ready and yeah, to kick off the next round. So be back, please, in three minutes, and we are happy to have you all back. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back after the lunch break. I hope you enjoyed your meal, also the dessert. It looked amazing. It also tasted delicious. So welcome back online and on site. I just uh, got informed that we have 2,000 people watching all over the world. This is amazing. So thank you all for tuning in. So um, this is the fourth year of um, the Insights in Technology conference, but this time It will not only be held in Bremen. Today is only the kickoff, dear ladies and gentlemen, as I may get your attention. This is the kickoff only, yeah? In February, until February 2023, further conferences will take place in Schaffhausen, in Switzerland, and even in Singapore. And without your curiosity and the high demand of our highly valued uh, audience, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you all very, very much for your interest. So now let's start the session. Um, I'd love to invite Maya Feld from Constructor University to stage, but you're here with me already, um, to our next plenary session, Focus Plenary Session Insights, it will be. And we are starting off with Werner now, going forward with universities' research agenda, including 
a highlight talk by Andrei Ivanov. So enjoy our next session. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Natalie. It's a, <clears throat> it's a great honor for me to chair this session. And um, we will start with one of our deans. Uh, and uh, the insight provided by, by uh, Werner now is entitled Going Forward with University's Research Agenda. Werner now is a professor of chemistry and one of the first 14 professors that joined this university. In 2012, he was appointed Dean for Natural Sciences at Jakobs University. And in 2014, he was appointed Dean for the Focus Area Health and Undergraduate education. In his research, he managed to attract more than 7 million euro third party research funding during the past 10 years. Please let us welcome Werner now with an applause. Thank you very much, uh, Maya and also Natalie for the introduction. Um, so you saw the title already, which I picked and it is a great pleasure for me also to give you an overview of the research which is happening here at the new, newly named Constructor University. Um, I give you here a very quick overview so you see it's, uh, it's not going to be too much. Um, I, I'll skip over the first one, this is an older version here. I go directly to the present state of research at Constructor and then I will be talking about new developments. Uh, actually, just this year, a little bit about uh, research infrastructure, companies driving research at Constructor University, and young researcher initiatives. And finally, I will mention something about the embedding of the Institute of Advanced Studies at Constructor. Now, what about research at Constructor University? Well, of course, uh, the, uh, we have been here a fully running uh, university, um, and here's an, an overview. Um, already this year in 2022, we uh, have achieved uh, a substantial change or we have undergone a substantial change uh, by the renaming of our focus areas, uh, former focus areas into the new schools. Um, so we have now a school of science, a school of computer science and engineering, and a school of business, social and decision sciences which also roughly structures our programs and the research. Now, research done at Constructor University is funded mainly through national resources, the DFG, and federal resources, and also to a substantial degree by industry funding. So you see here at the bottom our revenues. Uh, each year from research cover about 20% of our total revenues, and you see that we are on showing a good trend upwards, as you can see from the acquisitions achieved in the year 2022. Um, we are carrying out multidisciplinary research across those three schools, which now houses 80 faculty members. So in the experimental uh, research area, we are <coughs> focusing on several lines of research. Um, we are working with, uh, of course, uh, experimental projects. Um, and here, uh, in particular, you see research, some featured research with atoms, molecules, proteins, and drugs. Um, shown up here are some channel proteins. Um, the research by uh, Sebastian Springer, shown on the left in the area of immunology, you have already seen. Um, we work with metal oxo clusters, we do spectroscopy, we are watching how molecules permeate through membranes, looking at layered materials, and are also into the design of different types of pharmaceutical drugs, even though morphine is shown here as an example. Um, another line of research deals, deals with larger things, uh, hardware, robots, cells, objects, and planets. Um, so you have all witnessed the weather here in Bremen this morning, so that's why our robotics scope has decided, well, they may as well 
do research underwater. So underwater robotics is a big uh, subject. We work in laser spectroscopy, in communications, uh, and Rino has, has mentioned the, the uh, Mars colony. So even we have some planetary research going on, um, including research on, on, uh, on planet Mars. Um, and this boils down to uh, large objects like wind turbine, shown here on the left side, organic electronics, and then we move down in size a little bit to the cellular level, also research featured here. Um, moving more towards theory, we have uh, strong research lines in pure and applied mathematics. You see here um, topologies, biological uh, networks, random walk processes, um, and uh, network analysis, also quantum gravity featured, in, uh, featured here, or Mandelbrot set. So this is really pure mathematics research, which we are also involved in at Jacobs University. Uh, a strong area is uh, modeling simulation and machine learning, um, which also finds now a lot of applications in the business, social, and decision sciences. So going from, from global warning up to uh, modeling of, of finance um, or modeling of social cohesion processes. This is all uh, uh, research producing a lot of data which are treated now uh, with machine learning approaches. Um, in 2022, um, several lines of research were featured in, in national and international media. Here you see mining of high-tech metals uh, from the deep sea, gall gallium, gall gall gallium and germanium mining. Um, our top story is at the moment that our analytical chemist found uh, that uh, caffeinyl uh, quinic acid uh, is active against the corona spike protein, which was dealt with in the first session. So uh, I hope you all had a cup of coffee in this setting uh, without masks. Um, Membrane carrier is another topic, or a single drug molecule electronics. This is actually an example from our own laboratory um, where we have attached receptors to gold surfaces and um, drug molecules dock to these receptors and then you can actually characterize those drug molecules by measuring the conductance of the different drug molecules. Now, uh, something very important, research at today's university is not only driven by the professors and the faculty members or the scientific staff members. Um, more and more students become active and not only PhD students, but students at all level, master students, bachelor students. So we have many successful examples of uh, student research, also student entrepreneurships, um, this includes also some former students who continued with their projects which they developed at Jacobs University. A few days ago, you have seen a news feature on a startup funding, 7.5 million. Also, Waystand is a startup project, uh, Saving the Forest. Um, then we, uh, we have won several prizes and challenges. Um, so the top 50 Google challenge you see as one achievement, third rank in the Robotics Cup. Um, so these are major achievements by our students who also actively organize conferences on campus like the TEDx conference shown here on the right side. Um, I would like to say a few words about the research infrastructure. There are many guests here today. Unfortunately, the tight schedule does not allow for lab tours to be scheduled this time. But if you are interested, just contact me. Um, I can also uh, show you quickly uh, some of the infrastructure or the labs if you are interested uh, later this afternoon. So we have um, several laboratories. Most of the experimental wet research in uh, chemistry, biochemistry, biotechnology, physics, um, um, and cell biology is done in the so-called EON lab or the lab two where uh, also actually we have two clean rooms um, incorporated and large scale equipment, NMR, AFM and so on is also housed there. In the ocean lab and geochemistry lab, we have facilities for marine robotics as well as for, for geochemistry. 
Hall one is really, uh, well, let's say the large scale research with a 3D printer. And that's also where we house a, a company. I'll get to that in a moment on Isoprint. We have a robotics lab there. And also an educational unit, research and education, Ducky Town, you see the picture down here, as well as biology labs. Then we have theoretical labs, the Glen V, Center for Scientific Computing. And finally, the Behavioral and Social Sciences Lab, which has computerized testing methods, eye tracking, and so on. So we are quite proud to be well equipped. And at the moment, we are revamping all this research infrastructure with an effort, of course, to sharing those facilities in an efficient way. No, it's not moving anymore. Hmm? Five minutes? Five minutes till it's moving? I mean, the technology, we need again technology support because the PowerPoint is not moving. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, need, I need. Okay, here, here it continues. Thank you. Um, so, uh, just in this year uh, and uh, shortly before, we have. Uh, um, acquired several new large-scale facilities, confocal laser scanning microscopy, a new compute cluster, X-ray diffractometer, expanded robotics lab, high-resolution mass spectrometer uh, we are presently applying for. And within the IIS, we are also setting up an advanced uh, materials facility. Cooperation. Cooperation this year has gotten very strong. Besides our existing long-term collaborations with Barry Cullaboat, uh, the company uh, producing uh, cocoa products. Um, in particular, we are known there in this collaboration to have discovered the ruby red chocolate here. It's one of those uh, large-scale collaborations which uh, is continuing. Um, and also we have strong collaborations with Scheffler and with Roche. Um, Sebastian Springer this morning men mentioned our engagement in the company Tetramer Shop, which has been su successfully sold this year. And uh, the three companies uh, which have come in in the year 2022 is the company by three Russian engineers. And uh, since then, yeah, for 22 years, it uh, does the software that many, many software developers uh, around the globe are using. In some areas, like for example, Java developers, it is uh, probably the most popular IDE currently being used. And IDE is a tool you use for your job. And uh, the revolution that JetBrains made back in uh, 2000 is to put a lot of technical tasks, which are probably not uh, requires a lot of brain, but uh, very time consuming, to be done by IDE, not by the person. So the, the programmer can uh, concentrate on the tasks that are more brain intensive. Uh, yeah, here is some marketing wordings, which I would probably not read, but the uh, code is our passion is really true. And that is uh, the benefits of doing something that you yourself use. Because, you know, when you're a programmer and you're doing an ID and that uses ID that makes this Caught as our passion, something very big. Uh, speaking about history, the very first tool that JetBrains released was IntelliJ IDEA back in 2001. It was an IDE for Java. Uh, since then, we used the same technology to support uh, essentially each and every programming languages which uh, is around. So there is a whole timeline of the products. Also, in 2012, we released our own programming languages, Kotlin. By that time, uh, Java programming language was very popular on the one hand and not very good on the other hand, because it was pretty old and a lot of new ideas were, were in introduction into it, introduced into it. So we developed our own programming language and it's currently pretty popular, and especially for mobile applications for Android. It is... Uh, declared by Google as a standard programming language for Android development. And uh, as you can see, uh, the amount of users is growing. 
and growing and growing, not very exponentially, unfortunately, but uh, fast enough. And by revenue, we are closing to be a unicorn, not yet. I think it will be 600 million this year. So not bad either. Uh, some awards and recognitions uh, are here. So the company is recognized and its tool is recognized by industry. But for us, the most important is recognition amongst uh, people like us, I mean, software developers. And uh, what is important about JetBrains is that it never had a big marketing or sales department because the products are always sold by word of mouth. Uh, you hear from your friends that uh, the idea is great, you buy it himself, you ask your boss, and voila, your company you use it. So, more importantly than this is people who like it. And uh, probably more important than all of this for this auditory is uh, the JetBrains research. The JetBrains research is an initiative we launched in 2012. By that time, JetBrains already had a lot of projects in the area of education. Because uh, back in 2010, uh, when I joined the company, I managed to convince uh, owners, uh, Sergey Dmitriev and uh, other top people there, that we have to work closely with education, with universities, etc. And we uh, first started to have the big group of teachers who were teaching students. And then we realized that for these teachers, we need uh, to provide some activities that they can do when they are not teaching. Because if you are only teaching, you are getting behind of the cutting catch. And uh, it was in Russia. And in Europe, it is not uh, something, it is typical stuff. The professor is doing research, he is doing science, and also he is teaching students. But in Russia, by that time, it was not very often the case. And many uh, teachers or professors in their free time were software developers. They were programming or working for companies. Unfortunately, it led to them to leave the teaching soon enough. Because when you are a programmer and you are a good, you are a good programmer, uh, it, it's, there is a tendency that you become a full-time programmer. And so, so we copied this uh, scheme from the Europe universities and we created JetBrains Research. We started to pay uh, professors, the same amount of money they can earn in the university or in the company, in the university. So they don't have to switch to be a programmer just to earn money. And that was just technical goal. But it turned out uh, that if you get a very good person and set up a task for him, he be to become a researcher on scientist, he or she became very good researcher on scientist. So in uh, 10 years, uh, many of the groups in JetBrains research are uh, having publications in the very high level uh, conferences like A-Star conferences. And what is important also is that all of this um, laboratories and research group, they are not only about programming, about something important for JetBrains. We uh, have some in robotics, some in biology, etc., etc., including sociology, for instance. Unfortunately, um, unpleasant events that happened this year, and uh, because of this event, we left uh, Russia completely, and that hit our research uh, group pretty hard because some of the people didn't join us. But still, the department is pretty good. And it is uh, one of the points of collaboration with uh, Constructor University. So speaking of the collaboration, um, I should say that I know Serge Bell and uh, Stadislav Protasov, another guy from this uh, group for quite some time, since uh, 2007, I guess. And we were always talking about education and uh, universities and science and how it all should work together. And finally, this year, uh, the stars got together and we started a very good joint project, this uh, educational program in Constructor University together with JetBrains. And uh, soon enough, it became clear, clear in, for me and for the university that there are much more uh, possibilities in this collaboration than just the educational programs. So at the moment, we are talking about uh, three parts uh, collaboration. The first and basic parts are two educational programs, 
which uh, started this year. We brought uh, about 100 something students from Russia who joined this program, top level students. And I hope that they will be the scientists and staff, some of them in the university moving forward. And the next step, the next two steps is to um, project the JetBrains research to university. So we are creating, uh, in, uh, as a part of the Institute of Advanced Study, uh, the laboratories of JetBrains at uh, Constructor University, uh, which will be working in close collaboration. And the third part, which is currently developed in the initial phase, is a for-profit education. For example, uh, Kotlin uh, education, IDE training, etc. So uh, it is very, very good collaboration. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, thank you for Constructor University to, uh, to have us. That's it. Thank you very much. Andre, for the presentation, you just heard Jet Paints. It's all about people. Um, also, there's a lot happening in, uh, at Jacobs University. So here you see faces again of, uh, of faculty members and their team uh, who have been featured this year in the context of various research projects. Um, but um, we are presently expanding. Uh, we are expecting several waves of new hires. So already in 2022, we have advertised more than 10 positions, assistant professor and lecturer positions. Um, and we're expecting a second wave in 2023. So therefore, we are really expecting the largest growth in faculty here at Constructor now in the next year um, in several areas. In order to reach critical mass, we need not only more people, but also new structures. In this context, um, the Institute of Advanced Studies um, comes handy with four different units focused on quantum and advanced materials, quantum business science, machine intelligence, and computer science, as well as mathematical modeling. Um, so also in this context, um, we are expanding. Um, we are looking for uh, new researchers, also uh, uh, faculty members, um, in areas like machi machine learning for sciences, topological data analysis, econometrics, and so on. And again, we are expecting that uh, more than 10 junior and senior PIs will join us in the year 2023, very likely also from, from JetBrains. Um, so with that, I'm through. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we have to finish this session by 15.25. So unfortunately, there is no time for questions. But please approach the speakers during the coffee break if you should you have any questions. So let me introduce you to the next speaker. Uh, the insight provided by our next speaker is entitled Need for Sizable Software Teams in Science-Driven Companies. The speaker is the president and co-founder of Acronis, a world leader in cyber protection with 2,200 employees in 40 locations across the world. Um, <clears throat> Stas has created multiple global research and development centers and some of the best engineering teams in IT. Last but not least, he is a member of the board of directors of the Constructor Ecosystem and an executive board member of the Constructive University. Please let us welcome Stas. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, Andre was talking why it's important for software companies to cooperate with universities. And I do believe that uh, it's really important. Essentially, that's uh, the main source of talent for any software company. But I want to spend 15 minutes talking about uh, different angle, like uh, why software is important for researchers. And researchers in general, not only in computer science, but in physics, uh, in business education, in any education. Um, those numbers are 
taken from uh, research done in the United Kingdom. And for me, the most interesting number is actually the first one, because I was wondering who are those 8% of scientists who are not using software in their research. Uh, then I realized that this is United Kingdom, so it's quite possible. Uh, but I think people simply do not realize that you could not uh, do any kind of research without using software, even if you use just uh, Microsoft Excel. What is also interesting is that uh, almost 25% of the scientists who has some patents, they do start their own businesses. Unfortunately, there are no statistics how many of those businesses are becoming successful. I guess not that many, but uh, frankly, uh, out of, uh, say, 100 new businesses, less than three uh, can survive more than first three years. So let's, took, uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, quantum computing industry. Uh, the way you see it currently is that the most important research is done in physics. And uh, essentially what you have to, to do, you have, uh, first of all, create qubits, then you have to somehow solve the problem with error correction. And I like this picture uh, on the right, uh, because if you take a look at the way quantum computing is connected uh, <clears throat> to the real world, it's just a laptop. So the part of software is insignificant. And this is true currently, because right now, until somebody come up with a good and working quantum computer, basically the software is not important. And I'm talking about uh, ordinary uh, software as we understand it for last uh, 30 years. But when the part of quantum computing will be solved, all of a sudden that small laptop will become the major issue for anyone who would want to produce a product. The same for advanced material research. This is actually a picture I stole from one of the Rollers presentations. So as you can see, there are only three small blocks on the right which describes the Rollers role in the whole solution. The rest is uh, what physicists are doing, like uh, creating defects in crystal, uh, measuring it, and things like that. But if you take a look at the rollers as a system, it's much bigger than it looks on the previous picture. It includes some platform software, like Virtuoso, which is uh, almost 25 years old, and it includes a lot of the software yet to be written by the Rolls group. So how big that software uh, could become? Let's take a look at Amazon. You go to Amazon, you find uh, a product, you add it uh, to your uh, cart, and then you buy it in one click. From architecture standpoint, it's already more complicated. And microservices view, every single dot on that picture represents one microservice. I wanted also to put how many lines of code Amazon has. Uh, I failed to find, basically if you Google for it, it's 60 million lines of code. I do not believe it. I tried to ask my friends at Amazon and the answer was, uh, we don't know. If you will find out, let us know, please. And uh, I believe it should be somewhere around Google. And Google has uh, more than 2 billion lines of code. And even the company, which is relatively 
well, medium in size, like Acronis, we currently have 70 million lines of code in our products. And uh, there is a magic number, productivity of software developer, uh, surprisingly, but it stays the same for last 50 years, and it's about 10,000 lines of code per developer per year. I mean, definitely there are developers who produce much more code. Uh, in different areas, your productivity can differ like 10 times, maybe even 50 times. But if you take relatively big team of several hundred people, you will still end up with 10,000 lines of code. And you can imagine that you couldn't actually match like 70 million lines of code. It's uh, seven years for 1,000 uh, developers. Because a lot of the codes will be rewritten, a lot of the code will be thrown away, and things like that. So what I'm trying to say here is that this small part say in quantum computing or in advanced uh, material, when it becomes a product, all of a sudden it becomes much more in size and in the effort than the uh, innovation itself. And um, if we take a look at the typical waterfall uh, development methodology, you can see that's the number of bugs which are being introduced uh, during various phases. And uh, so essentially from the start of the project till the end, uh, till the release, you introduce between 100 and 300 or more bugs per every thousandth line of uh, code uh, which you produce. Surprisingly, and this is kind of empirical uh, knowledge which we uh, experience through our various projects, is that if you fix less than three bucks per every thousand lines, then your product uh, will have the perception among the users that it's barely working. If it's between three and seven, then it's uh, working but has issues. If it's more than seven, then it's rock solid. And so, uh, sometimes I even think that it's kind of universal constant because you can have like hundreds of uh, bugs, but if you fix m more than 10 bugs, more than seven bucks per thousand lines of code, your product is stable. And definitely waterfall is not the best uh, process and definitely uh, you could not uh, bring a lot of people and have uh, uh, your projects implemented in a day or in a year. And our industry was trying to improve it with all those agile, scrum and so on and so forth, iterative development that does bring number of bugs introduced uh, uh, probably several times lower than on the previous uh, slide, and that does uh, improve our productivity. But essentially, uh, all the fundamental numbers are still the same. And as such, what we do, we are trying to have less code. So low code uh, approaches, no code approaches, and things like that improve situation a bit, but not much. So it's still a lot of uh, work uh, involved in every software project. And there are a lot of metrics. This is, this is some metrics taken from kind of uh, Bible of software projects by Tom DeMarca. Definitely you don't need to look after all of them. Uh, especially because many of them becomes irrelevant as you do iterative development, but still uh, you do need to monitor uh, those metrics if you want your projects to end up on time and on budget at least uh, to some extent. And definitely when you build the software uh, in order to build 
sizable and good system, you do need a lot of uh, people and you do need a lot of tools. Specifically, for Andre, we put IntelliJ here. <laughs> That's not true. We, we do use it and basically, indeed, it was not bought because of, uh, uh, we know uh, JetBrains for many years, but because uh, JetBrains produce uh, uh, one of the best uh, rapid development tools in the industry. One thing to remember about software projects, uh, almost half of them fails. Uh, and basically, uh, pretty much all of them are being delayed. Uh, and I like this quote that actually out of all technology groups, uh, for business people see software teams as uh, the most unreliable, most lazy, and not delivering on its promises. You should keep it in mind because in every product you are going to build out of your research, software is going to be the biggest and most unpredictable uh, part. This is actually why in constructor group, it's so important to have university where you do the research and have software companies with people who has an experience building software for many years and to have uh, startup uh, incubators to help you overcome all those uh, potential problems related to software development. We want out of um, the university companies out of these ecosystems, we want to have an ability to produce new and successful product companies. That's the idea. That's pretty much it. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much also for being punctual. So now our last speaker, yeah? yeah? The insight provided by our last speaker is entitled Virtual Reality and Artificial Reality in Education. Yep. Um, the speaker is the founder and the chief executive officer of Mel Science. Mel Science aims to bring science to life through educational kits, combining hands-on experiments with interactive virtual reality simulations and live lessons created to help students learn in engaging ways. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much for you. being here and let's welcome. Yeah, hello everyone. Vasily Filipov. Yeah. <laughs> hello everyone. So I was doing uh, science education for the last eight years, mainly for kids, younger kids, not university level, but many insights we've learned especially about using virtual reality in, in education. I would like to share because they could be interesting. First of all, just to understand, how many of you experience virtual reality personally? Okay, and what about augmented reality? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, so like, uh, that's great. So you're a uh, well-educated uh, audience. So first of all, uh, to start, why? Yep. Uh, when we started, we didn't want to do virtual reality per se. Uh, it was about how to teach better. And I think that's area how we teach better. It's uh, where a lot of improvement should happen last 10, 20 years. And I think my feeling is that we're staying on, a, on the edge where education itself becomes science. When we measure how we teach, that we teach better and better. And one area that we definitely learned uh, it's kind of obvious in a, on a gut feeling level, but there are a lot of research done that memorizing as a technique of teaching is a very inefficient technique. When we force students to memorize uh, facts, formulas, without deep understanding why, it doesn't work well. It's inefficient, uh, it doesn't last long, and we want to replace this uh, memorizing with a deep understanding. And that's where we came to the idea that we need virtual reality and then that's how we got the experience with virtual reality that I would like to share, because especially in science, understanding things very often require seeing invisible. 
many areas in science, in chemistry, may be extreme, where almost 100% of what you see with your eyes doesn't give you any ideas what's actually happening there. So all those atoms, molecules, ions, electrons, DNAs, RNAs, students don't see them, they don't experience them, they, as a result, they memorize facts. So instead of memorizing what if I can put you inside virtual reality, so there you are there, and you can build your own atoms, you can build own molecules, you can play with them, you'll get this deep understanding, not just memorizing. And, and this whole idea of virtual reality in education, so it gives... So it's not about virtual reality itself. It's about changing technique of teaching, where instead of memorizing, we try to give deep understanding. In some areas, it can be done, in mathematics, it can be done without any virtual reality. It's just a way how to teach mathematics better, just better ways of teaching mathematics. Uh, in science, uh, I know how I want to teach uh, kids. I want to give them something to try themselves, to fail, uh, to play, to discover their, build their own knowledge. And it's possible with you know, mechanics, but it's impossible when they need to do, how they can uh, get any, their own understanding about atoms if they can't play with them. And so give them an environment where they can see the invisible, play with those things. It's kind of crucial if we want to teach them on that level. However, uh, yeah, and this works. So as I said, uh, we're in a transformation when education itself becomes a science, so we can measure things. So at New Jersey Institute of Technology, they did a proper research, education research, they compared traditional way of teaching with teaching through uh, these virtual, uh, like virtual reality enabled lessons. And yes, the outcome was, yes, it gives better education outcome. Uh, however, probably you have heard, especially many of you who experience virtual reality, that virtual reality has a lot of problems. And, and many people say it's kind of almost like that. And yeah, there are a lot of problems with virtual reality, and that's uh, go, briefly go through them, and this maybe will be the biggest uh, value in my presentation, this kind of first-hand experience of virtual reality. First of all, initially there were problems with cables. Like, I'm still connected with some cable to, to something, fortunately, uh, it's just on me, but virtual reality was a mess with cables. This problem is more or less fixed. Uh, the second problem was, how many of you who experienced virtual reality had this sickness, kind of motion sickness feeling? Yeah, do, do you know why it happened? Why I had this motion sickness in virtual reality? It's, it's the same like when a seasickness, when you're on a ship. Uh, and uh, what, happen what happens in virtual reality? Delays. Hardware is slow, software is slow, you rotate your head, and the picture rotates with some delay. And when it happens, your brain sees that the picture that you see with your eyes doesn't correspond to expectation that you have from your G sensor, uh, internal sensor. And the problem is that in wild nature, there's only one situation when that can happen. And when you're poisoned with alkaloids. It's a symptom of being poisoned with uh, neurotoxins uh, that the picture moves. Uh, and like when you're really drunken, everything moves. In, in and so your body thinks you're poisoned mistake, uh, by mistake uh, and tries to kill, uh, like clean your stomach. And that's why you feel this, uh, feel this sickness. So delays lead to a really bad experience. And that's, uh, this problem more or less fixed. The modern virtual reality devices, they don't have this uh, delays. Uh, the next problem is, for example, uh, this device, it's still what we call three degree of freedom. It means that it will control when I rotate my head, but it will not see if I just move. Uh, and again, it leads, it's not a problem it's say, uh, itself, but it leads to the fact that the picture, when I'm and I always slightly move my head, the picture doesn't really correspond to my expectation. Again, I'm poisoned, I need to clean my stomach. Uh, that's the same problem. Uh, more or less fixed with new, new generation of devices. So everything that will be sold starting from today, it's more or less uh, this problem fixed. It fully tracks your movement inside the room. Uh, the next problem is with a virtual reality device, I see two screens in front of my eyes that show me two pictures, and it doesn't matter where I focus. Versus in reality, if I look at you, 
I'm focused on you. Everything over there is probably blurred. Everything in front of me is blurred. Uh, if I look at my something, uh, reading a book, you will be blurred. Uh, that doesn't happen in, in virtual reality. It doesn't correspond to any symptom of being poisoned, so it doesn't le lead to any motion sickness, but it's still, you still feel the discomfort because it's, you don't see what you expect to see. And there are technical solutions to fix it through eye tracking, so small cameras that will see where your eyes is. So, I mean, in the end, those technical problems, they're fixable. And we're in the process of slowly fixing them. There are a few problems still ahead of us, like resolution It's one of the problems which is uh, kind of not fixed yet, because when I put a screen just in front of my eyes, it suddenly becomes not retina level, uh, so I still need more pixels. Uh, still, like, I need to use those controllers to, uh, to operate with virtual reality, which is kind of inconvenient. I want to just to use my ha uh, hands. Uh, but they're all technical problems. We'll fix them in a year, in two years. They're like problem. There is more fundamental problem, and that's why you probably heard many times that virtual reality is, uh, doesn't work well. And the problem of isolation. Like, those who experience virtual reality, you remember, you're, you're there. You're completely in another universe, uh, isolated from the world. And in many social scenarios, it's not acceptable. I can't, like many of you are looking for your phones, and that's, that's fine, that's socially acceptable. But putting your vir virtual reality glasses right now on yourself and being, we all know that you're fully isolated, it's not socially acceptable. So in many, many real case scenarios, this being fully immersed in another universe is not acceptable. And that's, I think that's the most fundamental reason why virtual reality is not a trillion dollar market, how many people hoped it, it would be. Uh, and maybe there will be a solution where what we call augmented reality. When we don't put you to, into another universe, you're still with my, your glasses, which hopefully in a couple of years will look like just normal glasses, but we augmented your reality. And so all those nice additional objects, things that we want you to show, they will be in that room in front of you, uh, which will be almost the same, all those benefits of virtual reality without these fundamental social issues on you being completely isolated. And when it's done, hopefully uh, this thing will work. And why I want it to work? Because in science education, one of the fun, like big, big problem is those things happen on different levels. For example, this one example, this uh, triangle chemistry triplet, is when I want to teach chemistry, uh, I need to first explain students what they see with their eyes, something happening, then what is happening on a molecule level, because that's where actual science happen, and then how to calculate that using formulas, mathematics, some, uh, and indeed all three are the same. They're not three different things, they're just different representation of the same nature, of the same uh, chemistry. And putting them together for children, and I have a lot of experience uh, trying to do that, it's a very hard, it's abstract concept that how to connect those things together and kids struggle. Uh, what doesn't help at all, that in schools, usually it happens, and probably in universities as well, when they first have a lecture, we explain them something, then they will have a lab next day, they will do something with their hands, and then another day, again, we'll try to understand what actually happened there, and disconnected, so disconnected in time, and it doesn't help them to put it together. So, like, what they really want, we want to make augmented reality where like, as I said, I put in this room things that you don't see, but you want to see. Like, you do something with your hands, I don't know, whatever happens. Just start from simple things, water evaporates. I want to explain you what happens when the water evaporates. There's nothing special with this. Water molecules jiggling because it's temperature, they're always moving. Some of them move faster. Some of them, like, they're connected to each other with forces, so they don't fly away, but faster, they're fast enough to fly away. And that's what happens. So, like, if children understand it on that level, and then I said, okay, those who are faster fly away, so those who stay there slower in average. So, like, you put like the smartest kids out of the classroom, the average grades will be lower. So, in the same way, average speed is lower because the fastest 
uh, flew away, so this temperature uh, bec became lower when the water evaporates. So if you un they, they understand at that level, they can easily like, operate on different levels. What do you see with your eyes, what is happening inside, how we calculate with formulas. That's build deep understanding. And that's the place where technology can help. And so how we can, look, looking forward, that's probably what will give us some improvements in education. Yeah, that's it. So if you have any questions about virtual reality, augmented reality, come to me. Come to me. I'll be happy to answer this. We personally, like, we shipped hundreds of thousands of virtual reality devices for children in education. So that, that's kind of a lot of to, to tell. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you. Uh, I would like to thank all our speakers for having shared their insights on so many different perspectives. So we do have time now for one or two questions, I would say, on, on virtual or augmented reality, because I think that the other speakers may not be here anymore. So if there is one or question yeah, regarding this last... I cannot see, actually. I can... Is... Hello? Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, he's gone, but I don't know yeah. who's going to answer the question. Okay, I'll just ask my question. Maybe it can be transferred to him. Um, regarding the isolation component of virtual reality, I was going to ask if something like integrated reality was ever tried, why people in the virtual world can actually communicate with others and maybe do not feel so much alone. I don't know. Yeah, my microphone was removed, so I'll take another one. So could you repeat the question? Oh, uh, yeah, my, my question uh, is about the isolation problem in virtual yes. reality. Uh, of course, augmented reality is something that comes closer to us, but I was going to go more into the virtual world. Uh, something that I would term, I don't know the correct term, something like integrated reality where you have people in virtual world actually interconnected with each other, and somehow they will not feel so much isolated. Is this already tried, or is No, it's tried, for sure. It's like what, uh, if you uh, read the news about Meta, that's the mo uh, biggest focus right now, how to connect people uh, into Metaverse, into virtual reality. It's just not that casual. The barrier of switching from one world to another world it's some barrier uh, versus uh, augmented reality gives you like zero transfer cost. You're, you're still here, it's just something uh, new is added. So, and those barriers, they, uh, they matter. So the easier it's for you, the more people will use it. So like, uh, so what you said, yes, it works. It's better than without, but it's not as good as having uh, additional things in our, or is existing, in our world? existing world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vasily Filipov. So we continue our program by discussing quantum. And I'm happy to announce our experts. We have Mikhail Lukin. He will join us online. Furthermore, Renato Rena. He will participate on site. And Tommaso Calarco will join us online as well. And coming up, we're going to connect to Boston. Yeah, We're going to jump overseas to my colleague, um, Carl Beterson. He will take over from here, and we will check if Carl can hear us. We will see him on the screen. Carl, can you hear me? We can hear you, Natalie. Thank oh, you so much. This is amazing. Carl, how are you? Doing fantastic. Happy to be here today. So thank you, Carl, for being here um, digitally. And I will leave the stage to you if this is all right. Sounds good to me. Thank you so much. And a special thank you to everyone showing up in Bremen today, uh, my friends from Quieta Computers, and of course, the 3,000 of you who are signing on online to listen to this important information, important data coming in. We are broadcasting live from Quieta computing today. Uh, fun fact, we're actually just minutes away from MIT and Harvard University, literally right down the street. 
Querida Computing is the maker of advanced quantum computers that leverage neutral atoms. And right in front of me, I have the whole team of Querida Computing. That's why you have the good seats, because this is your building. Thank you for coming. And what they're doing is they're pushing the boundaries of what these computers and what the, this technology can do in the industry. Let me say that again. They are pushing the boundaries. In fact, in some cases, redefining what those boundaries are. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Now, what does all that mean? I have no idea. But luckily, we've invited someone who does know. He's the co-founder of Quera Computing. He's a professor of physics at Harvard University. And he's going to walk you through his keynote on the new frontier of quantum information and quantum computing. And with that, my distinct privilege to introduce to the stage Professor Mikhail Lukin. Professor, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. So do you guys see my slides, I hope? So it is my distinct pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank uh, uh, the organizers for invitation, also for the kind introduction. So um, this audience uh, is no doubt uh, heard by now multiple times about this uh, idea or something which is going on, uh, which is sometimes called quantum revolution. So in fact, it's very hard now to avoid hearing about it. So uh, almost daily in the news, we uh, see uh, some new development uh, over last year, three companies uh, uh, whose core business is quantum computing went uh, public. Uh, people are thinking about building the entire quantum cities. So what is it about? Uh, it is uh, about the fact that information, its acquisition, storage, transmission, and proce processing is fundamentally rooted in physics. And uh, the progress uh, in technology indicated already a few years ago that ultimate elements of sensors, processors, and trans, uh, transmitters will eventually become of quantum size. So this audience probably does not need a reminder that you know for several decades, uh, technology have been driven uh, by uh, by the Moore's law, and people recognized already um, maybe a couple decades ago that uh, there will be a time when the size of the transistor will become comparable to the scale of a single atom. Now, uh, you all know that you know people are very creative, and so whereas you know now we would be nominally at the end of this Moore's law. I mean, there has been a lot of developments, you know, basically figuring the ways to still kind of scale and, and improve um, the uh, performance of the classical processors. Nevertheless, you know, we are, you know, closing this gap where basically we can no longer consider a transistor as a classical device, as a classical system. And this is what people started thinking about already almost 40 years ago. And then they realized that in principle, single atoms uh, or single uh, 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 elementary particles could in principle be used as memory as, and quantum processors. So indeed, the single atoms, electrons, nuclei, and photons uh, can acquire, carry, store, and process quantum information. Uh, so why is this special? So the reason is that uh, at the level of these uh, fundamental particles in the microscopic world, um, uh, the physics uh, of systems and devices is, is governed by something which is called quantum mechanics. Uh, this quantum world is actually very strange and very weird in many ways. So, for example, uh, quantum particles can be in multiple different states or different places at once. So that's the idea of the quantum superposition, uh, as indicated um, uh, uh, on the left plot here. 
Uh, this is not something that we are, you know, used to in a, a common everyday life. Nevertheless, through almost 100 years of experimentations, we actually know for sure that the particles at a microscopic level can, can have these weird properties. Moreover, if this uh, superposition states is delocalized in space, it leads to something which is called quantum entanglement, quantum correlations, which can show up at a distance between uh, when particles, for example, are here in Boston and uh, uh, in Bremen at the same time. So uh, the, this quantum entanglement is something which really perplexed even the founding fathers of quantum mechanics. Nevertheless, we by now know that it's a real physical phenomenon. So to get you kind of an illustration why this actually uh, quantum frontier is exciting scientifically, I would like to point out that there is more than 100 years worth of Nobel Prizes uh, given in the field. So starting from Einstein and Bohr uh, uh, in uh, 1922 to 2022, the Nobel Prizes uh, of this year, um, uh, given by Alana Speer, Anton Zeilinger, and John Clauser. Now, how is this uh, superposition and entanglement, how are these properties uh, are relevant to what we are talking today to computers and information processing? So uh, quantum computer is actually a device which can uh, potentially harness this idea of superposition to process information in a fundamentally different way. Uh, and it's fundamentally different from every computer which has existed up to date. And so in the quantum computer, bits of information are replaced by quantum bits, which exploits this effect, superposition and entanglement. And when used correctly, the emergent um, uh, phenomena, which is called quantum parallelism, can solve some problems exponentially faster than a classical computer ever could. The central element I'd like to emphasize again is the uh, idea of replacing a bit of information, the zero and one, which store the information in every uh, classical uh, electronic gadget uh, by uh, this um, idea uh, of the quantum bit, which can be in a superposition of both zero and one at once. And um, uh, this is very special. This is what gives quantum computers uh, their power. So to indicate the um, power of quantum uh, superposition, I would like to consider just one example. Consider uh, individually controlled single atoms uh, in which you encode these uh, quantum bits, these superpositions of zero and one. So it turns out, and this you know uh, 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 is a conceptually simple device, but also as you will see in a minute, quite realistic. So uh, it turns out that these individually controlled atoms can store quantum bits uh, of information. Uh, but then if you start increasing the size of this uh, register, you very quickly come to the point which is actually really quite astonishing. And uh, in fact, if you just have 300 atoms with, to store 300 qubits, so the using this idea of quantum superposition, it is possible to, uh, in principle, sim simultaneously store and evaluate more solutions than the number of particles in the entire uh, universe. So that's the basis and that's the motivation to study and build quantum computers. Uh, the question is, how can quantum computers change our world and affect everyday lives? The answer to this question, I should say right away, is currently unknown because this is new and emerging uh, uh, technology. But one can divide all problems which uh, quantum computers can potentially tackle into uh, two uh, different categories. Some are difficult problems that are currently solved by conventional computers, but they are solved in a kind of using expensive brute force methods, which are fundamentally inefficient. And another uh, class is what I would call impossible problems, problems which are really not possible to solve you know, any existing technology. Admittedly, this uh, is not 
the problems that you know uh, the computation that you know is uh, something that you know you have to do kind of uh, every time you log on your uh, uh, internet uh, account or use your cell phone. But there are many of these problems um, around the world which you know potentially have a great impact for both you know science, technology, and society. So here are some examples: understanding and designing complex quantum materials. Uh, this problem is fundamentally quantum mechanical. Solving it classically is very expensive, very inefficient. Uh, understanding chemical structure and uh, controlling chemical reaction is also fundamentally quantum mechanical problem, which is actually very hard to solve classically. Um, uh, optimizing uh, 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 solutions for networks, logistics, uh, finance is another example of the very hard um, uh, 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 problem, which kind of borders between this, you know, kind of hard uh, and impossible. But then there are impossible problems, which something like factoring, uh, uh, sampling, uh, accelerating artificial intelligence. And, you know, to be honest, you know, in truth, we really do not know now what other problems exist, which are very hard, you know, or impossible to solve currently, which quantum computers uh, can potentially solve. So to uh, address these problems, uh, there are different approaches uh, which are currently being explored. Some involve something which is called programmable quantum simulators. So these are machines which you can program and you can basically kind of run, you know, uh, quantum evolution. And the other uh, kind is uh, something uni called universal quantum computers. I will give some examples of both of these in the following. So I would like to turn now to the question of building quantum machines. And uh, uh, this is a quote from one of the pioneers in the field, uh, Richard Feynman, who about 40 years ago, started musing about ideas of ever building, you know, something like a, you know, programmable quantum simulator or quantum computer. And uh, he thought about replacing, you know, um, uh, the uh, single transistor, which at the time had about 10 to the 11th atom by a single atom. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, such a nonsense is very entertaining to professors like me. And I hope you will find it interesting uh, and entertaining also. Fast forward uh, uh, 40 years, there are now a wide variety of platforms which are being explored. Uh, people using charged ions, neutral atoms, superconducting qubits, photons, defects, and solids. And the frontier of the field now is addressing something uh, which is uh, I, uh, sometimes called, you know, ultimate quantum rivalry. So this can be understood in different ways. You know, you can th think about this as a competition between different platforms or sometimes even between different countries, but actually it's much more fundamental. So it's competition between two forces of nature uh, one is a force of controllability, and another one is a force of scalability. Controllability means that you basically have to really change, you know, and control atoms one at a time while preserving their quantum mechanical properties. And scalability, you need many, many uh, of those atoms or, or, or qubits, um, uh, if you want. So these kind of uh, forces are at play. This uh, competition between these two forces are at play in many areas of human activities. So, for example, if you have a, an organization which has, you know, a number of, you know, smart, you know, people like a PhD physicist, you know, and there are many of them, it's by definition becomes difficult to, to control. But, uh, but, uh, but, you know, but in 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 this quantum mechanics, you know, what we are at against this frontier is exactly this competition between these two forces. So the kind of state of the art and the current frontier is something which I will uh, sometimes call the era of quantum discovery, in which uh, we can use machines uh, to perform, you know, quantum machines to perform tasks that classical computers can just not perform. And uh, that typically involves controlling over 100 uh, qubit uh, systems. And we use these machines to both implement and test uh, some useful algorithms and explore new applications. And we also use these machines to figure out ways how to build bigger and better 
uh, quantum machines. Um, I'd like to now focus on uh, one specific approach towards building quantum machines, and this is something that my lab at Harvard and also Quera Computing is pursuing. And uh, it's actually the approach in some way which also have been pioneered by Richard Feynman. So um, uh, kind of early on, he started thinking about, in principle, making a computing devices in which the numbers are represented by the row of atoms, if each atom in uh, I were of two states, zero and one. Uh, and then uh, you turn on quantum evolution and ones move around, zeros move around, and finally a, a certain bunch of atoms is being measured. So he thought at the time nothing could be more elegant. Fast forward 40 years ago. Uh, uh, these are the kinds of devices which we actually are now can implement um, and experiment with in our lab. In particular, uh, about five years ago, uh, we uh, built um, a device for the first time. It was kind of the largest uh, 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 system in which we could control 50 uh, over 50 um, uh, single atoms. So what you see here are the images of individual atoms, so which uh, basically are positioned at will in a vacuum. Uh, cell using uh, uh, beams of lights, using something which is called optical tweezers. And then we encode quantum information in the states, in internal states of these atoms. And then we can actually control it by just uh, shining laser beams to switch these zeros and ones, you know, much like the kind of the original idea or dream of Feynman. In particular, what we do is we do quantum logic by switching atomic states uh, into the so-called Rydberg states, uh, where the atoms can talk to each other, they can interact with each other, and this way they we can really execute you know, quantum logic operations. The state of the art um, uh, 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 right now is uh, control over about 200 uh, 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 atomic uh, individual uh, uh, atomic uh, qubits. So here are the kinds of uh, lattice geometries which one can produce. So these are literally kind of artificial uh, uh, two-dimensional materials, you know, where you can basically write, you know, you have a, essentially an, you know, a canvas in which you can draw, you can, you know, write, you know, you can position the atoms um, at will. And uh, in fact, you know, you don't need to create an ordered material. What you can do, you can, for example, you know, program the array, atom array that uh, you can uh, uh, desire and then press a button and here comes uh, uh, the, the pattern what you want. So what you see here are all pictures of individual atoms, single atoms which can store uh, qubits. And then what we do by shining lasers of them, we can actually make connections, we can basically, you know, draw the logic operations, the logic circuits, uh, 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 and basically that way uh, perform quantum computation. So this is uh, the system which actually have been realized uh, in our Harvard lab uh, uh, slightly over two years ago. And uh, those last two years have been actually quite special, I would say. Uh, and that we could really kind of play with the system to explore a wide variety of different uh, scientific avenues. We explore different uh, exotic states of matter, exotic phases of matter. We push the system far away from equilibrium and watch how it evolves, how, uh, for example, you know, the entanglement is created in the system. So I will talk a little bit today about realizing um, uh, uh, topological spin liquid. This is a state of matter which have been predicted over 50 years ago and have not been seen in a lab until last year. Um, and I'll talk also a little bit about, you know, kind of more practical things like accelerating combinatorial optimization and also thinking about the future, building kind of universal error-corrected quantum machine. So one big uh, development of the past uh, month have been that, uh, um, uh, uh, in our startup company here in this building, uh, the um, the first uh, uh, quantum machine has been built such that it actually can be hooked to the cloud. And in fact, it became publicly available uh, on November 1st. So I'll give you now a little bit of the kind of 
you know, insight into all of these exciting directions. So the first is um, uh, the idea of a kind of understanding and designing new quantum materials. And uh, here, uh, uh, the example is uh, something which is called topological quantum material. So topological quantum matter is the idea which has been um, postulated uh, by Phil Anderson, a famous uh, condensed matter physicist who was at Bell Lab at the time. And uh, he basically uh, postulated that there might exist some special uh, states uh, of matter where basically the uh, properties of the system uh, is governed by the system's topology. So the topology, as uh, hopefully many of you know, is something is a branch of mathematics, which kind of allows one to classify objects by their shapes. So for example, from the point of view of topology, a coffee cup and a donut is a, is a single thing. And while initially this idea was considered kind of very exotic, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, you know, hypothetical over the last, you know, 40 or so years, these topological materials became really a mainstream of uh, material science research. And the idea is these topological materials have some intrinsic robustness. So you really need to cut this, you know, uh, donut to convert it, for example, into a donut hole, you cannot continuously uh, um, uh, deform it. Moreover, about 20 years ago, uh, people realized that these ideas of topology can be used to design uh, uh, potentially a robust quantum bits and build, you know, full tolerant quantum uh, computers. And in fact, the topological quantum computing is the basis for the entire research program uh, of the uh, Microsoft uh, quantum uh, team. Despite all of these remarkable uh, developments, uh, up to now, up until last year, uh, there was no single experiment in a condensed matter system and a real material system, which you know provided an experimental evidence for existence of such topological uh, uh, matter. And as actually uh, the situation has changed uh, about a year ago, we used this uh, programmable quantum simulator, you know, involving 219 qubits to actually build this kind of state. Uh, which actually is quite exotic. So it is a superposition of the state where, you know, basically atoms are arranged in a very different uh, ways, you know. So basically, if you look at these uh, plots, you don't see an obvious order. So this order really is encompassed in systems topology. It was really quite exciting time in this, um, uh, in this uh, uh, field. So, uh, this picture is, um, I, I believe, uh, is a scientific American cover from, you know, maybe a decade or so ago. I'm sure that the artist who drew this, you know, thought that physicists, you know, became completely crazy. You know, they're trying to do these kind of knots and, you know, but things like this can now be really kind of realized and tested um, in the lab and they give unprecedented insights into topological meta. So this the programmable quantum simulator emerges as a real special tool, which is complementary to and in some way more powerful than both analytical and numerical, classical numerical simula uh, simulations. And there are many kind of exciting potential applications right, ranging from simulating lattice gauge theory to insights into developing new uh, practical topological materials and also exploring this idea of topological quantum computing. The second example I would like to give involves this uh, application of this programmable quantum machines to optimization. So um, um, uh, combinatorial optimization uh, problems uh, are very important for many uh, different uh, uh, areas of uh, technology. Uh, one specific example of the uh, this kind of network optimization involves a problem called maximum independent set so what you see here is a graph you know where the task the problem is to basically color as many uh, nodes in this graph as possible but you will not but that statement of the problem is you're not able you should not be able to to color the nodes which are connected by the link so that's this problem is called maximum independent set so it's an example of an p hard problem and it has many practical applications in logistics, networking, finance, and, and things like this. 
So uh, the big development of this year is that we were able to actually very efficiently encode this problem into this Atom Array platform and actually uh, through the closed loop optimization uh, uh, procedure explore if we can use the quantum machine as a kind of accelerator to the to the conventional classical methods. And in fact, uh, in this work, we for the first time observed uh, evidence for the super linear uh, speed up um, uh, for the kind of real world kind of practical uh, uh, problem. So here are some, uh, for those of you interested, here are some details. So we focused on something which is called unit disk graph, where basically nodes are connected within, which are within certain separation uh, uh, distance between each other. And then uh, using um, Atom Array platform, we were able to explore uh, basically uh, graphs, you know, using systems from about 70 to uh, almost 300 uh, qubits. And what we found, for example, is that even for the similar size of the graph, sometimes the problem hardness, you know, it really differs by orders of magnitude. And uh, focusing on, in particular, hardness instances, we were able to uh, uh, see a um, uh, uh, speed up uh, uh, when we go in the regime of the so-called deep circuit. So basically we need to evolve quantum system for long enough time that the quantum system can basically explore the entire graph. So uh, doing that really kind of required reaching kind of the product of number of qubits towards surface uh, depth, which are actually uh, kind of couple of orders of magnitude larger than those which are accessible with different platforms. And it really kind of indicates, you know, the power of this programmable quantum simulator approach. And, um, you know, also a potential for using the system to solve this kind of real world problem. So the big challenge here is now to scale up, to go to larger systems, you know, involving hopefully, you know, thousands of atoms, but also kind of, you know, improving the, um, uh, the quantumness of the system, reducing the errors. And this uh, is something that you know brings me to this last example, uh, where you know uh, uh, problems like factoring you know require you know large systems involving thousands of qubits and also very deep circuits, so that you can actually implement many 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 gates. And the key challenge there is fighting with errors. So uh, one uh, other big development from this last year has been uh, a realization of a new architecture, which actually allows you to very efficiently accomplish this goal. In this architecture, uh, what uh, we do is we use um, our atom array as a kind of a living uh, organism. So in the sense that the connectivity and the position of the qubits changes as the quantum evolution uh, uh, proceeds. This is very special because in all existing quantum or classical hardware platforms, basically the connectivity is fixed at the point where you design the your chip, where you actually introduce these connections. And you know, after that, there is nothing you can do. This is different in our approach. What we can do, we can, you know, create an atom array, you know, execute some logic operations, then reconfigure this array without losing quantum information and then proceed. Uh, in this uh, way. So as an example, what I'd like to uh, illustrate here is realization of uh, something what's called topological quantum error correcting code. So it's actually related to the spin liquid example, which I uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, but, you know, kind of, you know, what is it? What is quantum error correction? So basically, in the quantum error correction, what you do, you use redundant encoding. You use several physical qubits to encode uh, a single logical qubit. And uh, basically what uh, you you want to do, you want to use this logical qubits as a building block of fault tolerant quantum uh, computer. And the way how you correct the errors, you measure something which is called stabilizer. You do basically collective measurements on this grid of the physical qubit to basically find out if the error occurred and if that occurred to correct it. So, uh, but, you know, and there is, it's connected to this idea of topology. So if you have something, for example, on a torus here, 
you know, this is, you know, uh, basically this qubit in this case is protected by this topology of the torus. But you'd say, well, wait a second. So you have two dimensional system, you know, how can you implement this kind of, you know, to, uh, you know, toric code, which lives on a torus? That seems hard. Well, it turns out it is possible to do it. And the approach is actually kind of reminiscent to something which, you know, 20 years ago, everyone knew about. Uh, uh, at the time, there was magnetic hard drives and there was a, you know, kind of essentially a magnetic, you know, head, which you sort of, you know, you could use to kind of move around your system to read out the information. So in fact, what we implemented, we implemented this kind of, you know, magnetic, you know, head, but instead of a classical uh, readout element, what we did is we actually stored qubits in this head and by moving them around, we were able to actually perform this, uh, this uh, error correction. So in fact, in our case, uh, 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 eight qubits, uh, have been part of this head. And what you see is that they are moved around and basically kind of, you know, uh, each uh, red circle is the quantum gate, quantum logic operation. And then they are moved across all the system to complete this torus. And then uh, we kind of uh, move them into a readout zone. So we're actually very excited uh, about that because it really opens a path towards uh, really trying to implement um, uh, algorithms with logical qubits, you know, with kind of built-in fault tolerance, uh, potentially at large scale and kind of really try, start using uh, this kind of algorithmic qubits for the applications. So I maybe have uh, two more minutes and I cannot uh, uh, leave the stage without mentioning another very exciting development. So Quera Computing, a startup company, which uh, was started uh, out of our uh, labs at Harvard and MIT in 2018, has by now almost 50 employees. And um, uh, uh, the mission of Quora Computing is to accelerate uh, application development, also interfacing with potential customers via two approaches. One is by partnering and basically working on core design of algorithms of the type, for example, I showed for the maximum independent set. But another one is by basically providing a broad access, uh, easy access to this quantum computing devices. And you know, this is actually has been sort of the development uh, of November. In fact, on November 1st, Aquila, the Quera's first generation machine became um, available uh, on the uh, uh, on a bracket, AWS Cloud. So it was a little bit of hello world moment. So what you see here are pictures of actual uh, a central element of the Quera machine, as well as this uh, 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 graphs which one could create. So it's very similar to the to these graphs which you have uh, 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 seen uh, before. So uh, this uh, machine uh, can is relatively easy to program. So in fact, you know you can. Uh, describe systems geometry, you can define the pulses, kind of, you know, how you excite, how you make the connectivity and make the atoms interact. And then basically, you know, you can run your um, algorithm and analyze your results. And it's actually aided by the, uh, by the software kind of interface uh, blockade, which has been developed uh, here. It's actually, interestingly, it's a little bit too advanced to integrate right away for, with the AWS circuit, but maybe this will will change, you know, um, in, in, in future. So the big development, this is at the first, you know, 100, you know, plus qubit machine, which really operate, operates in this kind of new regime of quantum discovery. You can really run these machines to actually, uh, you know, discover new things, you know, in a way, you know, I think about it as a kind of a small uh, uh, linear hydron collider, you know, it's, and it's kind of an amazing feat that, you know, that uh, the experiment, which has been, you know, done just two years ago and published in Nature, has been now sort of brought to the uh, customers, to the to the general um, uh, uh, access. And you know, we are uh, uh, growing. We are looking for new team members, looking for new past partners, you know, customers and collaborators. So I think I'm closing. Uh, uh, here and you know, I hope I convinced you that quantum science and engineering is exciting interdisciplinary field. 
uh, we are entering this era of quantum discovery where we can use quantum machines for scientific applications and also on the cups of what's called quantum industry where new revolutionary potential applications and uh, perhaps even products can be uh, foreseen so with that i'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, you know when we are not working we also uh, have some games to play thank you thank you we're gonna open it up for some I assume that applause was for him and not me. Mm -hmm. A little hurtful. Um, we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, I did want to start you off. Uh, we have um, the team in Bremen who are going to ask the audience. We have an online chat with the people monitoring those questions. First question that came in for you, how soon do you think quantum computers become our new today, the new norm? So uh, that's a very good question. So. Uh, I personally don't think that quantum computers will replace classical computers. So the best way to think about them as a kind of accelerators. And uh, in some way, you know, in the world of science, they are already kind of a norm. So as I already mentioned, we can we actually have, even in our lab, we made some, you know, discoveries, we found, we found things which you know, have not been predicted. And, you know, this has really stimulated new fields of research. Um, uh, I like to think about, you know, quantum computer development as a kind of almost in some way parallel to classical computer development. So the first applications of classical computers were purely scientific, you know, and, you know, people could not predict that every one of us will be carrying, you know, a computer in our, uh, pocket. So, uh, and we are definitely, you know, like at the point with quantum computers where they are already useful for science. If, when, and how they'll make a transition into our everyday life gadgets, I would say that remains to be seen. This is really unclear. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll open it up to our friends in Bremen. Do you have any questions from the audience? Thank you. We don't have any questions. Unfortunately, we don't have the time. We're going to go, we're going to jump right into our next speaker. But thank you so much, Boston. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Mikhail. Have a lovely thank day. And thank here's an exciting update we just received on our online audience. The, the, the audience is growing and growing. So we've got a total on YouTube about 1,994 and LinkedIn total is 571. So many people all over the globe joining us. So thank you so much for joining us. And moreover, our online audience is absolutely delighted about our speakers. So thanks also to our speakers. Thank you very much. So you are making an impressive job out there to all the speakers here and Insights in Technology Conference 2022. So I have to leave very soon, unfortunately. So here's a brief look, outlook on what is going to happen. So we have Tommaso Calarco, who will join us on site after our next speaker. And furthermore, after the lunch break, Philip Rösler is going to join us here. So um, stick by and um, yeah, enjoy your time here at the conference. So. Our next guest on this session, he will join us online as well, as you can already see. Renato Rena, he will give you an insight on quantum information perspective on black holes. Renato, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but I changed the title on short notice and it will be about quantum cryptography now. I hope that's okay. I think this is absolutely all right. So I will leave the stage to you. And I will say bye-bye. Thank you for your trust. Thank you to the whole Constructed team and everyone who joined us on-site and online. Have a lovely day or evening. Bye-bye. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I hope the screen sharing works. So I would like to talk about quantum cryptography, as I said. Um, we are also doing research on black holes. 
but I thought for the audience here, it may be interesting to see something that connects to applications on a kind of shorter time scale. And that's the case for that type of work we are doing. So I will um, tell you a little bit about the ultimate physical limits of um, privacy. So what's the question that um, bothers us? Um, you know that, or you have just heard from you know, looking that quantum technology is developing very fast. The question is now, do our secrets remain secret in the future? So in a world where quantum technology takes over, is it possible to still encrypt messages in such a way that we can be sure that they remain secret over a long time scale? Now, there are the maybe most important point to understand when one talks about this question is that there are really two sides of the story, so to speak. As every technology can be used, quantum technology can be used in a kind of good way or in a bad way. And what is good or bad, of course, depends on the angle you're taking and other type of applications you have in mind. So if one takes a more neutral perspective, one could say that either the quantum technology can be used to read secrets, things that should be secret. And I will first talk a little bit about that, but that will be more a motivation for the second part, which is really our research topic, which we are pushing a lot. That is how we can then again make use of quantum technology to actually hide secrets in a way that surpasses everything we have seen before. So when, when you use a computer um, for online banking, for communicating and so on, there is always some cryptography running in the background. And many times this cryptography is based on public keys. And um, so what is public key cryptography? I, I suppose this is known um, to a large part of the audience. I'll just um, try to briefly remember, remind you of a key aspect. So the security of a of a cryptographic scheme, so, as I said, for example, if we buy something in an online shop, is a security that is always relative to certain problems that we think are very hard to solve. So what does this mean? This means that if this problem, which is assumed to be hard, can actually be solved by someone who is clever enough, then the security of that scheme is broken. So our online transactions would no longer be safe. Concretely, the type of problems that um, cryptography is based on are problems from number theory. And one problem, which is actually an easy problem, is to multiply numbers. So you can ask yourself, can you, um, for example, or how much time would it take you to carry out the multiplication that you see here on the screen? Um, this is just um, something you could do using techniques one learns in primary school, and it probably takes some time, but I'm sure most of um, almost everyone should be able to do that um, without, within a few minutes um, if one focuses a little bit on that. And so one would be able to get that result. However, there are calculations which are even for my laptop or maybe even a supercomputer very hard to carry out. And this is, for example, the opposite of this calculation. So suppose I give you that product and ask you what is what are the two factors in order to figure this out, it would take you not only years, but probably decades, or maybe even the whole lifetime of the universe. I mean, depending on how large this number is and how fast computing power develops. Now, of course, I started it from the other way around, so I knew um, which factors I had. Now, the point is that if someone finds a method to, um, given the number on the right-hand side, find the two factors that multiplied gives you that number, that person would be able to break a large part of today's crypto systems. Many, um, and um, I think that's a rather general statement. Um, that's what um, pu so-called public key cryptographic systems use, and they are basically implemented almost everywhere. Now, the other important point is quantum computers will ultimately be able to solve exactly that problem. So that's um, well known. That's um, known as the Shore factoring algorithm. This is basically a software that we can run on future quantum computers that solves this problem and therefore um, can break these public key crypto systems that we are using today. So the question is now, is this already a danger now? And, and 
what one um, should consider here is that at the end, whether or not we we can run this compute or this software depends on how many qubits we can operate. We have just heard in the talk before that um, the number of qubits we can control is progressing very fast. This is a very rough sketch on what some people who are working on this would believe. Like um, depending, it's at the end a matter of time. And the red area here is the area that um, I would call the dangerous area in terms of cryptography. So once you reach um, this region where you have of the order of one million qubits, then um, I mean here I talk, I'm talking about physical qubits just to keep this um, clear for those for the experts here. So once you have this order of qubit, you can also generate enough, um, hopefully so-called logical qubits, and therefore run Shor's factoring algorithm. So at the end, the question is, when do we reach um, the technology that allows us to put um, of the order of one million qubits into a machine and operate them coherently? Now, um, the progress, as I said, is very fast. As an example, I show you here another um, roadmap, the, the one from IBM, and you see that until already today, and there were just announcements very recently, they reached also the um, boundary of around 1,000 qubits. So at the end, one could say it's really just a matter of time. So it's a matter of time until our cryptographic schemes will be broken, the ones we are using today. So that's basically the, the first answer to the question I asked. So the question was, can we keep our secrets secret in a world where quantum technology is advanced? And the answer is, the messages that we are encrypting now, today, that we are using and so on in encrypted systems that um, are actually widespread everywhere, we should not count on them still being secret in the year 2040, for example. I mean, that's, of course, an estimate. But one should be aware of the fact that this is really finite. Whatever you encode now will at some point be read, or at least there's the possibility for it to be read. Now, let me move to um, actually the main um, part that really makes us excited, namely that there is, in a sense, a very elegant solution to this problem, at least from a theoretical perspective. If you look at it from an experimental perspective, it's um, maybe also an elegant solution, but also a very expensive one at least at the moment, and this is quantum cryptography. So here on, it's kind of the opposite. We are now using quantum technology for those who, who want to encode secrets. And, and that's something that is rather different from quantum computing in terms of the concrete abilities you need. For example, what you would need is to um, not, not necessarily to store qubits, but what you need is to transmit qubits over large distances. And this you may do, for example, via an optical fiber or via satellites. And both of them is considered today, and there are corresponding experiments. So let me first briefly explain to you what quantum cryptography really is. How do we encode secrets? What are the principles behind that? So the most important maybe take home message of that is that in quantum cryptography, secrecy is no longer based on the hardness of certain problems. This means that it's doesn't matter whether computational power makes progress, whether someone invents in the future a super quantum computer, something that goes beyond whatever we know today. Quantum cryptography is completely based on the laws of physics and therefore, in a sense, completely stable. This, the laws of physics will not change. We can make as much progress as we like technologically. The laws of physics will remain. And therefore, um, it has the potential to provide what we call everlasting security. So an, a message encoded today will keep secret forever. What is this space on? So what are these physical laws? The physical laws um, that are behind that is, um, are the laws of quantum mechanics. And there is one particular phenomenon, which is called a quantum entanglement, that is probably also known to um, several of you, which um, is something that is in a sense, the key, a key feature of quantum physics. And for the purpose of quantum cryptography, you just need to know two basic facts about quantum entanglement. The first fact is that you should think of quantum entanglement as something like an invisible band that is spanned between two quantum systems. So for example, these two quantum systems could just be two 
ions or photons or some particles that you control. And this band is something that is not visible, but that um, is there in the description and dictates the behavior of these particles. So what does this band ensure? So this band has um, two crucial properties. First of all, it makes sure that whenever we, mani we manipulate one of the two particles, for example, the one on the left, and measure something. So, for example, we measure how fast this particle is and, and in which direction it moves or in which direction it points, in a sense. Then the other particle, the right, the one on the right, will have show exactly the same behavior. So it's like an invisible connection that imitates and they're like twins. The other important property of this band is that you can verify whether it's there by doing experiments on the two particles individually. So you can actually, in a sense, um, check whether it's present and whether it has its full functionality. And these are two things. So it, the band invisibly connects these two particles. And how this works now um, is not so relevant. You just have to accept this as a physical law. So this is something that can be tested. What's now the idea for cryptography? The idea is now that if two parties, let's say Alice and Bob, um, want to communicate, they each um, and try to get hold of such a particle. So they somehow distribute two particles, um, these two parties, so that Alice holds one and Bob the other in such a way that they are connected. So how is this done in practice? In practice, this would mean that Alice prepares two particles in such a way, entangles them, so it, she creates this band and sends one particle off to Bob. And then um, they are in this situation here. Now, um, if Alice measured the direction of the particle and would see that it's up, then the same would be true for Bob's particle. If Alice would find that the direction is down, the same would be true for Bob's particles. So that's what I said before. The particles behave always the same. But whether it's up or down is actually completely random and unpredictable. So someone who doesn't hold one of these particles will not know whether it's up or down. And this is now exactly the feature that you're using for cryptography. So you can say that um, generating these particles and then checking whether they're up or down will deliver a bit to Alice. You can say up means zero, down means one. And so Alice and Bob will get exactly the same bits. But because this band just connects Alice and Bob's particles and nothing else, no one else will be able to um, see that value. So Alice and Bob get somehow a secret string of bits which they can use as a key. And what is a key? A key is a key for cryptography is basically just a, a, se a sequence of zeros and ones that only the two parties who want to communicate know and no one else. Now, once they have such a sequence, they, they can communicate in a perfectly secure way. There is our cryptographic schemes, like for example, the so-called one-time path encryption. The point is you need one key bit per message bit. So you need to generate these um, entangled pairs of particles at a very high rate in order to be able to communicate. Now you can ask how how can Alice and Bob actually really share or, or create this band between them? I mean, they can, as I just described, maybe by Alice sending um, one, I mean, creating the, the band and then send one particle to Bob, but of course there may be an adversary in the line. So the question is, how can Alice and Bob check whether this band is still there. And as I said, one other property of this band is that it can be certified. So what does this, this mean? If you can imagine this, like Alice is touching her particle and changing it a little bit, and then Bob should see exactly the corresponding behavior on his side. If now an adversary was in between, whom I call Eve, then this behavior on Bob would not no longer match. So if, if there's someone in the middle who would try to cap, capture um, that band, he would break this connection. And when Alice now checks, um, does applies the test and Bob checks whether his particle behaves accordingly, this will not be the case and they will detect the intruder and um, restart their communication. So that's already the principle. So the bottom line of this is quantum mechanics, the laws of quantum mechanics allow us basically to distribute um, entanglement, which is then a, a kind of resource to draw key or to draw secret keys. And this distribution of entanglement usually goes via um, optical communication. 
So as I said before, an optical fiber or a satellite. Now, um, after talking about the principle, of course, it's now interesting to see where we stand technologically. Can we really apply this technique? And there is already there are commercial um, products available. However, there's still a lot of development going on. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about what the status is. So one thing that is kind of remarkable is the progress that has been made, in particular in China, they have already built up a quantum secured communication network. You see here um, a map. The yellow part is in planning. That's not yet ex existing. And um, the red part is some more close plan. The green part is under construction and the blue part already exists. So they have a very um, ambitious program to basically allow quantum secured and therefore um, completely secure communication within China. And some of these, I think most of the links are by optical fibers. However, China has all so made a lot of progress in satellite communication, or satellite quantum communication. Now, one problem that arises, and this is one of the major problems we are facing today in quantum cryptography, is that if you buy a quantum cryptographic device, you get something like what you see on the screen. You get a very complicated device. And as a customer, you may ask yourself, how can you verify that this is actually secure? because um, this is just a, a, a mess of optical elements and um, it it should be somehow um, there should be means to uh, to check that they are working correctly because otherwise you have to completely trust the manufacturer that everything is fine and that would be probably problematic in practice. Now there is a new concept that has been developed over the past years and which we are pushing a lot which is called device independent cryptography. So here the idea is that um, this, uh, these um, properties of entangled particles are kind of checked on a level which at the end only involves classical computing. So you just need to trust the classical data processing and you can still verify that everything in between, including all the optical devices, all the laser and so on, will be correct. So if, in a sense, this is like a self-certifying system, if one of the lasers would not operate correctly or one of the detectors would do something wrong, you would notice that automatically. So any possible security breach would be noticed. However, um, there is a, um, a challenge that comes with that. You need extremely high quality communication between the two parties because you need to um, distribute these entangled particles in such a way that nothing gets lost in the meantime and that's today only possible under lab conditions you see here a picture of the lab here at ETH Zurich by um, the group of Andreas Walraff where they um, managed to distribute such entanglement over um, now a distance of actually the latest experiment they do is around 30 meters so this is still um, in the um, kind of early phase of development. However, once you achieve that, you can basically um, guarantee security almost independently of the hardware. And there has been further progress to actually um, uh, show that experimentally now, which is um, a collaboration that we are also involved in here at ETH Zurich together with um, the University of Oxford, Paris, and also some other Swiss universities, among them EPFL and the University of Geneva, where we are um, for the first time showing that it's indeed possible to transmit messages in such a perfectly secure way and without certified hardware. So the, cert the, the system really uh, it, well, has this self-certification that I mentioned before. So this gives us an answer to the second question. Namely, um, what does quantum technology do in the hands of those who want to hide secrets? It gives you really means to encrypt messages in a way that they will be um, protected physically and therefore remain unreadable to anyone except the intended recipient forever. However, as you have seen, and we are still in a rather early stage of development, this is not yet fully commercially um, or commercially applicable, at, at least not the device independent cryptography. So the one with these um, uh, self-testing. Um, so um, that will, there's a long path lying in front of us and it will probably require major investments in order to make this um, 
practical. Okay, so this already brings me to the summary. So as I think we have really the two aspects of this new exciting technology of quantum technology. On the one hand, it and I think that's really the message to everyone, even those who actually don't want to care about quantum mechanics, they have to be aware that it's only a matter of time until today's public key crypto systems like RSA or Diffie-Hellman will become insecure. In other words, if you encrypt a message today, make sure it's not relevant that the message will um, have to be secret in 40 years. So if, if something should, or in 20 years or so. So if, if you want to keep something secure or secret for more than 20 years, don't use public key cryptography. The other um, aspect is that quantum technology also offers a solution, although at least from today's perspective, not yet a very practical one. It needs a lot of development and this is quantum cryptography. However, the investment investment may be worth it because we will kind of reach an, an everlasting security. Now, um, before moving to the question, let me just mention that um, there is a gap in between. So we have somehow current cryptography, which will be become insecure rather soon, and quantum cryptography, which is somehow not yet ready because the technology is just too expensive for daily life applications. And this is why researchers are very hard working on what they call post-quantum cryptography. This is cryptography that is still um, based on classical um, principles. So they are um, based on the hardness of certain computational problems. However, these should be problems that even a quantum computer cannot solve. And um, at the moment, there is a standardization in the pro um, going on, a standardization process, and that will um, hopefully be successful. And we will have at least some solution for the time in between um, these two um, epochs in the one where classical cryptography, the, the RSA and so on was still secure, and the time when um, computational power is so developed that our public key schemes will no longer work in the way they do today. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm, of course, happy to take questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Renato, Rena. Um, your speech has a fantastic reaction online, so thank you so much for the useful insights. Have a lovely day. We have to really get back on track because there's still a little bit of time left, so I would love to invite and announce the last speaker of this plenary session. Um, thank you so much, Renato. Thank you. Your words are Bye. highly appreciated. Thanks yes, a lot. Thank Have a lovely day. <laughs> from online, we go back to on-site. Tommaso Calarco from Research Center Jülich. And he will talk on new frontier of quantum information and quantum computing. As I continue, as you continue, I have to leave this time, really. <laughs> so, Tommaso, join us on stage. I will hand you your remote. The stage thank you very is yours. Much. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. So thank you for showing up so numerous in this uh, uh, in this um, venue. Uh, I uh, got today a miracle. So I came after my lecture in Cologne uh, with a um, uh, train from the Deutsche Bahn, and it arrived on time. So we don't know what will happen today because anything is possible now. So <clears throat> what I am going to talk about is actually. Uh, well, how you the second quantum revolution? So quantum technologies, actually, since uh, you know I was able to come only late, this is the last talk of the session. But in a way, it's a, it's a kind of a broad overview, if you wish, introduction to the topic of quantum technologies. And actually, I did have uh, some slide which worked used to work with this. Uh, um, well, I don't see the remote going on, but maybe it will. Okay, so. And, well, what are quantum technologies? Well, this is what I, um, I want to tell you about. And the uh, first time in which I learned what quantum technologies are was, uh, well, now almost 25 years ago, when I was a young postdoc in the University of Innsbruck, and I wanted to go home. So I took my bike from the cellar of the Institute of uh, Theoretical Physics, and I tried to go on. Okay, very nice. So, <clears throat> and what I do is I take my bike, I try to go out, and in comes a black limousine, and out of the black limousine comes this guy, who is the Dalai Lama, 
Okay, so he was coming to the Institute of Theoretical of Experimental Physics, which was in the cellar, and this guy here is my colleague Rainer Blatt. And why did he want to go there? Because he wanted to do something which he had learned, and you have also learned, and I have also learned, and my children still learn in school, which is impossible. You know, uh, the founding fathers of quantum mechanics said it is easier, easier than uh, experimenting with a single atom. You know, it's to raise a pterodactyl in a zoo. Now, no one knows why they chose the pterodactyl as opposed to a, a dinosaur, which is easier to pronounce. But the idea was, it is ridiculous. It's impossible. And he said, what you do is you go to Innsbruck, and then you go to this lab, and inside a little vacuum chamber, you know, you can, you wait a, a few moments in darkness, and you uh, get your eyes used to darkness, and then you see it, you know? And in between your eye and the single atom, there is nothing else than glass, lenses, so no fancy microscopic electron, something reconstructing, anything. No, no, no. You see it, so it's down there, you know, small in the darkness, and you can watch it. And this is what His Holiness wanted to do, so here is what he wrote on the, on the guest book. You can clearly read it for yourself. I don't want to take your time by, by reading it. And he was very enthusiastic because this is, at the same time, something which is considered to be impossible. It is now possible in labs around the world, and of course the talk by Michel Lukin was showing that you can do this uh, and use this capacity of manipulating individual quantum objects to create new technologies, and this is the basis of quantum technologies of the second quantum revolution. Now, I forgot, before I came to st on stage, to get from my bag something which is relevant to this, because, as a matter of fact, all of us have quantum technologies of the first quantum revolution in our pocket. In this case, I have it in my uh, left pocket. So this kind of device here, which you also have, is going to be completely impossible unless you can manage to manipulate uh, quantum mechanical systems and phenomena, okay? But what happens, you know, is that uh, the bits which are running in our processors, the bits which are being transmitted over the internet, they are corresponding each one to zero and one, so it's currents which are switched on and off, laser pulses switched on and off, and this is corresponding to hundreds or thousands of photons or electrons per bit. But now, you know, when you have quantum technologies of the second quantum revolution, like the ones which His Holiness was seeing in the lab of Renner Blatt, then you can get something like what I have in my other pocket, which is this device here. And this is something which you have never seen, and if you have seen it, never in real life, this is the first quantum technology device, consumer device based on quantum technologies of the second quantum revolution. It's a Samsung Galaxy Quantum, okay, no kidding. You can buy it only in South Korea. And hence, it is a very bad story for us. Why? Because <clears throat> this is based on IP, which was developed in Geneva. We just saw a colleague from, from Zurich, which was <clears throat> a long time working also with colleagues in Geneva. So they developed this technology over there, and now it is being commercialized and made available, and money is made elsewhere, outside of Europe. So this is what we want to try to avoid <clears throat> now with the new uh, European initiatives in which we want to take these individual photons, individual electrons, atoms, and molecules, and use them to enhance the uh, capacity, the technological capabilities, speed of computation, security of communications, as we, as we saw in the previous talks, uh, and also create value here in Europe. So what is this based upon? It is based upon the properties of systems which are achieved if you manipulate them at the individual level. Those are quantum properties and they are shown here. Superposition and entanglement. Superposition is the possibility that a system, a quantum bit, which you can do with individual atoms, can be in state 0 and 1, you know, face up, face down, at the same time, so this is a metaphor, it's not, of course not a, not a quantum object, but you see this cube, you look at it, and you will see it when you observe it, it collapses in one or the other way. And then, this may be trivial, now this is slightly less trivial, try to observe two of these cubes, I know nobody actually stole this picture from, from Bill Phillips, a Nobel laureate from several years ago, uh, in, in one of the first in quantum, uh, on the way to quantum technologies, and, uh, you know, the point is, you look at this, and I know nobody who can actually see one of these cubes with face up and the other with the face down at the same time. So when you observe them, they collapse in a correlated way. Of course, again, this is just a metaphor, but with real quantum systems, you can manage to obtain this correlation over very long distances. And as a matter of fact, when <coughs> Anton Zeilinger for the first time realized teleportation in 1997 in Innsbruck, uh, <coughs> then what he imagined was something like this that you can, you know, uh, um, distribute entangled photons through distant locations on Earth, 
and have long distance entanglement and use it for secure quantum communication. And this was a science fiction or an artist view, as you used to say, <clears throat> and he said it to the European Space Agency. And what did the European Space Agency, uh, Space Agency do? They slept on it for the good part of 20 years. And in the meantime, <clears throat> the first author of the teleportation paper, whose name is Jan Wei Pan, he was not exactly Tyrolean, as you may guess, he went back home and he got a couple of billions in order to exactly make this thing to happen. So, I mean, on one hand, Anton, got, <coughs> Anton Salinger got his Nobel Prize, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, uh, uh, less than two months ago, and this was for the first time in the citation of the Nobel Prize, you know, for pioneering quantum information science. Actually, I was, I was on the phone with Alana Spe just a few moments ago because we are going to, to, to visit together the uh, uh, commissioner for searching for, uh, sorry, for digital technologies in, in Brussels, and I will explain to you what, what, why that is the case. But the point is that, you know, they got this Nobel Prize for something. You know, they, they were asking, the, the best quote that I like from Anton, so the Neue Zürcher Zeitung asked him, what, was, what is your research good for? And he said, you know, I get asked this question all the time, and the answer is, it is good for nothing, okay? So, <clears throat> it is for a garnish good. And this is very important because this is a real fundamental science, and without this fundamental science, actually, Alan was told, you know, uh, more than 40 years ago, he was told by a very prominent colleague that uh, his career would be wasted if he went on uh, uh, experimenting with these things, and now we see where he landed. Not only he landed there, but without this curiosity-driven research, we would not be here developing new technology. So that is exactly the point which has already been discussed. If I transmit single photons, you know, you cannot steal a part of a single photon. You cannot uh, overhear the communication. So if you can certify that photons have gone from A to B, you are sure by the laws of nature that no one has been able to intercept the cryptographic key, which you can now use to encode messages. And in fact, you know, as I said before, in China, so the, the first author on the teleportation paper went back to China, so they got a couple of billions, they made this satellite here, and then they put it in orbit. They also created a quantum communication secure channel between Beijing and Shanghai. And of course, then at, at, at some point, you know, the European Space Agency woke up and they said, oh, oops, maybe we should do something. So <clears throat> now this is what is happening. And also in Europe, so in this moment, we are in, in this particular country here. So what we are going to do is to connect different cities, you know, starting from the capital cities of Europe, uh, with quantum communication channels in order to create a, a basis for a future quantum internet. I will come back to that in a moment. Now, quantum computing. Again, introduction to the idea of quantum computing. Maybe not everybody is familiar here. Let me summarize very quickly. Again, you know, you have qubits, which uh, uh, are quantum bits. They can be in two states at the same time. And then if you have more of those qubits, you can, you know, explore very many states, exponentially many states in the number of components at the same time. And you can use this to solve problems. For instance, if you're in a labyrinth, you know, and you are trying to get out and, you know, Right, you say that's zero, and left, you say that's one. So instead of trying one after the other, you know, every possible attempt until you get to the right solution, you can do that in one go. So explore all possibilities, left and right, at each bifurcation at the same time. Of course, this is just uh, an example which is not working because there is no quantum algorithm which can solve this. A quantum algorithm is something which will be able to read out. If I go all possibilities, I still have to read it out, and then it will collapse onto one of the possibilities. So I need some more clever way to develop algorithms. I was having a conversation just before this, uh, <coughs> starting the talk about exactly this problem. But it shows that there is the possibility to explore very many paths in computational space. And you can buy, you can, you know, since a couple of years, you go to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, and this was a picture from there in 2019, and if you have a 10 million bucks to, to, to spare, you can get this thing in your living room. This is a quantum computer from IBM. Then, of course, uh, there is <coughs> the so-called quantum supremacy chip with 53 quantum bits. Google, a couple of years ago, was able to solve a problem in two and a half minutes, which at the time, with the best existing algorithm, the biggest supercomputer on Earth would take 10,000 years. Now it takes less, but still, you know, then the Chinese Academy of Sciences came and they have the same thing with 66 qubits, and now it is two and a half minutes against two and a half billion years. So this is, unfortunately, 
on a completely useless problem, which is sampling of a random in distribution of unitary matrices. Okay, if I would have to explain to you what it is, it would take two weeks. But <coughs> never mind, you know, because also when we had the Wright brothers flight, you know, I can carry my shopping bags for 50 meters, half a meter from, 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 uh, from the ground, you know, easily without an airplane. Okay, but I don't have to convince you why it was worthwhile to do that. So the point is, we may start getting frustrated because it's China, it's the US, and <coughs> well, now, one very good thing is that also in Europe, as a consequence of the first ramp-up phase of our flagship, after the first three years of the European program, we have also startups in Europe doing this. And this is Pascal, this is one of the world-leading companies producing this, uh, this kind of devices. And I got uh, from this company the first Mengenrabatt of human history, uh, so the first uh, you know, large quantity discount, because I convinced them to sell me two quantum computers for the price of one. So that one of these will go to Paris, the other one will go to Jülich here in Germany, and this is really, will be available in terms of a sort of public Amazon bracket, in the sense that you know, it will be available to users all over the, uh, the continent and all over the world in order to solve actual problems. So this is what I mentioned before. Okay, we are at the moment at the right uh, brothers moment in, in, in flight, we are at the Sputnik moment, if you wish, in, in, in space, but uh, what we are trying to do is to use these machines to produce actual quantum advantage, so to solve some problems of practical use in terms of these new technologies. So this is what is happening at the moment, and, well, this is not just the only application, there are other applications, for instance, with, if you use entanglement, so very <coughs> individual quantum systems whose Sensitivity, for instance, to passing of time is enhanced by quantum entanglement because those states are very, very delicate, then you can measure time much more accurately than you can normally do with already existing atomic clocks. Which means that you know, when you have your, your car navigator, let's assume that you do not trust particularly the Deutsche Bahn. You have to go to Bremen, so you start in your car and you put on your, your navigator. And it will tell you, you know, within a few meters where you are. So it's not sufficient for autonomous driving because you could be on the left side or on the right side of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the road. And so this is not a quantum superposition, so it will lead to some clear collapse unless you know exactly where you are. But if you use quantum entanglement, you can measure time much more precisely. And so you can know where your car is within centimeters or maybe millimeters, which leads really to high precision autonomous navigation, for instance. And then, of course, there are other uh, applications of quantum sensing in which you can use individual uh, um, color centers in diamond, and we have here the CEO, I think, here in the audience uh, from a, an important US company which is commercializing these techniques. You can use that to detect, you know, biological signals, for instance, single neurons in real time. And then, of course, you, we have the quantum key distribution about what uh, Renato Renner was talking before. And you have quantum computing, which we just discussed. You have other kinds of sensors, as well as quantum simulation, which is one of the important applications of what Michel Lukin was, was discussing, as well as this Pascal machine from the company I showed before. So it's really a broad range of applications which we have with quantum technologies. And what we want to do is really to bring this forward at European level. So this is a <coughs> slide which shows you know, on one end, what were the promises that we had in the five areas of our flagship communication, simulation, sensing, computing, and basic science. And basic science is, of course, very important, as I said before, because without this, without this curiosity-driven thing which is done in universities, we would have nothing of this. And below, we have the first results that we got after three years of our European program. Uh, for instance, this practical quantum advantage, that we discussed, in which this Pascal machine was able for the first time to solve not just an acad purely academic program, problem, but really some science problem, which you know, then was the basis for calculating further with the classical uh, supercomputers, you know, things which were not possible to be calculated before. So this aspect of integrating quantum into the high-performance computing infrastructure at European level is, of course, one of the aspects that we are going to, to develop in the next uh, few years. And so and there are a lot of other achievements. I don't have the time to go through this, but really what it means is that we started this with essentially zero startup ecosystem in Europe in this field and, and with a lot to catch up with respect to other continents. And after three and a half years, now we are at the stage in which really we can compete very strongly with the rest of the world. So this is the general uh, view of what we have in, in, in our European program. And I guess, I hope, 
that also Jacobs University can, can be a, an important uh, um, actor in this, because of course I see that quantum technologies is one of the, of the um, priorities here. And so this goes really, <coughs> it's a, an overview of all the European activities. It goes from really the fundamental side, with you know, funding agencies coming together to really fund the science, and this provides the technology which gets then deployed in different infrastructures for quantum communication and for quantum computing. So, <clears throat> for instance, in the quantum communication infrastructure, the idea is that you want to integrate these quantum uh, technologies, quantum communication security, into the standard communication systems, for instance, both terrestrial and satellite, to, for instance, provide different kinds of, of applications for not only protection of data, but also clock synchronization in terms of this metrology that I mentioned before, and this should be a backbone for future quantum internet. And uh, this is instead the quantum computing and simulation infrastructure, or QCS, in which we, <coughs> again, are putting those first quantum processors as coprocessors with uh, um, supercomputing machines with different platforms in order to test their performance and to develop new applications there. And this is something which, you know, is now really coming to even commercial uh, deployment. Here is a picture of, of uh, uh, well, actually, I, uh, we, where I can show that I can still wear my, my wedding dress. And this I did because I was presenting the first example of a, a, a tri-national quantum communication network at the G20 last year in Italy that was made easy by the fact that it was in Trieste, and Trieste is not very far, neither from Croatia nor from Slovenia, which are two other European countries, but nevertheless, this was done with a, a, an Italian startup, because in many, in most of the, actually in the meantime, European countries, you have startups which can produce and deliver this kind of devices. So, <clears throat> and now I have 10 minutes. And uh, I was also told that I have the freedom, uh, despite, uh, uh, be, be, you know, beside telling you this general view, uh, I have the freedom to tell you a little bit what I'm doing in my lab, in my theory institute. And the idea here is that, uh, you know, you want to control, to build the building blocks for these devices, and you want to do it by controlling some quantum process, which is like, you know, transporting a, 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 a tray full of, you know, delicate uh, objects, like uh, champagne glasses, you know, from one end to the other of the room. And this is something, and of course, there is maybe someone chatting, no, actually, she left, but uh, if she didn't leave, I would have to sort of get her drunk in order to avoid that she stops me after my half an hour. So, and the way I could do it is I could replenish my, my glasses here and then start very slowly to transport it in order to, to spill no champagne. But at the time in which I would come here to her, of course, my champagne would be completely warm, so she would not like it, she would not get drunk. So I would have to retry it, and I, I would do it by, you know, doing it in a shorter time. So I would just say, okay, let me go fast. But by the time in which I am halfway, I would have my fidelity dropping in the sense that half of my glasses would be dropped on the floor. So how can I do that, you know? Clearly, the first time it doesn't work, you know, and then you have to retry. So after retrying and learning from real waiter, what I would do would be, I would excite some motion like this, and then I would go there and de-excite and serve my, my thing. So that, you know, have some particular motion in such a way that in the beginning and in the end, I am in the state that I want, but in the meantime, I'm sort of juggling my, my atoms. And so this is exactly what, what you do. You have to simulate very well your material, but then you can do something. This is not Photoshop, okay? It is a picture from 41. And then this is not a typical physical process. If I try to do this, I would fail miserably, but clearly it is possible. You know, and so you can try to optimize processes in order, it was also mentioned by Michel Lukin before, if you use all your mm, uh, control parameters, you can manage to do some more remarkable things. So this is what we are now trying to do with quantum systems. Here we start from a, a certain initial state, we want to go to a certain final state, which is maybe the result of some complex computation. And this happens by manipulating some control parameters and navigating this. But of course, this is like doing this with that device on your lap and with boxing gloves, you know, on, on, a, on a truck which is going through an unpaved road. So it is completely crazy. And still, you know, we want to do it automatically. So we want to <coughs> replace some PhD students who still spend their life adjusting these things with a machine which can do it for them. Is it uh, possible? Well, it looks almost hope hopeless, but uh, we developed an algorithm which allows you to do that. So this time dependence, which I had in the beginning, you want to change it, you want to improve it. And how do you do that? Here comes our CRAB, our chopped random basis algorithm, which is, you know, uh, writing, rewriting this in terms of a few basis functions, for instance, sinusoids or other polynomials, and then you reduce the complexity of the, of the problem to a few parameters. So essentially you are searching 
for a minimum in a broader context in which you want to go from a, a situation in which the error is quite high over there to a situation in which the error becomes lower down here. And you can search this. In the end, you achieve a certain pulse shape which is feasible in your particular system, and then you want to apply it in the sense that it works both as a plug and pray approach, in the sense that you know, I plug my algorithm and then I pray hoping that it works, or it can also work in a feedback loop, in the sense that there is an experiment somewhere, for instance, in Michel Lukin's lab, we actually did it, I will show you the, the results in a moment, and then you have you know, a, a laptop there which communicates with our server, which gives and updates in real time the pulse shape for that experiment to work. So we tested this first with a game, actually it was a, a, an, an experiment, in which some people, here is the video which uh, explained the, the experiment, so this was an experiment done in Denmark, in which they were trying to take um, a, a, a set of uh, hot atoms, put them in an optical trap like this, so this was the explanation for the gamers, so people, non-physicists, came online and got this explanation, and then the idea would be to reduce the depth of this laser potential in order to get this thing very cold into a Bose-Einstein condensate. And so here is a, really a picture of how it would work. You would transfer some atoms in this vacuum chamber, similar to the one in which the Dalai Lama was looking, but here with millions of atoms inside, and with those uh, laser fields, it would change the time dependence in a way which, you know, everybody could play uh, over the internet, and then you would get, at some point, to the final goal in which you get a certain a population, a certain number of atoms in this special state. And so what we did was to play against real players, and of course the computer won, you know, no big surprise, but the point was that it showed that it is possible to achieve this, you know, over the internet as a cloud service. So we applied it in some real experiments, and this is an experiment which Michel Lukin did uh, uh, three years ago now, in which using those uh, tweezers, those, that system of optical tweezers, which you know, is arranging those atoms, uh, uh, exciting Rydberg states, to create uh, some quantum state, you know, we were able to go from a situation in which you have all atoms in the same state to a so-called Schrodinger cat, so a superposition of all atoms in one state plus all atoms in the other state. This was actually the fattest Schrodinger cat. Actually, Rainer Blatt, still the guy from the Dalai Lama, was very upset because his cat was 14 um, uh, atoms uh, strong, and ours was 20, so it was fatter than his, so he was very frustrated. Then, of course, he made a bigger one, okay, but for one year we had a slightly bigger than, than his. His is, here is the pulse shape which enabled you to do that. Here is the oscillation between, which shows the quantum coherence between the two different states, you know, in the, uh, uh, in the superposition, and this is the measurement which was done in order to show that, indeed, you can produce this world record uh, Schrodinger cat state. Then we didn't, uh, we were not uh, sufficiently content with the fattest Schrodinger cat, we also wanted the fastest Schrodinger cat, and this we did with another experiment, again optimized over the internet, which was done, you know, like a conveyor belt for atoms, which was done with, again, with optical potentials of different polarizations, which would transport different internal states, red and blue, of atoms, you know, uh, uh, here and there in a, in, a, in a system in which you would have a line of such atoms. And what happens here is that in each side, you move the atom from one side to the next one, and you want to do it in the fastest possible way. And we synthesize with our optimal control. And again, this is a way to have, if you wish, like a quantum bus in which you transport information between different areas of a quantum computer. After you have created your, your, entangled system, your entangled state, you can move it around. And then the point is, with our optimal control algorithm, we managed to synthesize the proper way to, to do this, and we were able to do this also in a coherent way. So here is again a, a Schrodinger cut in the sense that, you know, a component of the cut in which the quantum state is in state, uh, um, in the red state, in state down, you know, stays uh, where it is, and the other component moves around. So we are creating a, a superposition of these two states, one here, one there, and we do this in the fastest possible way, in the sense that we are able to reduce, via our control algorithm, we are able to reduce the duration of this process down to the smallest possible duration, which is allowed, again, by the laws of physics. So, in this sense, you know, uh, I guess that uh, since I have only a couple of minutes and I was told that I should also allow for some questions, here what I told you is that quantum technologies is something which you can develop when you can manipulate, control individual quantum degrees of freedom. And, of course, you know, 
based on this, you can build a lot of applications. And at the moment, the current uh, European program is 7.5 billion euros and counting to you know, create all this range of possible applications. And to make these building blocks uh, feasible, you can control individual systems with methods. And we develop the only method which allows optimal control of quantum many body systems, like the fat Schrodinger cat, which Michel Lukin created in, in his lab based on, on our uh, pulse shapes. And it works uh, in, on a different scales. And actually, it works not only you know, with uh, the plug and pray, like open loop, you try, you calculate, then you try the experiment. It also works in, in closed loop, like automatically calibrating and, and reproducing and improving the experiment. It also works as a cloud service, and it allows you to reach the ultimate um, you know, uh, size and speed of quantum uh, states. And with this, my time is almost over, and so I thank you very much. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Tomaso. Yeah, thank you so much, Tomaso. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you to you, and then I would like to ask if he has some questions inside. Oh, there's already a question here. There was actually a questions. slide with my, with my startup at the end, which... Uh, uh -huh. I hoped that, that would uh, kind of show up uh, if you don't block it, but no, they don't okay. want to allow it. So please, no, please go ahead fine. here, the okay. microphone, Never please. Mind. And we have even online questions, so we will oh finish at around 8 o'clock in the night. Excellent. Okay, go ahead. And then... Okay, thank you. Um, it's very beautiful to see that, I mean, studies uh, exploring the property of quantum state are quite ahead uh, when it comes to technical challenges. So you show this example of manipulating single atoms or so, and the problem is that uh, to be able to really access this quantum state, the system itself has to be isolated, right? So, and then just what you have to put around the system to isolate it made of our system very bulky. So then come the challenge now. That, um, so what the compromise that had to be made so that we can still pack enough quantum bits and achieve, but while also reducing the size? Well, uh, it's the general question and compromise of decoherence because the interaction with the environment, if, if everything would be very uh, uh, well isolated, everything would be quantum coherent, so I wouldn't have even to do things fast. I could take all the time in the world, and I would have never a degradation of the performance of my system. But instead, there's the coherence, meaning that you know, keeping my quantum system alive and in its proper state, it's more difficult than keeping a snowball you know, uh, solid in the middle of hell. And so I only have a very short time to do that. And this is exactly the reason why we are using these techniques, to make it more efficient, as quick as possible, and those techniques can also take into account, I didn't show that because I only had half an hour, but can also take into account the decoherence of the degradation process and correct partially for those errors in order to give you the best performance that you can get even in the presence of these imperfections which you have in a real experiment. Okay, here was another question here in the first row. Please carry over the microphone. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much that you also showed the practical implication and the technical challenges. Two challenges I want to mention, however, because they are often discussed. Uh, the first one is the stability of the mechanical parts because there are a lot of mirrors, always with optical technologies. And I know from my colleagues in physics who work on quantum technology, please don't touch anything, please don't shake. And if a big truck is close to the lab, they, they are in panic uh, because, of course, uh, the calibration is, uh, was an issue. Maybe it has changed. I don't know. The second one, of course, today is with climate change, all the pressure from energy consumption. When I saw the first demonstration of NEC of such a, what you, you mentioned with a, a quantum cryptography uh, for video conference, uh, then I saw everything is based on um, uh, super conductivity and super conductivity is also quite energy hungry because you yes. have to cooling uh, and and we are in AI already criticized when I give the talk about large language technology that it consumes too much energy because everybody says you know please save energy what do you think in the long run so uh, can we reduce the energy consumption is this inherent that you need this or yes. is this only a phenomenon which lasts at the beginning now. Well, one important point is the scaling of that. 
in the sense that, you know, if you add one qubit due to exponential scaling, the computational power of the system, you know, doubles. If you add two qubits, it becomes quadruple, and so on and so forth. So as a matter of fact, the machine uh, by Google used 26 kilowatts. It was super cooled and so on and so forth, but it used 26 kilowatts, and in two and a half minutes, it solved a problem which the supercomputer would take 10,000 years with 14 megawatts. Okay, so already the uh, energy, uh, uh, you know, savings are already there, but of course, this was, as I mentioned before, a completely useless problem, so we have to, to bring it to useless, uh, useful applications. And actually, to quantum... Uh, yes, 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 you also want communication, so I have something for you, again, in my, in my bag, it is in a different pocket, it's in here, and actually, this is a room temperature device, sorry, I forgot to pick it, put it in my pocket before, so this is a room temperature device, okay? So this is uh, actually the... This is the quantum chip, which is in this phone, which I had in my pocket, okay? Uh, and so this, this is working with photonics at room temperature. Photonics technologies go at room temperature. You have single photons, you can do that. There also are nowadays, for instance, not only photonics quantum computers which have been prepared, uh, but also there is um, uh, one based on uh, NV centers, color sentence in diamond, which is commercialized by a... Uh, uh, an Australian company, and uh, it works at room temperature. You can buy it, it is a 19-inch rack, you just put it in the rack, you plug it, it works. So, yes, it can be solved. Yeah, thank you, Tomato. So we have now a couple of uh, online questions still, so oh, no, you okay. can, no, no, it's oh, yeah, still yeah, up for you. So, sure. so the first question is, how do you see the next steps of quantum computing in the next five to ten years? And a second question, to be very efficient, what role should the EU and the support plan play in this kind of game? Yes. So the next big challenge is really to reach the sufficiently large number of qubits with sufficiently, sufficient quality. So it's a challenge of error correction, of being able to keep under control those errors coming from the coherence and scaling up the number of qubits. So it is an engineering challenge which immediately leads to the answer to the second question that, you know, a lot of the science is now understood. So while we have to continue developing science for the next to next generation, but now we have really to engineer those systems in order to get to the quality and to the scalability and to the reduction of costs, which is necessary for making them practical. And we are moving first steps, as this little chip shows that, uh, that I held in my hand before, but there is a lot more to be done, and this is exactly the role of public investors and also industry, also in this continent, to bridge this gap, to bridge, let's say, the quantum winter, the value of death, between now the first demonstrations of principle and then when it will be really adopted by society, there needs to be 10 to 15 years, so the question 5 to 10 years time scale is a very important one, and this is where we have to invest to make these things solid, and all the material research, all the technology research, which can really make them practical for society. Okay, knowing that you are, there's another question on, online, so you're Italian, but working in Jülich, you are now here in Bremen International Campus, so is there any country, you would say, which is top of mind when it comes to quantum computing? Or technology? Not really. We can say, certainly if we speak about superconducting quantum computing, which is one specific technology, certainly it would be the US. But if I speak about, for instance, NV Center quantum computing, you know, the company which comes to mind is in Australia. And if you speak of neutral atom quantum simulation, it clearly is Pascal, the company which, uh, which I showed before, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really is quite diverse. On ion trap quantum computing, there is a Quantinium and IonQ in the US, and there is also AQT in Europe. So at, at that level, there is no, no, clear, no clear winner at the moment. So it's really quite diverse. As Hanmut Neven, the director of Google Quantum Artificial Intelligence Lab, once put it, you know, we should stop considering this as a, like a, a space race in which every country is sitting on the rocket and trying to get there first, it's more a race between humankind and nature. And only if we unite forces, which uh, you know, maybe is not, no longer sufficient about the, in the current geopolitical situation, unfortunately, but only if we unite forces to the extent that we can, we will be able to overcome those challenges. Cool. Thanks so much. Big Thanks round so of applause, Professor Tommaso. <laughs> that was truly amazing. I thought that I'm talking very fast, but I think now I've found my master on this. So thank you so much for tonight. So my name is Philip. I'm here, the vice chair of the Constructor University. And I have now the honor and pleasure to guide you through the last session of today. And it's called Appetite for Business and Tech Transformation. And to say it in my simple words, because in my, one of my previous life, I was a politician here in Germany. I was Minister of Economics. We always thought about 
tech transformation, about innovation, how we can get the transfer from knowledge on the one hand to business on the other hand. Because in my simple understanding, education means to get a lot of money, public funded, we just discussed it, and creating with the money, thanks to great universities as constructor universities and others here in Germany, a lot of knowledge. And now our last session is about how to use the knowledge, how to utilize the knowledge in order to create sort of money back. And even better, it's not the money for the shareholder, it's money to reinvest again into education, research, science, and knowledge. And in order to do so, I would like to welcome now the next speaker here on stage. I think he was in the last row. He has to come now. No, he's already here. <laughs> Professor Yuri Levin from Constructor Learning. technology. I know when we talk about machine intelligence, when we talk about artificial intelligence, when we talk about forecasting in general, we always think about, you know, doing something, what we're doing now, but doing it better, faster. You know, we're always thinking about making some more accurate predictions or forecasts. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about, you know, an example of a new approach to run your business, to run your organization, which simply is not possible at all without data analytics and machine intelligence. And this is what we often call you know, uh, a customer-centric business model. Right? So the, again, what does it mean to build a customer-centric organization? So in business, we talk about you know, customer centricity. In business, uh, in, in, in healthcare, we often talk about patient centricity. In education, you know, we are starting to talk about student centricity and so on and so forth. So what does it mean? So on this slide, you can see kind of a general definition, right? What uh, customer centricity means, but basically it's a whole different way to run your organization. So instead of running it from a product perspective, right? So everything is based on products. Uh, everything is based on maximizing your, pro your product margin in business. You know, here, everything is based on customers and everything is, uh, is focused on you know, maximizing the long uh, time or the lifetime value of your select customers. And when I say everything you know, is focused on your consumers, I mean you know, starting at the design stage all the way down to the delivery stage. And, uh, you know, as I'm going to show you, you know, on the next few slides, this is simply not possible without using, you know, all the technology that, you know, folks have talked about, you know, at this conference. So key elements of a customer-centric organization. So here, you know, I listed five, uh, you know, depending on the uh, uh, specific industry you're trying to apply this, there might be, you know, a few more, a few less, but nevertheless, so customer-centric decision-making, again, we're always forward-looking. So we're making decisions now, anticipating certain behavior and certain preferences of our consumers in the future. Again, you know, clearly, you, know, you need to have some you know, pretty powerful you know, analytics in order to you know, do all kinds of calculations around the expected uh, customer behavior. And again, the customer lifetime value you know, is really the core, right, of, of, of this principle. The other one is corporate coordination. So again, how we actually share data in our organization. So take, you know, a financial organization, take a bank, you know, clearly, in, in, and this is common, you know, people don't share data, right? So, you know, people in mortgages do not share data with people in credit cards because everybody is working on, you know, maximizing its own, you know, margin you know, a margin for mortgages and another margin for credit cards. Again, you know, in, in a client-centric organization, clearly, 
you know, you got to have this data sharing mechanism in place. So what you are starting to see is that, you know, the move from a product-centric to a customer-centric model does not only require, you know, the implementation of a new technology, but it's going to require some fundamental changes in terms of the organizational structure, in terms of the incentive structure, in terms of your, your hiring model, and many other things that, you know, I'll try to uh, uh, talk a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, customized demand management, and this is really fundamental. So again, you are now trying to, and that's important, you are trying to manage your demand, you are trying to, you know, build your demand instead of forecasting your demand. So, and again, this is something fundamental, right? So data, machine intelligence allows you to start managing your customer behavior instead of simply forecasting your customer behavior. Finally, loyalty program. Clearly, you have to keep track of your customers, right? What they do now, you know, how their behavior changes in order to, again, you know, build some models in terms of the anticipated behavior of your customers in the future. And clearly, on top of this, everything you do with customer data needs to be governed by some ethical standards. And it's becoming more and more crucial. So I'm not talking about the legal side of using customer data. I'm talking more about the ethical side of using data. For example, you know, and a basic question that you may ask is, what kind of customer attributes would be ethical to use for price discrimination? Right, you know, gender, height, uh, you know, income, whatever, right? So again, that's something that is being you're constantly updating in terms of developing these ethical policies, but that you know, is at least as important as the actual technology you know, used, is how you use this technology from the ethical standards. Now, you know, here is a quick comparison of a product-centric versus a customer-centric organization. Clearly, you know, I don't have time to go into the details, but again, you know, there are some fundamental differences in terms of the strategy, in terms of your strategic objectives, in terms of the structure, right? You know, processes, the incentive structure, rewards, and clearly people, right? People you hire. Again, everywhere, you know, in this table, you can see that in a customer-centric business, you know, the focus on, is on customers and Clearly, you know, once you focus on customers, you got to anticipate customers' behavior, which is always stochastic or probabilistic, which, you know, automatically involves the use of a lot of machine intelligence, right? So this is not possible without all these technologies that folks talked about in the, in, in the previous uh, uh, session. Now, examples. And again, I'm not just talking about business, although, you know, business is much more relevant to what I've been doing. But we talk about student centricity, as I said, patient centricity in healthcare, right? You know, employee-centric HR, and clearly, more and more, and Philip, this might be relevant to, uh, to you, right? People talk about, you know, a, a, a citizen-centric government, okay? So now, uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on, uh, you know, on the student or client-centric education. Uh, and this is what we hear more and more, but at this point, there is not a single, um, you know, university that can claim that uh, it's 100% uh, uh, it's uh, student-centric, although, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, universities have done a great job moving towards this goal. So... First of all, again, the notion of lifetime value is, as I mentioned previously, the main kind of principle is to build your decision making based on, uh, based on the lifetime value of, your, uh, of the participants of your university ecosystem. Now, who are the participants? Well, you've got buyers, and uh, you see you know, who are buyers. These are purchases of different services. Right, you know, we have educational products for individuals. We have, you know, educational products for, you know, children, spouse, and parents, and and so on and so forth. Right. Then we have donors. Okay, and again, you know, uh, in general, you know, uh, all these donations towards all kind of endowments or 
uh, you know, untargeted donations or the alumni association donations, right? These are all folks who are contributing, right, toward the ecosystem. Then we have the influencers. So these are people who are promoting the brand, who are promoting the name of the university. And clearly, you know, they have, uh, you know, an, a, a significant value to the ecosystem. And finally, you know, we have contributors. You know, people who come and uh, serve as guest speakers, people who write about the university, people who participate in alumni activities and so on and so forth. Right? So again, all these, uh, um, all these clients right, need to be quantified, right? And, you know, every single activity or every single contribution that they do needs to be somehow affected in their lifetime value. Uh, then, another important piece of building a customer-centric university is building a recommendation system. And again, we're all used to recommendation systems, you know, when we do shopping, right? You go to, you know, Amazon and they recommend you something, right? This is something very, very common in our day-to-day -day lives. But when it comes to education, again, we're not there yet. And actually, if you go to most of the university websites, you have programs, right? So, you know, there are some program descriptions and, you know, they don't really provide, you know, a recommendation service similar or anywhere close to the one, say, Amazon, you know, provides when you shop for something. Now, uh, another aspect is, and this is what you see on the left, is, you know, the whole business of client management. And again, it's got to do with data because the idea is to understand who your uh, students are, who your clients are, what their needs are, and build the whole educational path, or we often talk about an educational journey that would, you know, bring your students from point A to point B, taking into account their personal goals, their educational goals, their career goals, and their development goals. Now, on the right, and I may touch uh, on this a little bit more, you actually see the answer to the question, how, right? So you need to develop you know, a mechanism, an agile mechanism, that would allow you to quickly build these personalized learning solutions that would match these personal educational tracks developed by the recommendation engine. So the approach is very similar, right, to what you, know, you see in e-commerce, right, when it comes to Amazon. So uh, again, I don't really have time to go much in the details, but the way you know, this mechanism is built, you, know, you can think about you know, a Lego block constructor. And again, the connection to the constructor group, to the constructor university, is, is very clear, right? So if you think about these Lego blocks, and every Lego block is a module or, you know, a small piece, right, that would be used in building your educational journey, then it's really clear that, you know, it's like you're playing with a Lego set, right? So in order to build something, you somehow assemble a number of different Lego blocks. So that's really, you know, how this could potentially be done. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, the actual, uh, you know, use of this approach, uh, you know, another important piece is having standards. Because every single, you know, Lego block is going to come from, you know, a different professor or a different, you know, professional or a different guest speaker. So if you're about to build a pool of these Lego blocks that you want to quickly connect in order to build you know, a personalized learning solution, clearly these Lego blocks need to be standardized. And this is what you see in the playset, right? So again, developing educational standards for these Lego blocks is something that a number of organizations including, you know, uh, EdTech companies are currently working on. So there is uh, a work in progress in this sense, but this is really crucial. And then, you know, this is really the mechanism that can be 
potentially implemented that would allow you to quickly put together a learning solution that you know, will be built, uh, will, that would consist of different Lego blocks coming from different people, from different instructors, into something that can be used as a personal educational solution for our clients. So this is, uh, this is it. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. So I will kick off with uh, two online <coughs> questions we just received. So first is, is data expertise the best antidote to our extreme volatile and short-term market changes in a very unstructured world currently? Well, in general, this is a very good question, right? We often talk about system one and system two approaches to decision making. System one is your gut, intuition, and management experience. System two is everything that has to do with data, you know, models, machine intelligence, and so on and so forth. So, Philip, what you're asking is, you know, which decision making mechanism is superior, right? System one or system two. My approach to this is that it's neither or. It's system two within system one. So in other words, you still, and it doesn't really matter how advanced your machine intelligence is, your decision making is still driven by system one with a lot of help from system two. So mm -hmm. it's system two inside system one. So your system one determines your goal, it, it determines all the restrictions, it describes your vision, and system two implements your vision in the best possible way. Thank you. And the second question is, is there a specific scope of all what you educate, what you train in uh, constructor learning? Yeah, I, I think um, that's a great question. I think that these days, you know, um, there are a number of uh, uh, great techniques. There are a number of great technologies. There are a number of great data scientists, people who can actually implement those technologies. What's really lacking in this world, uh, you know, is you know, the, the, the way to connect those technologies to real-life problems. So, in other words, to bridge the technology world with the business world we live in. So, what, what we're focusing on, we're focusing on, again, you know, creating these bridges. We are focusing on developing leaders. You may, call, you may refer to them as storytellers or translators, people who are able to understand what can be done in the technology world, and they can, you know, communicate it in a digestible way to the executives who are involved in strategic decision making. So, you know, all these technologies, they don't live on their own. You don't have a data strategy that lives in parallel with the strategy, right? But everything you do in the data world supports the strategic objectives, right, of your organization. So data supports strategy, not the other way around. Thank you so much. So now I open the floor. Here's a question, please. First row, can we have a microphone? That's nice. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. I, I think it was very important that you pointed out this, what you call the student-centered uh, approach. I think that's very good. Uh, but I was thinking about one uh, ingredient which may be missing. Uh, one of my former students, Sebastian Thun, a professor at Stanford, maybe you know mm -hmm. him from learning uh, environments, he founded Udacity and he has uh, had a lot of success with the mini components. He called, you know, these are the, the micro degrees which you can get. Yeah, micro and, credentials. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. And th this micro credits or micro degrees, even, he um, uh, had another business model. Uh, what he called the demand driven. Uh, so it's uh, customer driven students, but also the demand of industrial companies. Because in this <coughs> case, for, uh, to develop a new curriculum for a very specific topic, he had the topic app, app programming in computer science. There were not enough people who understood to uh, program apps. Google paid the whole thing because they need mm -hmm. <laughs> the, you know, uh, students who finish this course. So this is another ingredient. You talked about donors, the students, and so on, but there are also companies which pay that uh, this topic is included in uh, the constructor universities, uh, you know, uh, curriculum. 
What do you think about it? Well, that, that's a great idea. So again, the focus on uh, helping companies to fill this kind of skill gap, right, or, or talent gap. And how do you do this? So your companies define certain skills that they, they want, you know, their potential in place to have, and you as the university serve the, 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 those uh, clients, those companies, by providing this, you know, education to your students. That's, that's a great approach, absolutely. Now, the problem is that, and, and, and this is great, so in a sense, this is your B2B approach. But uh, let me kind of go back a little bit for a sec, 20 seconds, Philip, you know, to uh, how you uh, work with students and what the main challenge working with students. Now, many people don't really understand what they need. So it works for companies, it works for B2B, because companies know exactly what they need, what kind of skill they want the employees to have. Now, people, you know, you ask me, what do you want? Now, I don't know. And, and, and what often happens, you know, you talk to someone and this someone tells you, well, I want a program in finance. But in five minutes, you realize that what he needs or she needs is a program in venture, right? So in this sense, the recommendation engine is crucial because it's supposed to really understand what you need. But great, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. Thank you very much. Yuri, final question from my end. Um, so first, when will you kick off the first constructor learning part and second question are there still some free seats yeah thank you <laughs> uh, are there any free seats so we're launching our flagship program called master of management analytics and it's not mixed martial arts it's uh, uh, it's mma but it's the master of management analytics on Fe february the 15th so it's uh, going to have a hybrid format so we have three residential sessions uh Schaffhausen, Bremen, right here on campus, and the third one is in Dubai, and the rest is delivered, you know, online in the synchronous mode. So this is the new version of the MMA program, of the first MMA program in the world that I launched in 2013 in Canada that was named the best management analytics program in the world in 2020. So right now, we're offering six sections of this program in Canada, which, you know, you can think about as an executive MBA focused on managing a digital organization. So it's going to be one of the first programs of this type here in Europe. And again, you know, uh, we welcome, you know, high potentials. We welcome, you know, executives who are involved in strategic decision making or data driven decision making. Okay, thank you, Yuri. So he will be still around. So if you have an interest or as a businessman, you say, I would send my best employees to this very course. Feel free to approach Yuri. Thank you so much, Professor yeah, Yuri. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Luck. So, ladies and gentlemen, second to last session for today. So, as we just discussed, how to make out of ideas and some knowledge, some money. As you know, uh, following the famous Austrian, later on US economist Schumpeter, so we say that innovations are ideas that are successful on the market. And now I'm happy to announce that we have online, I think, Professor Sergei Netesin talking about business model innovation and digital disruption. Sergei, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Of course, it's morning here in the United States. Um, really unfortunate that I cannot be there in person to deliver this speech in person. But thanks to technology, very happy to make a few remarks about business model innovation and digital disruption today, uh, which to me is kind of a different kind of innovation um, uh, relative to uh, a lot of the topics that you've been discussing uh, today. So I, I want to start with, uh, with some data. I want to start with uh, maybe my favorite, uh, favorite graph, favorite piece of data um, about innovation. And if you, look at, um, if you look at a very, very simple uh, data about how long does a company spend on S&P 500 list. And of course, S&P 500 list in the United States this is a list of companies, the most successful, the biggest, the most advanced companies, kind of cornerstones of the U.S. economy. And if you look at this, uh, this graph, you see that uh, just about 60, 50, 70 years ago, the company would spend on average about 60 years on S&P 500 list. 
So once you get on this list, it's really not a big concern that you would get out of the list. Uh, this would not worry the CEO. This would not be uh, kind of on the mind of a board member. Um, fast forward to our times, and we see that um, nowadays companies spend uh, 10 to 12, maybe 15 years on average on S&P 500 list. So this, this, uh, this becomes, of course, a big concern for a CEO. No CEO wants to be a CEO of the company that was on S&P 500 list and then disappeared from the list. So what is happening? Why do we see this drastic acceleration um, of, of the rate of change, of the rate of renewal on S&P 500 list. And, and the main culprit is, of course, innovation. The main culprit is disruption. Uh, big companies, once they grow big, uh, they become increasingly complacent. Uh, they get comfortable. They get attached to their existing revenue streams and they fail to innovate. And we see this over and over and over again. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. I'm sure you have uh, many more examples of your own. Um, Borders uh, used to be the second biggest uh, book retailer uh, in the United States. Thousands of stores. Um, and, and then it disappeared uh, into oblivion. When the Internet came, Borders, uh, Borders managers said, well, you know, it's going to be a fad. We have to do something about it, but we probably don't need to do much. So what they did, they created a website, borders.com, and they forwarded all the traffic to um, to Amazon, uh, allowed Amazon to fulfill their orders. And of course, Borders promptly went ban bankrupt around 2009, and Amazon is, uh, is, is doing very, very well. Um, another example, uh, Blockbuster used to be the biggest uh, retailer of videotapes uh, rent, rent, for rental VHS tapes and later DVDs. Um, biggest retailer in the world, um, almost 40% market share. Uh, and then this little upstart Netflix comes around. Um, at some point, Blockbuster had an opportunity to acquire Netflix uh, for very little money, but didn't do so because they didn't perceive it as a threat. And of course, now Blockbuster is bankrupt, liquidated, and Netflix is doing very, very well. Um, and as a final example, if I were to ask around this room how many people here had Blackberries at some point of time, uh, probably most of the hands would go up. I personally had a BlackBerry, and and this is a really an amazing company. If if you look at their market share, no other manufacturer of mobile phones had 50% market share. And now this market share went down from 50% to a couple of percentage points. Um, uh, so uh, for all practical purposes, the company is still alive, but really became kind of a marginalized. So, so we see this keeps happening. We see that big companies keep uh, failing to innovate. They keep failing to recognize innovation. Uh, they become complacent. And so the map of the world has been changing quite drastically. Um, if you look at the biggest companies uh, in the world uh, over the last few years, you see the likes of Apple and Facebook and Microsoft and Amazon. You see also Tencent and, and all kinds of other technological companies. These are the biggest companies in the world now. If you looked at the world 20 years ago, the, the, comp the biggest companies were very different. This would be oil and gas. This would be major banks. Uh, there, there would be a major brick and mortar retailers like Walmart and so on and so forth. So, so the world is changing in so many ways and there are more and more of those technological upstarts which are coming from behind of big complacent companies and keep eating their lunch, keep, keep innovating and keep growing. So if I if I am a big company, how can I innovate? How can I change myself? And and one way to do it is of course technological innovation. So create some new technologies, quantum computing, materials, and so on. Um, and and this is what in, what we talked about throughout the whole day today. Of course, this is not easy. Um, you need money. Of course, uh, innovating technologies is very expensive. You need a pretty unique um, engineering knowledge, um, which most companies don't have. They don't have this kind of talent. 
um, you also need to be kind of in the right industry because if you look about kind of a most uh, traditional old industries, it's very hard to make use of novel technologies in the very old traditional industries. Um, you also sometimes need to be very lucky. We've done a lot of research on R&D in academia. We still don't quite understand why some companies spend billions and billions of dollars on R&D, on new technologies, and get no return on it. And other companies spend relatively little and get fantastic uh, technological innovations. So the question I want to pose at this point is, is this the only way to innovate through technologies? Is there another way to innovate? And can everyone innovate? Can every manager within a company become an innovator? And here I want to bring, um, uh, bring up a, a very, very old uh, example of Thomas Edison. Of course, you know, you all know Thomas Edison. Um, he, uh, he is known as an inventor of a light bulb. Um, and I have, a, of course, Edison invented many more things than the light bulb, but that's uh, his most famous innovation. Um, and I, and I have a, a provocative question here. How many Thomas Edison's invented a light bulb? Uh, now, a very little known fact is that in addition to Thomas Edison, there are at least 22 other known inventors of light bulbs. They were all engineers. They all lived around the same time. Uh, they lived in different countries and they all invented something which looked very, very similar to Thomas Edison's invention, essentially the same materials, essentially uh, the same device. But somehow we think that Thomas Edison was an inventor of a light bulb. Somehow we don't know names of those 22 other inventors of light bulbs. So what did Thomas Edison do differently? And Thomas Edison did do something differently. Thomas Edison was an engineer, like all other inventors of light bulbs. But he was also a businessman. With every invention, he was also asking a question. How can I commercialize this technology? Um, and light bulb was no different. So at the time when Thomas Edison invented a light bulb, um, he was not really able to plug it into any socket because there were no sockets. There was no electrical grid. So then uh, Thomas Edison started thinking, hey, you know, how can I make this work? How can I sell this light bulb to someone? Um, so he created an electrical generator. Now, first electrical generators were very big, very bulky, very expensive. So it didn't seem commercially viable to sell uh, a, a light bulb with a generator. So then Thomas Edison said, okay, so I need a, a one generator feeding many light bulbs. And he started thinking through how would this uh, work in practice? So what he ended up doing, he ended up creating something much bigger than a light bulb. He, uh, he thought of creating a power plant and then he thought of uh, creating a step up transformer to increase voltage uh, of generated electricity. Then he would need um, high voltage transmission lines, a step down transformer to again to convert this electricity into lower voltage. Um, then there would be an electricity pole and there would be a distribution system for users of electricity. And at the end of all of it, there would be the most important piece. There would be a billing system which would send a bill from the power plant owner to the customer. And that, that's what made the whole thing work. This was essentially a business model of electricity. So the difference between Thomas Edison and every other inventor of a light bulb was that Thomas Edison was thinking beyond technology. He was not just inventing technology. He was also thinking about a business model for electricity. And that's why we now think that Thomas Edison created a light bulb. Um, in fact, creators of light bulbs were dime a dozen. There are lots of people thinking about creating a novel technology, but Thomas Edison was the only one who was able to create a business model which commercialized this technology. 
And what is perhaps even more remarkable, if you look at technology now, we don't use Thomas Edison's light bulbs anymore. We don't use the same uh, electrical generators as Thomas Edison created, but we still use the same business model of electricity. That business model uh, essentially remains um, unchanged. Um, so, so the lesson here is that uh, very often uh, we perceive uh, technology as being kind of the innovation that changes our lives, but reality is technology would be useless in this case without the business model that accompanied this technology. And that was a real unique innovation, the business model of electricity. Um, I want to kind of generalize the statement and make it uh, maybe a little bit more controversial and to say that digital disruption uh, rarely comes because of changes in technology. Most often new technology comes, never finds a, a good business model and disappears into oblivion. Sometimes it finds a good business model decades uh, decades later. Um, 3D printers are a great example. They were invented in the, in the 70s, 80s, and only now, only 40 years later, we finally see some successful commercialization attempts for uh, 3D printers. Uh, Google Glass, another great example. So there is lots of hype about Google Glass as a novel technology. Where is Google Glass? Does anybody own Google, Google Glass? It kind of, it's still searching for a new business model. And as far as I can tell, it hasn't found any kind of a uh, very uh, widely um, commercializable uh, use. Um, so to give you, so, so this, is a, this is a topic of, of, of my book that, uh, that I show here. Um, and, and I make this point that really our lives change when business models change. And if you want, um, if you want some examples of that, I have my favorite business model uh, innovation quiz. Uh, so now we have the world's largest taxi company that owns no vehicles, which of course is Uber, right? And if you look at innovation of Uber that really changed ma uh, lives of many people on earth and changed uh, a, a very, very, diff a very, very old uh, industry, taxi industry, industries that goes back thousands of years. Um, what did Uber invent? Was this technology? Not really. Uh, there was a global positioning system which existed for many decades. There was a mobile phone which was not invention of Uber. It existed a long time before. There was, of course, internet. Um, again, was not invented by Uber. It's a pretty old technology by now. Uh, so what Uber did was something different. It did not innovate technology. It did not create any kind of a new product. It, it applied a very uh, old, off-the-shelf, um, reliable technologies, uh, but it applied them to an old industry and it created a new business model. Um, what is the most valuable retailer in the world that has no inventory? Some people will say it's Amazon. Actually, Amazon has lots of inventory. I would, I would say this is Alibaba. There is the world's most popular media owner that creates no content. And finally, we have the world's largest accommodation provider that owns no real estate. All of these are examples of business model innovations that changed our, our, our lives in a, in a very, very significant way. Um, I've documented business model innovations um, going back hundreds of years, and, and, and many of them you'll find in my book. Um, I have examples as old as Ford, which instead of creating a new car, created a new process of manufacturing cars and made cars available to everyone. Uh, there was an innovator 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, a company called Sears Roebuck, which is incidentally is bankrupt now. But at some point of time, they were the precursor of current internet. They created a catalog business, which for the first time allowed people to buy uh, almost unlimited variety of products at low prices by just looking at the catalog and sending a check and receiving product in the mail. And then um, more recently, there are companies like Dell, uh, which is a great example of business model innovation. Uh, Dell uh, was created around 1985 and they came into a computer industry when there was a fierce competition. There was Acer and there was IBM and HP and, and, and Compaq and other companies, yet Dell was growing and everybody else was shrinking. 
And if you looked at computer created by Dell, it was no different from any other computers. There was the same Intel processor, the same Seagate hard drive, the same Sony monitor. So from kind of a consumer viewpoint, there was nothing kind of new going on. Um, yet uh, Dell was succeeding. And the reason Dell was succeeding is because it, it had a very different way of producing computers uh, to order. So if first Dell would charge consumers credit card for the configurations that customer wanted. And only after that, Dell would build a computer. And this was different from everybody else who was building computers based on forecasts. And forecasts were always wrong. Uh, it was very hard to predict which technology would succeed and which would fail. And as a result, Dell was growing and everybody else was shrinking um, for, for, uh, for several decades. So I have many, many more examples of, of this kinds of business model innovation. Some of them uh, came on the heels of new technology and accompanied new technology. But many of those business model innovations required no new technology whatsoever. They were purely kind of innovation of a uh, business model, like an example of Dell, uh, for instance. So to, uh, to give you just kind of one very, very interesting and more recent example, um, uh, the, the unlikely innovator is Domino's Pizza. So this is a fascinating company. If you look at, if you look at the industry, you know, what can be more boring, what can be more traditional than delivering pizza to your home? And yet, if you look at stock price of Domino's Pizza, it, it grew faster than all the technological innovators like Alphabet and Apple and Amazon and Netflix and so on. How did they do this? Uh, well, they went full digital. Um, the, the company was failing. They were closing stores. Franchises were, were very unhappy about uh, companies' uh, products and, and performance. And, and then CEO of the company said, hey, how about we, uh, we make something new? How about we focus on the delivery and ordering process and we allow our customers to order a pizza while waiting for a green light at a stop sign? And they measured how long does it take? It takes 17 seconds. And they created all kinds of interesting ways of ordering pizza from mobile phones. And um, you can even send a pizza emoji to, uh, to uh, Domino's uh, Twitter and, and the pizza is going to be sent to you. They, they, uh, they're using autonomous vehicles. They're using electrical bicycles. They're getting efficiencies out of tracking of orders in real time, tracking where driver is, and so on and so forth. So now suddenly this becomes a highly technological, uh, highly advanced company uh, with a very, very different business model relative to 10 years ago. Um, so to summarize, what is a business model innovation? Business model innovation to me is a different kind of innovation that uses existing products, existing technology. It satisfies existing market needs. The need is already there. The customers already want what you are delivering. So uh, instead of focusing on new technology or new products, you reinvent the business model. You invent a superior business model to provision products or services to the market. So that's kind of my shortest definition of uh, business model innovation. Now, how can companies go about implementing business model innovation? And, you know, as a large company, can I plan a business model innovation? Can I just say, okay, I have this business model today. How about I create a new business model a few years out and kind of plan out every step? Um, unfortunately, planning innovation doesn't work very well. And, and my, famous innov my, my favorite innovator, Mike Tyson, uh, once uh, put it very, very well. Everybody has a plan until they're punched in the face. And that's essentially what happens when you try to plan innovation. Customers uh, repeatedly punch you in the face because you get something wrong, because you think this is how customers are going to respond to your innovation, but they respond very, very differently. So what do you do instead? Instead, you have to embrace a very different culture, the culture of experimentation. And this is what large companies struggle with the most. Instead of planning innovation, you have to launch lots of small experiments, testing out 
um, different business models and go through multiple steps, uh, verifying the hypothesis that you made about what will and will not work in a new business model. Um, this is also uh, a simplest KPI that you can have in a big company. As Jeff Bezos put it, if you double the number of experiments you do per year, you will double inventiveness of a company. Uh, but most of those experiments eventually will fail. And this is something that large companies are really uncomfortable with. The, the idea of failure is just rarely rewarded in a large company. You are usually rewarded for successes. So the transformation for a big company to a new business model, the digital transformation is usually uh, accompanied, uh, needs to be accompanied by the change of culture, the change of cultures into the culture that is accepting, uh, in a, uh, accepting experimentation, accepting failure of experiments, accepting the idea that only one of those experiments out of perhaps a hundred will eventually succeed. Um, what uh, what you also need to know about business model innovation is that it requires very different type of governance. The traditional technological innovation on the left here is usually run by chief technology, chief information officer, by an R&D department. Um, you need a big catch-all kind of a budget. You have a full-time workforce that works uh, around the clock on this um, uh, technological innovation. <clears throat> For business model innovation, you don't need any of that. Uh, everyone can innovate a business model. It has to be driven by CEO and the board and, and top and middle managers across the organization. Um, and you don't really need a big budget. You need small budgets for these small experiments to, to try out uh, minimal viable business models and see which of them which of them might succeed. You also need a very different kind of knowledge. When you are innovating uh, technologies, your knowledge that you need is inward looking. You are di digging deep inside a particular area, um, uh, area of science. With business models, you are actually need to be looking outwards. You need to be thinking about what other kind of a cool, interesting business models appearing somewhere uh, somewhere in the world, is there something that I can take and transfer it to my industry? For example, as Dell started producing computers to order and mass customizing them, uh, other companies started transferring it to other industries. Now we have shoes which are customized and clothing customized and peels which are customized and, and, and many, many other, uh, other things. Um, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and just point to a couple of sources of information. So there is, of course, my books are a couple of articles I had written in Harvard Business Review. If you want a shorter version of the book, um, other than that, please connect, uh, reach out and let me know about latest and greatest business model innovations that you observe uh, around you. Always glad to hear about them and hopefully put them into my next book about business model innovation. Thank you, and I'll stay open for any questions. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Professor Netessin. And uh, I won't forget to mention that Professor Netessin is certainly at Wharton, but at the same time, and we are very proud of, he is a member of our strategic advisory board at Constructor Group. We are very grateful. And now, please, up to you. Any questions? If not, I have already one online question. You have some time to think through while I'm asking the online question. So, Sergey, is there any specific country you would say which is really on top when it comes to the question of a structured approach for business model innovation? Unfortunately, no. Um, there was some research done on this and very few companies in the world have a systematic approach to business model innovation. Um, I can name maybe three or four companies that have kind of a business model innovation department and they think systematically about reinventing um, its business model. So it's really not about a specific country. Um, there are some companies that are really good at business model innovation. So, for example, uh, Amazon comes to mind. And uh, for full disclosure, I work part time at Amazon. So, I, so I, I'm going to say some good things about it. And if you look at Amazon over the course of the last 25 years, they, fan, they went through monumental transformations of the business model, including invention of Amazon Web Services, 
and opening up its uh, fulfillment platform for fulfillment by Amazon and inviting third party sellers on it. Uh, and, and all of those were highly controversial decisions, but at the end, this is why Amazon stays relevant and, and, and on top of the industry. Any question from the audience? If not, maybe the final question. So you mentioned uh, quite often all the Dukes like Amazon, Apple and so on. What would be your recommendation for an SME, small and medium-sized enterprise, how to come to a structured approach when it comes to business model innovation? Um, great question. Um, uh, fortunately, the answer is very, very simple and any small and medium-sized business enterprise can do this. Uh, the recipe is always the same, no matter in which industry you are. First step is you buy my book. No, <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, uh, there, there is a process that I described that, um, uh, that I call um, a business model audit. And, and your, the process of business model innovation always starts with the audit of your existing business model. And, and this, is, um, this is not so different from audit of financials. So you're trying to find structural cracks. You're trying to find something that goes wrong in your current business model. And that informs your next business model. You look at new technologies, you look at how customers change their behavior, you look at new channels that evolve, you look at competition that is changing, and, and you say, okay, this, here is a part of business models that I need, really need to change. And from there, you go on and you generate ideas for your next business model. And, um, and there are uh, all kinds of different approaches for generating uh, an idea for a new business model. Uh, what I propose in the book is called business model innovation matrix, which you can kind of look at and you can come up with a bunch of ways to create an alternative business model and test it out and then go through a series of experiments. So business model audit, generation of ideas for new business model and then experimentation. Thank you, Sergei So any other question? I don't see. So thank you so much. Back to the US, Professor Netessin. So, dear colleagues, thank you so much. Now we are coming to the very last but not least session. It's, and this is a highlight to some extent, one of our former alumni here at the Jacobs University back then, now Constructing University, but he himself is certainly Jacobs alumni. And we are now talking about academic tech transfer, fundamentals and challenges from Dr. Jakob Fierer, at the Yeda Institute, which is the academic arm of the Weizmann, not the business arm of the Weizmann Institute. Dr. Jakob Fierer, the floor is yours. Ah, thank you so much. Um, do you see my screen or have I shared it properly? All is basic. Uh, it's all good? We can see you. Okay. Okay. And the earth we, behind. You see me, you hear me. You see my screen, now I start my slideshow. It's okay if you miss it and whatever. All right, hi, so thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. It's a pleasure to be an alumni here and thank you so much for that kind and warm introduction. So I will be presenting again about academic technology transfer, fundamentals and challenges. So just briefly about myself and the places I work for. So, first uh, of all, dear Jacob, just one second. We see your presentation screen. So, if you can just share with us just slides and switch the slides because now you're sharing with us your speaker's notes. Ah, okay. And yeah, thank Apologies. you. Um, sorry, just one moment. I don't know what's going on here. Ah, yes, please. and now just uh, start sharing. Uh, I've it already. It should be F5 or you have up okay button. sorry <laughs> technical no problem okay share screen and now so i think that should be it correct so if you can okay. now go to slideshow yes okay i think we're now i i don't know why it's now not showing me that uh because i have to like about 
Why is this doing this to me? This Maybe person? you can go, uh, yes, on slide. There we go. Exactly. So apologies it. for that. Thank you. Technical difficulties, Zoom, modern life. So thank you for the very warm welcome and thank you for the technical corrections. Apologies on my end. So I will now just very briefly just present about academic technology transfer, fundamentals and challenges. So just briefly about myself and the places I work for. So just briefly about myself, I'm actually an alumni of Athens University, as stated by the, by the kind host. I did a bachelor's of biochemical engineering and a master's of molecular life sciences. And just very quickly, basically some things happened. And now I'm a director of business development of life sciences at Yetta, the technology transfer company of the Weizmann Institute of Sciences. So there's obviously now two questions that will arise. What is the Weizmann Institute? So just quickly, the Weizmann Institute is a premier academic institution in Israel. It is a core basic science institution, only focuses on fundamental research, relatively small, only about close to 300 academic groups covering everything from quantum computing to biology. And But it regularly publishes very well. It has a very strong reputation, both in terms of innovation and academics. Now about YEDA, the technology transfer arm of the Weizmann Institute, it is it was established in 1959, and it acts as the commercial arm of the Weizmann Institute. Basically, it helps commercialize all the different technologies, making a number of license agreements and different types of agreements, such as producing startups and really working with a number of top tier companies. And for example, one of the great products that have come out of it is Copaxon, which helped to create the rise of Teva. And just to be clear, when you see that $35 billion number on the screen, that is not what we receive each year. I wish it was, but that's all the products that are being sold based off of Weizmann Institute IP, either wholly or partially, they're being sold. And so it's not a bad economic impact for an institution of about 3,000 people. So now I'll just briefly discuss about technology transfer to give a bit of history and how it even came about. So the first technology transfer office is actually the comes from the University of Wisconsin. So a professor Harry Steinbach, uh, in about a century ago, discovered a method of producing vitamin D. Instead of selling that pan for a lot of money, he works with his university to develop WARF or the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, which basically acted to commercialize that technology and then to reinvest those revenues back into the university. And not too much actually happened in technology transfer history up until the 1980s with the Bay or Bay Dole Act. This was a legislation that literally allowed for universities that received federal funding to retain ownership of any inventions that they that they did under that funding. So prior to that, anytime something was invented in a university that let's say received an NIH grant, would then then the ownership or inventorship of that patent would go back to the US government and you would have to negotiate with the US government to use that and commercialize that, which was quite challenging. Following this law, it basically allowed universities to retain that ownership and it really allowed for a blossoming, blossoming of that industry, of this industry of technology transfer. So just to give an example, here we have an infographic from the Association of University Technology Managers this is at this is pretty much the trade association for TTOs where we all go to talk shop with regular conferences and knowledge transfer between one another. And you can just see from this slide for about a decade from 1996 to 2017, this has had nearly a trillion dollars in impact on the US economy and clearly on lots of other economies around the world. So this is very, very, you can just see how this industry has blossomed in particular because of that law. So now, instead of me trying to give all these points about how, what technology transfer does in, in the sense of, you know, its commercial impact everywhere in the world, I thought I would go more about what I do as a technology transfer officer. 
And so just first to go over what is the purpose of a technology transfer office? And it can really be divided into three major points, but obviously each TTO or technology or TLO will have its own uniquities. So just to emphasize it, it's managing IP, taking those innovations or those intellectual properties from the bench side to market, and then commercializing those to the respective academic institutions. And the important point there is that it's creating a new revenue stream that is not dependent on donations or grants and really allows a certain degree of independence for that academic institution. So then the obvious question is, how do you find this intellectual property on campus? Well, there are a few different approaches that are followed regularly. One is just simply passive. We hope that a professor will walk through the door, come in with a great idea. Another one is just simply to knock on doors of professors and to say, you know, what are you doing? You know, maybe you have something that you don't realize could be commercially viable. And now an approach that's been growing more and more, not just at the Weizmann Institute, but at other academic institutions is to try to incubate technologies. So in essence, giving a small grant to different laboratories to help them start up an idea and see if that could be spun out into something commercially viable. The next question is then, how do you determine the relevance of this intellectual property? So one of the points that has to be asked always, is this patentable? Because there are no trade secrets in academia or there are almost no trade secrets in academia. Simply put, professors need to publish and as a technology transfer office, you must respect that desire. So this is, this is always a major question of trying to determine, is this technology actually patentable? The next thing is, does this have a market? Is this a, something that is a solution looking for a problem or does it actually solve a problem right away from the start? Or does it have a clear pathway to solving a problem? As two separate examples, in the case of let's say graphene, carbon nanotubes, all these, initially it wasn't always clear, let's say even if you had an idea or an application, it wasn't clear how to apply said technology. Only now have you really seen a sprouting of the industry related to graphene, carbon nanotubes and all these other things. In the case of, let's say, an antibody is a cancer therapeutic, the application is clear and the way to bring it to market is very clear. Then you also have to look at what is the competition of this potential technology? So have you developed the 251st headache drug or have you developed the, a, rare, a drug for a rare disease population? And these both are, while admirable, the difference is a headache drug that is already you know, competing with 10 million other drugs on market is very much going to be at a disadvantage. And that's also the point I make about, does this IP add value or is it significant or does it justify the investment? You have to see, will this actually in the end be worthwhile to put money in if you, know, you want to bring this to market? And now this slide, which you will see in pretty much every technology transfer presentation is about the valley of death. The blunt answer is that where most academics finish their projects or, you know, uh, any kind of research where they publish is generally quite far away from where industry wants to start, whether it be a product or some kind of service. And many technologies fail to commercialize and kind of languish in this valley of death simply because they're considered too early and too risky by industry. So you really have to make a determination of how early stage is your early stage technology, because in almost all cases in academia, it's an early stage technology. Do you have a proof of concept? Do you have a prototype? Do you have a molecule or do you have a target? What data do you have to support it? What experiments do you have and how many of these are relevant for industry? And these are all important points when you're considering how to cross the valley of death. Because sometimes if you're lucky, you'll have, a, let's say a closer endpoint or the valley is far narrower than you expected. And therefore you may find an industry partner who's willing to take it on. Another thing is also to look at what is the appetite for risk? I can say, as I've been working in food tech for the past two years now, the appetite for risk has been tremendous, at least for, for the time being. And, the, and you also then have to consider things like the regulatory environment. This is why things, let's say like in pharma, you generally see a far more conservative approach simply because you have to go through so many different milestones in terms of getting FDA or EMA approval, depending on where you are in the world. And so the question is obviously, how do you take a technology out of the valley of death or help it cross it? And one way to do it is to de-risk or mature it, which is business speak for improving the technology readiness level or just simply maturing that technology in that fashion. 
And just to help reduce it to practice, because that can be rather abstract, one case would be humanizing an antibody that you originally discovered using a mouse model or doing field trials on an agricultural technology. But you also have to manage these for each different type of technology. So let's, as again, a reduction to practice, you develop a new cell culturing technology that can be applied for cell engineering and then cultured meat in food tech. Well, if you're going in the pharma direction and the food tech direction, you need to look at very, very different aspects and very different regulatory environments. And now, as like a last point in terms of the business aspect is, how do you even commercialize it? How do you even take these technologies and you know bring them to market? And this could be its own lecture for a few hours, so it will only have to be for one slide at the moment. And that is, you first, let's say, if you're lucky enough to have a strong network, you would reach out to those relevant companies. Another aspect is to just really actively knock up and to actively reach out to people, whether it be through LinkedIn, emails, cold calling, whatever, or through conferences. Another aspect is sometimes you don't know what this technology is good for, but it seems interesting. So you'll do a passive marketing approach. So you'll post it online and see if somebody will come out and ask you, can I learn more? And then you also have to consider what type of licensing are you going to do? By that, I mean, what kind of business deal and what kind of business structure will you do to commercialize it? You could go, for example, with a direct license where you go to a big company, they take it on, and then you just agree on terms and everybody is very happy. Another aspect is the technology could be considered a bit risky and you could try to do it through a new co or a startup or a new company formation, as we would say in a contract. And this, is, this also presents its own challenges. Like, how do you find investors for this? And how do you find an entrepreneur to take this technology and to make it into a commercialized aspect? And then there are other aspects such as contract structure. How will the compensation work? Will you have royalties? Will you have milestones? And in a startup, will you even have equity as a TTO? And there are different legal aspects and different questions of risk management for the TTO in terms of these different uh, royalty or financial terms. And just some final thoughts. Each technology really needs to be looked at individually, and, and that's something that you cannot avoid. It has to be done in that fashion. And you also have to look at what every academic institution has on its campus. So, for example, if you're a place that has a lot of farmland or greenhouses, you can fairly easily target or focus on agricultural technologies. If you're looking to test a medical device, it's helpful to have a medical school nearby. I should also add that a technology transfer company is not an ecosystem onto itself. You cannot dump it into the middle of a campus and then suddenly just build an ecosystem from nothing. You need to work with entrepreneurs, governmental regulation, and different companies. And these all work in concert to help bring technologies, bring ideas, and to really communicate with one another. And I should finally say, no technology transfer officer works alone. I have to say thank you to all the wonderful people at the Weizmann Institute who really bring out some of the best science I've ever seen. And I also have to say thank you to the people at Yetta, especially people like the lawyers, the pan officers, the financial people, because they I could not do my job without them. And finally, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Jakob. So we have some time for a couple of questions here. Maybe here's some in the audience. So yeah, here's a question here. So we need a microphone. Yeah, I think yes. But now I think Jakob, we need a microphone because of, for the colleague in Israel. Thank you so much. It's on. You described using a patent for a product. Is there also a market to apply for patents and then sell uh, this patent? So also uh, for other, is there an interest that is this common and as an in interest of uh, other companies to look for other patents and then buy uh, patents to, to be able to develop a product? So as I understand your question, it's about whether we sell patents and that would be another revenue source. And I have to say that at least at the Weizmann Institute at Yeda, we never sell our patents because we view them as a kind of um, as our kind of lifeblood. 
This is something that we view as the way of constantly producing new revenue. So we don't sell our patents because in the end, we would prefer to get a licensing revenue and then get royalties from them in some fashion or another, rather than just kind of making, let's say, the money at the very beginning. We would rather make the big money at the end. Okay, maybe a question from my end. So, Jakob, would you see yourself as Yeda Institute in the middle of... Um, academics on the one hand and industry on the other hand or would you say you are you know a lawyer for one of these sides well i'm not really a lawyer i act as really the in between i have to be kind of i don't like to use the term but in some ways it's the middleman who helps to communicate the science from the scientists and helps to communicate the business to to the scientists you really have to sit in between these two partners and act as that interface because in the end, the scientist wants to focus or the professor wants to focus on the research. This is their love. This is what they do every day. And the companies want to make money. So you really have to just sit between them and work in that fashion to help them, you know, communicate properly. So I guess you could say you're more of a kind of business science translator, if I had to describe it. Okay, thank you so much. I don't see any additional questions. So again, thank you, Jakob. And let me mention that as you our alumni so we are very proud to have you and to spread the word what the quality of this very campus so thank you dr jakob fiel thank you so much Bye -bye. so ladies and gentlemen so we had 2465 view on youtube 812 view on linkedin so more than 3000 people online so this is quite remarkable and now i would like to hand over to my colleague flavia to mark you to moderate the panel what's next the floor is yours thank you, thank you Philip, for the very very nice session so thank you all to be still here in bremen and thank to all our guests online we are more than 3k so please hang on a little bit more so now i would like to call on stage my panelists for this last session of the day so this session will be focusing on the new sort of way of a new era of a value chain between education, research, and business. And I have here with me three knowledgeable panelists on all these topics. So I have called first Masha Bucher. She's young, but not young entrepreneur. She already founded three company. One I beat her already long time ago, if doesn't really <laughs> sound like it from the age, of course. And then Jules Coleman, please come on stage, former NYU and professor here is going to give us the education point of view on, on this. And finally, Liz Nick Dobrovolsky, our CEO of Rollers. During the day, you've been hearing about this platform, but now we can have more. So thank you very much for being here with me. And let's really dive in. I would like to, first of all, thank you to be here. And let's start with the ladies, let's say. So, um, as I said, we are discussing about how we are changing nowadays the sort of flow between education, so students. Students get to be researchers, they go into university, do postdoc, or try also to start their own company. So, from your point of view, Masha, how is a sort of new way of being an entrepreneur or founding your company, also you as founder, but also investor. How do you see this uh, sort of new, new way and also how we can push our students here in campus and create opportunities for them in this regard? Leave the floor to you. Thank you. I, well, I think the most important is uh, to be in touch with the context. And I think right now there are lots of inventions happening in different fields. I feel like the amount of new research and accomplishment, for example, in AI field that happens within a week is more that it used to happen within one year. And uh, I think uh, there is a simple way, and while you're doing research and reading a lot, studying a lot, you should be in touch with the rest of the world. And things like, very simple things like social networks really helps with that. Um, I think if you were, if I were a student studying here right now in Constructor University, I would create a Twitter account if I didn't have one and simply started with speaking with AI practitioners and following media, following bloggers, and just trying to be in touch with information. And there are lots of 
other resources like Reddit, like Hacker News. And uh, I think out of all connections I ever made, uh, I think like almost half of the most valuable connections that happened online and just to inspire a little bit, like in 2010, I had my own company and I met Serge Bell uh, on Twitter and it's led to a completely new chapter in my career and uh, professional life. And I started working with tech and it just launched like entire chain of uh, new events and they literally opened me door to a new world and we just simply met on Twitter. And uh, three years ago, another now like good friend of mine from Max Planck University who was using AI to manage quantum systems, uh, reached out to me on Instagram and we started a conversation because I found that he's working on a very interesting topic and we ended up, I ended up inviting him to meet in San Francisco, introducing to the friends and He's also from Germany, and uh, three years after, he's the founder of $3 billion company. And that's also started like he's never been in the United States before. He was Max Planck a student, and he was just connected and uh, looking for opportunity and uh, very receptive and very active. And I think it shouldn't be, it's not like a fairy tale. I think it's a normal opportunity that the current world gives to every one of us. Yeah, it's very nice point of view. So at least social networks are useful not only for a certain, say, simple community, but also to, to be more connected even to the business world. That's very interesting. Uh, also, can you tell us a little bit more on the project that you already start uh, a bit with the company, this um, lecture and, uh, let's say, this uh, so new start, constructor start that we want also to have. So we started it with uh, SAT Start Garden and the goal was to help uh, deep tech companies in Europe to learn something so they could be equal to American and global companies in their level of the opportunity. And we uh, launched two batches for SAT Start Garden, which is becoming constructor start. And we really dedicated on two things. One is we try to select the best companies in deep tech in Europe we could ever find. We focused on precedency stage where the impact and influence of investors could be the biggest. And uh, it took some time to find. We go went over through probably something between like 350 and 400 applications to find this literally 10 companies. And uh, um, we happy with the choice. And second um, idea was to make sure that we teach them a particular topic. First batch was growth and marketing, and second um, topic was product management for deep tech companies. And just specifying like a topic is something that helped this um, accelerator to differentiate. And the third thing is obvious, I think like strong connection with uh, constructors, something that no other accelerator can offer. And there is like a lot more work to do in this direction. We um, reflecting on experience that we had with first two batches and doing more work to connect the startups from there with Constructor and with ecosystem here. And on the same time, planning for the batch number three that would be revealed some, sometime in Q, uh, Q1 next year. Very interesting. Um, a last question from my side. Um, I, we have been hearing a lot the parallel in research as well between Europe, between the US, and how this differentiate in the, let's say, context of the startup. How you see, which are the differences that you see more on the 400 plus European startup that you have been selecting and more is that the US scenario on, on startups? I think it's a great question. And I think there is a stat that shows that the amount of research papers produced in Europe is prevailing amount of research papers produced in the United States. I think if you come from science standpoint, I think uh, US and Europe could be very much comparable. Well, when it comes to the business, uh, it's a very different story. I do think it's a little bit easier to build a company in Europe. I was just recently hiring someone in uh, who's based in Amsterdam and me as a like small business basically has to, for like $90, thousand dollars salary have to pay thirty five thousand dollars in taxes which was really shocking because i would have paid for the same person years probably like five thousand and different social donations i think uh lots of things here also like um uh defined by a little bit more risk averse culture but i don't i think if you're building a company you could still be based in europe and you could still exchange with lots of american companies and 
I don't think you have to even like hop on a plane to be connected with the rest of the world. So you can pick up business culture and you can pick up the best business practices. And just as an example, another portfolio company of ours, remote.com, uh, three years old, $3 billion in value. They're all remote. But at the same time, one founder is based in Netherlands and another founder is based in Portugal. So you could still build a fairly big company in short, um, short amount of time being based in Europe. Uh, just as an example, um, I would say I think uh, there is like a lot more work to do to um, kind of inject this like a bit more risk into European companies and just inspire them to <clears throat> maybe take a bit more risk but move a bit faster. And um, I think strongest companies that I th would appear in tech would um, appear in the intersection of European research and U.S. business culture. And I'm quite excited about this place like in between. I think there are very few um, institutions working in this field, but it's kind of exciting place to be. And um, I think constructor impact in this uh, category would be quite significant. Yeah, thank you very much. So it's very interesting to know that at least from a point of view of minds and researcher, Europe is as, let's say, flourishing than US. Just a little bit on uh, how to really set up the company and talking so doing a step back towards more researcher and bright mind, I would like to ask you, Nick, as representative of Rolos, this platform that actually helps researchers to do, let's say, their job in a more efficient way. How uh, can you please just tell us a little bit more how this is done, how it's helping the researcher first, and how this idea also from your point of view that you have funded many companies or are already in uh, uh, software business since a while, how the idea of, uh, of Rolos is really helping like this new way of uh, even working among different research groups. Yeah, you uh, said exactly right. So if we think about modern research, you can't imagine modern research without modeling and using computers in that research, right? So <laughs> nobody does it with hands right now. <laughs> and so if we think about it, so uh, in uh, every uh, area of science, uh, every scientist, he uh, needs to, so what he needs to do in order to use this computational research. So first he needs to uh, find some algorithms that he needs to do. If those algorithms are not very correct, he needs to change for his purposes, right? So he needs to program <laughs> in uh, some programming language. Then he needs to prepare environment in order, in order to make sure all those libraries required for that algorithms and for everything um, you know, are prepared correctly and will be run successfully. Then it needs to be sent to some computer or high performance computing or to cloud in, in order to be executed there. After that, you need to get results back. You need to put them somewhere. And after every run, you have new and new and new results. So you then create some, need to invent some system in order to properly version all those results, you know, in order to not forget. Because after a couple of months of uh, computations and having several hundreds of those, you probably will be lost uh, in, that, in that one. So, and then uh, <clears throat> comes the question of how do I collaborate with all others, right? So, I need to somehow share those, res those results. We need to, like, do the changes to the code, etc., etc. So, many, many lots of uh, different tasks are hanging around, which are not directly related to the area of my research as a scientist, right? So, I'm... Uh, uh, chemists or I'm biologists. I'm not very much interested in, uh, in programming or configuring those environments. And so then it uh, goes into publication, right? And once the uh, result, uh, results are ready, and then I need to publish my work, right? And I need to uh, provide the access to all those results which I did and to all those algorithms and they should be reproducible so other people should be easily uh, uh, coming and uh, 
seeing how it was done and reproduced themselves and uh, see what will happen um, uh, to compare the results. So this is, this is basically what Rolos does. It, it, it simplifies all those stuff, all that stuff, all those aspects. Uh, and there are many, many, many various uh, parts of uh, the product to simplify, to automate, uh, to allow people to collaborate, right? And uh, what is very important, it also provides for every project, so for every research project, it, it provides a sort of, uh, we provide two views. Uh, because some, uh, some scientists are more uh, strong uh, in programming on, and all those computer basics. And uh, others are not that computer savvy, but they are very strong in the area of expertise in physics, biology. Uh, and so for those, uh, for those people to effectively co collaborate, uh, we create for every project basically two views. One view is very low level with all those source code and configurations, etc., where every file, e everything is uh, available for you to browse and properly fine tune. But uh, for those who are not interested in all those details, we pre create a like, high level view. This is your data set, this is your algorithm, another algorithm, this is the pipeline that, is, that should be executed. And <clears throat> we give a sort of a high level control panel of showing this is where the process is the, and you can easily go and see the intermediary results, et cetera, et cetera. So overall, it empowers significantly the collaboration between teams. And so this is, this is basically how science works now and we help to simplify that process. Uh, that for sure. I, I remember myself having a messy lab book in which every time <laughs> you had to read someone else's writing that was very, very annoying. So let's say in this new way we can have even researcher from collaborating in different research groups are around the world with the concept of really of a global, more global way of, uh, of learning. They can share via cloud their results even without having really to I don't know go meet and really scribbling on their lab book so there is more also interaction in a sense into easy way of collaborating because we have been hearing all day also the word interdisciplinary working in different uh, let's say uh, topic but also as a researcher at the beginning I noticed that sometimes this is not easy also specifically for what you said you speak sometimes a different language. So you have the software exactly. guy that wants to program, not one of those, so it's easier <laughs> to, to, to go through. So it's, you see like it's easier to be able to share even though you're not at the same level. So it gives you an easier way of being a collaborator or it's also like engaging in, in different levels somehow. Exactly. You, 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 see, you see on the different levels, uh, but you still see the same, the, sa the same information or the same uh, project, let's say, in different representation. So that's definitely helpful, not for the, say, software programmer, that not everyone is really good at that. Thank you, Nick. So, Jules, you are, let's say, a representative of what we say, the education part today. <laughs> and as we already heard, university as businesses, as we heard about startup, are not anymore set in one location. The location is physical, but then the world around is definitely global. And uh, you, you were somehow a pioneer in this idea uh, within, within the context of bringing universe, uh, New York University a little bit farther away from is the primary location. So can you tell us a little bit more about the project, how it starts, so really to give a glance on how really education can be more global and connected. Okay, I, I actually be happy to talk about uh, both of the things that were discussed earlier. Please uh, do. Please uh, do so. And then talk like about how NYU fit into this picture. Um, so interestingly, universities created incubators for their students largely as a function of their career services. It was not a business decision. It was not an educational decision. It was job placement. 
That is, the world was becoming entrepreneurial. There was nothing set up in universities to teach people how to be entrepreneurial. Uh, but there was opportunities to create spaces and bring in mentors to help students incubate projects and come up with ideas. And uh, some places, this was very natural and easy to do. So, for example, obviously, in uh, Silicon Valley around Stanford, in Cambridge and Boston around Route 128, and MIT, Harvard, and other universities, just startups began everywhere, and uh, <clears throat> incubators grew up everywhere, and then accelerators grew up everywhere. Not true in every university, um, in part because these things are only successful when there really are an ecosystem, and the ecosystem involves not only the university and its faculty and its students and a place where people can do work, but a culture of people who are interested in new ideas, who can invest in new ideas, mentors, angel investors, venture investors, and people who wanted to solve problems in their companies. So, for example, for 30 years, I taught at Yale University, a very distinguished university, I'm told, and we tried to create a science park, uh, our own space, uh, related to the interests of Yale University, which were primarily in the life sciences. And that did not go over especially well at all, in part because while there are very good students and while there are very good researchers, there wasn't an overall ecosystem. In contrast, when I moved to New York University, there was a mayor, just to show the extent to which the political culture is central to the overall ecosystem. Mayor Bloomberg, at that point, was heavily invested and turned over land in New York City to other universities from around the world to come into New York and create um, an ecosystem for advanced technologies and make New York an East Coast Silicon Valley in some form or other. And this brought in universities from Israel, Cornell, uh, and NYU, Columbia, everybody, uh, got very good patches of land and lots of economic support, reductions in rent, which created an enormous amount of ecosystem in two ways. It wasn't just one university with its incubator and accelerator program and its faculty and investors who had been alumni who were prepared to help out. It was 10 or 15 universities from around the world with their network of researchers who were doing different things and their alumni base and their companies, right, which created an ecosystem that was crucially important. Two things, however, remained not dealt with or addressed at all. The first was, like most higher education, it was incredibly fragmented and local. If you think about, it's something I'll talk about at dinner tonight, higher, higher education, and education more generally, is the second largest economic sector in the world, but it's by far the most fragmented with the possibility of religions being slightly more fragmented. Um, their universities, if you imagine 100 years ago, Stanford, uh, Princeton, and Oxford getting together and forming a university, it was unimaginable, unthinkable. Everything is local in universities. The second thing is, if we want to increase uh, incubation of startups and focus only upon places, we will never reach the number of people who have the entrepreneurial spirit who will not have access. 
Um, so the way we at NYU tried to solve the first of these problems was different from other universities. What other universities did was they had a global footprint that took either the form of their global brand, Stanford, Harvard, Oxford, others, but also allowed their students to go overseas and study abroad programs, which are contracted for and don't even typically involve their own faculty. What we decided to do at NYU was to create freestanding universities on their own that were degree granting, that were not part of a franchise, that were not part of uh, licensing our name, but were in fact part of NYU, which we then constituted as a global network university. So we created uh, not a branch, but a freestanding university in Abu Dhabi. And then we created a branch which was freestanding, but would involve, if you know how to, what it's like to do business in China, it had to be with a Chinese university as well as a partner. Um, and that was a unique model. It has not been followed by anybody else. People sometimes will locate a medical school in Qatar or a, a governance school in Qatar or in China or in uh, Shenzhen in China and so on, but they won't create a whole new university. And the whole idea beyond crea of, of creating an entire university with three separate degree granting branches was that we could take a benefit from network effects that other schools could not. And the idea behind the network effects was the following. Think about a human being having two different kinds of networks. There are many more. One is the circulatory.